The attending physician's new guidance does not mince words. It says that meetings in which, quote, individuals assemble from various regions of the country in large numbers and appropriate social distancing is difficult to maintain are the highest risk for transmission of the disease. One critical means to reduce this risk is to wear a mask. Wearing a mask not only helps protect you from getting sick from this deadly virus, it helps protect the other people in this room from getting sick. After this markup is over, we will go home to our loved ones. Wearing a mask helps protect them from serious illness as well. As chairman, I have the duty and responsibility to maintain order and decorum in our proceedings, which includes making sure that we conduct our business in a safe manner. In light of the attending physician's new guidance, I therefore fully expect all members on both sides of the aisle to wear a mask at all times that you are not speaking. If for whatever reason you are not willing to wear a mask, the House rules provide a way to participate remotely from your office without being physically present in this room. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 7120, the Justice and Policing Act of 2020, for purposes of markup and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 7120 to hold law enforcement accountable for misconduct in court, improve transparency through data collection, and reform police training and policies. Without objection, the bill is, is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Last week, George Floyd's brother, Philonese, sat in this room and he told us of the pain he felt watching the video of his brother being killed by a Minneapolis police officer. He gave voice to the pain that all of us have felt over the last few weeks. He also spoke to the anger of knowing that George Floyd was only the latest in a much too long list of victims of police brutality, disproportionately people of color. He spoke to the frustration that time and again, in the face of overwhelming evidence that dramatic reform is needed, Congress has done very little. Mr. Floyd charged us with making sure that his brother's death would not be in vain, and he pleaded with us to turn the pain and anger that we all feel into meaningful change. His words echoed the voices of millions of Americans who have taken to the streets in the last few weeks to seek justice and to demand action. Today, we answer their call. We value and respect the many brave and honorable police officers who put their lives on the line every day to protect us in our communities. Those of us who were here in 1998 will never forget the courageous actions and ultimate sacrifice that Capitol Police Officers Jacob Chestnut and Detective John Gibson made in this building while protecting others. We owe them and the other officers killed in the line of duty each year a debt that we can never repay. And that includes Officer Patrick Underwood, who was shot and killed in the line of duty several weeks ago. But we must acknowledge that too many law enforcement officers do not uphold the ethic of protecting and serving their community. Instead, the reality for too many Americans, especially for African Americans, is that police officers are perceived as a threat to their liberties, to their dignity, and too often to their safety. This is not a new problem. Centuries of systemic and structural racism have infected all of our institutions. We see it in the rates of COVID deaths, in our system of mass incarceration, and in the vast chasm of economic inequality, all of which fall disproportionately on the backs of African Americans. And we see it in the harassment and excessive force that people of color routinely face by too many of our police officers. An unmistakable message has been sent to African Americans in this country, that they are second-class citizens and that their lives are somehow of less value. Well, let me state clearly and unequivocally that black lives matter. George Floyd mattered. Breonna Taylor mattered. Eric Garner, Amadou Diallo, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, and Laquan McDonald mattered. Ray Shard Brooks mattered. And the countless other people who have lost their lives at the hands of law enforcement mattered. For far too long, pleas for justice and reform have fallen on deaf ears in Congress, but that changes today. The Justice and Policing Act would finally allow for meaningful accountability in cases of police misconduct, and it would begin the process of reimagining policing in the 21st century. This legislation 
which currently has 227 co-sponsors in the House and 36 co-sponsors in the Senate, makes it easier for the federal government to successfully prosecute police misconduct cases, bans chokeholds, ends racial and religious profiling, encourages prosecutions independent from local police, and eliminates the dubious court-made doctrine of qualified immunity in civil rights lawsuits against law enforcement officers. At the same time, it addresses systemic racism and works to prevent police violence and bias through a series of front-end approaches aimed at encouraging departments to meet a gold standard in training, hiring, de-escalation strategies, bystander duty, and use of body cameras and other best practices. The goal of this legislation is to achieve a guardian, not warrior, model of policing. The bill also mandates the collection and public designation uh, of data on a number of key policing matters, including a first ever national database on police misconduct incidents to prevent the movement of dangerous officers from department to department. It ends no-knock warrants and the militarization of local policing, and it specifies that lynching is a federal hate crime. The bill does all of this while using no federal funds for police departments, except where constitutionally mandated for data collection, and the conditions all repurposed existing funding for the support of these programs. It also creates a new grant program for community-based organizations to create local commissions and task forces on policing innovation, to reimagine how public safety could work in a truly equitable and just way in each community. I want to thank the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bass, the chair of the Crime Subcommittee and the sponsor of this legislation for her tremendous work in crafting a bill that is at once bold and transformative to meet the moment that calls out for sweeping reform, while also taking a responsible and balanced approach to the many complicated issues associated with policing. In addition, I want to thank the many members of this committee who have worked on and introduced legislation that is included in the legislation before us today. I also want to thank the activists who are leading protests across the country. It is because of you that we are here today considering the most significant reforms to policing in a generation. It is because of your energy, your determination, and your demands for justice that the nation has awakened to the need for action. To the families of those who have lost their lives at the hands of law enforcement, everyone in this room mourns with you. But today we will offer more than just sympathy. Today we are proposing meaningful change. Thoughts and prayers are not enough. Pledges to study the problem are not enough. Half measures are not enough. To the members of this committee, the Justice and Policing Act is our opportunity to show the world that we are listening and that we will respond with real and lasting reforms. We must not let this moment slip away. If we find ourselves here again, listening to the heartbreaking testimony of another grieving family member, wondering why we did not act when we had the chance, it will be a stain in our legacy. We must not let that happen. I urge all of my colleagues to support this vital legislation. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I should maybe also point out for for the members that uh, our colleague from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, lost his wife suddenly last uh, last uh, last evening as well. So mm. we want to think of the Barr family also. <coughs> uh, Mr. Chair, <coughs> four fundamental principles should form the framework for our public policy development here in the Judiciary Committee. First of all, what happened to George Floyd is a tragedy. What happened to Pat Underwood is also a tragedy. They're as wrong as wrong could be, and we should work so that it doesn't happen again. Their families deserve to see swift justice for their killers. Second, peaceful protest is important. It's part of our First Amendment liberties. We've all engaged in it, but there is a big difference, as I said last week, a big difference between peaceful protest and rioting, a big difference between peaceful protest and looting, a big difference between peaceful protest and violence, and frankly, a big difference between peaceful protest and attacking our police officers or forming these new autonomous zones that we see in the city of Seattle, Chaz, CHOP, whatever the, whatever the designation is. There is a big difference. Third, the vast majority of police officers do a great job. They risk their lives every single day to protect our communities. They're the individuals 
who rushed into the Twin Towers on 9-11. They're the individuals here on Capitol Hill who protect us every single day. They're the guys back in our, back in our communities who put on that uniform every single shift and risk their lives. And we should remember that as we develop policy here in the Judiciary Committee. And finally, fourth, defunding the police, dismantling police departments is one of the craziest public policy proposals I have ever heard. Those four principles should form a framework for what we develop today that helps address this real concern in our country. Two weeks ago, the president said in his, in his speech in Florida, laid out the mission clearly, laid out the mission clearly. He talked about healing, not hatred, justice, not chaos. Those words underscore what we heard from George Floyd's brother just a week ago. Just last week, when he sat here in such a compelling, compelling way, talked about three simple words, one sentence, life is precious. Life is precious. George Floyd's life, Ahmaud Arbery's life, Breonna Taylor's life, Rashad Brooks' life, and David Dorn and Pat Underwood's life as well. Each life is precious. Everyone here understands that, and we have an obligation to make improvements to public policy that recognize that, that basic fact that was said so well by George Floyd's brother last week. The president understands it as well. Just yesterday, he gathered together the families of fallen law enforcement officers and the families of victims of police brutality at the White House as part of his executive order that lays the groundwork, the signing of his executive order that lays the groundwork for beginning to address these real concerns. But even before the executive order, this administration worked with us on good policy, good, strong policy. Mr. Collins, Mr. Jeffries, and others on this committee, all of us on this committee with the First Step Act, great piece of legislation, real prison reform. This administration has worked for, to help support historically black colleges and support for opportunity zones, support for school choice, all good policies where we all work together. I hope that's what happens today. I hope my colleagues on the Democrat side of the aisle will work with us. The many amendments that we plan to offer that we think function within these four principles I talked about and will help, help deal with the situation. But it didn't start off that way. Not one single Republican was consulted with the bill that we're, we're marking up today, not one. You guys introduced it, didn't talk with us. So I hope, I hope today that you will embrace our thoughtful amendments that we plan to offer, amendments that are consistent with the Constitution, consistent with the rule of law, consistent with those four principles, and consistent with Mr. Floyd's words that life is precious. That is our goal on the Republican side. And I look forward to the next several hours as we mark up this legislation that we can adopt Republican amendments that we think will make this legislation the kind of legislation our country wants us to, see, uh, wants us, uh, to develop here in the House Judiciary Committee. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security, the gentlelady from California, and the sponsor of this legislation, Ms. Bass, for her opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and let me begin by offering my prayers to Representative Sensenbrenner. He is my uh, travel partner to Africa. We've, we've traveled a number of times together, and We've had many, many, many conversations about his wife from the time when she first took ill through her illness over these few years. So my, pro my prayers and thoughts are definitely with him. Uh, two weeks ago, the world witnessed a horrific crime on the streets of Minneapolis, the slow, torturous murder of George Floyd. I also want to acknowledge the murder of Dave Patrick Underwood. And last week, we were able to meet his sister and hear about him. And members, you may or may not have uh, heard that the person that killed him was arrested yesterday. And it turns out that that person had deliberately infiltrated the protesters with the objective to kill police officers. And he was a member of a right-wing uh, organization that believed in creating chaos. And I'm very glad I don't, you know, obviously he has to be tried and all, but I am glad that that arrest took place. The tragic death of Mr. Floyd has galvanized the entire nation to take a look at our history because black Americans have actually been sadly marching for over 100 years to bring attention to this gross injustice that we have faced really for centuries in this country. 
We've marched against police abuse and for the police to protect and serve our communities like they do elsewhere. In the 1950s, it was news cameras that exposed the horror of legalized racism. 70 years later, it's the cell phone camera instead of the news camera that has exposed the continuation of violence directed at African Americans by police. The sad truth is when people told their stories of police abuse, of murder at the hands of police officers, they simply weren't believed. And even when there was videotapes, questions were asked, well, we don't know what happened before the camera went on. And then when we heard about this person that was killed, well, we really questioned their background and maybe they had a police record. Even if that was the case, what happened to arresting somebody and what happened to the presumption of innocence before proven guilty. It has taken technology and active citizen involvement to document and expose this under, ugly reality in our country. But just understanding the problem is not enough. We need fundamental change. And that's why Chairman, Nadlin and, Chairman Nadler and I, along with 227 co-sponsors, introduce the Justice and Policing Act. This bold, transformative legislation will assist police departments to change the culture of policing, raise the standards of the profession, and hold those office ac officers accountable who fail to uphold the ethic of serving and protecting their communities. I don't need to repeat what's in the bill. You all know, and we'll hear about it throughout the day, but I'm certain that police officers one part of the bill, want to be free to intervene and stop an officer for using deadly force when it's not necessary. You might have heard about the officer in New York who intervened last year when one of her colleagues was had a, a person in a chokehold and she was afraid that this uh, individual was going to kill, uh, this police officer was going to kill the person. It was an African-American woman and she intervened and she stopped him from using the chokehold. Well, she got fired. So I believe that most police officers would have rendered aid like she did and would have stopped what happened. And I believe that police officers want to be trained in the best practices in policing. So to help support officers, this legislation will create the first ever national accreditation standards for the operation of police departments. National standards for officers. When I met with the Federation, the Fraternal Order of Police, they requested this and said that they had been trying to get those national standards for years, but they were doing it in a retail manner. And if we're able to pass this legislation with teeth in it, that it will help them. But despite our best intentions, we know that there'll be some officers who cross the line. And that's why the bill also includes strong accountability measures, both as a matter of simple justice, but also to keep unfit officers off the street. A profession where you have the power to kill should be a profession that requires highly trained officers who are accountable to the public. Our country is at a crossroads now. For the first time, I believe America is finally beginning to question, to learn, and to understand the hard truths that surround policing in our country. I always say that one of the things that is most painful to African Americans is when we describe our interactions with police and when our experience is completely rejected because someone else has not had that experience. To hear people say, well, I've always had positive interactions with the police, so your interactions, I don't believe they actually happened. Right now, the world is witnessing the birth of a new movement in our country, and this movement has spread to many nations around the world. People are marching to demand not just change, but transformative change that ends police brutality, that ends racial profiling. They're marching to demand meaningful and substantive change, not a fig leaf, not reform life. And I don't want this committee to do that either. That's why we must support the Justice and Policing Act that will be changed today, and it will be called the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. People don't want to see their efforts watered down. As I said last week, if this legislation had been the law of the land several years ago, Eric Garner and George Floyd would be alive because the bill bans chokeholds. If the bill had been law last year, Breonna Taylor would not have been shot to death 12 times in her sleep because no-knock warrants for drug arrests would have been illegal. And if the National Registry had been in effect, it would have revealed that the officer who killed the 12-year-old child, Tamir Rice, had been fired from another department and had a propensity for violence. He never would have been rehired by another department, and this May, Tamir Rice would have graduated from high school. 
When society doesn't invest in communities, police officers are left to pick up the pieces. And police officers are the first to say that this is unfair, that they are not trained to be social workers or health providers. Homelessness, mental illness, and substance abuse are health and economic problems. In Los Angeles, we have a jail called the Twin Towers. There's hundreds of inmates in that jail. And in Los Angeles, we refer to it as the nation's most expensive mental health institution because the majority of the people in that jail are, suffer from mental illness. So this didn't happen overnight. 30 years ago, 30 years ago in 1990, I started an organization in South Central Los Angeles to address a health and economic problem that society was choosing to criminalize. That was the, uh, the problem with crack cocaine. And what we did, we didn't expand drug treatment. We just incarcerated people. Many of those people are in prison today. The Justice and Policing Act reinvests in our communities and empowers them to shape the future of public safety through grants and community-based organizations to develop innovative solutions. Over the years after 1990, I watched as the federal and state governments sh slowly divested from communities, reduced, reduced resources for services, and then we had to increase resources for prisons and for police. So we're at a crossroads in our society and we have to decide, is the way we're gonna proceed is every time there is a, a health, a social and an economic problem, is our solution gonna be to solve the health, social and economic problem? Or is it gonna be to spend more and more and more money expanding police departments and building prisons? Again, I support the police officers and I support their cry when they say, when you don't fix society's problems, you leave us to pick up the pieces. That is unfair to them. They're not trained to do that and it doesn't solve problems. We all wanna be safe in our communities. We all want the police to come to our rescue when we're in trouble. We all support the brave men and women who put their lives on the line every day for us. And when we interact with police, we all want and expect to be treated with respect, not suspicion. And we should not be in fear of our life when interacting with officers. It took me many years to get over the fear of those lights coming on behind you. Not fear that I was gonna get a ticket, but fear that my interaction with police might result in me not surviving. This is not just an issue for black men. This is an issue for black women as well. Millions of people in this country and around the world are marching and raising their voices to call out for effective police reform. We are here to answer those calls and today is an opportunity and it's an opportunity to reimagine public safety so that it is a just and equitable for all Americans and I am hopeful that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, when I hear that many of our proposals have been incorporated in, in what I hear is coming out of the Senate in a different way, not as strong, not as powerful, but it makes me feel like there is a pathway for us to do this and the American people are waiting for us and the whole world is watching us. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing has become clear throughout our nation over the past several weeks, and that is that Americans have looked to this committee to lead in working together, regardless of party affiliation, to find common ground on the issues before us today. Our constituents and all the people of this country expect and deserve that. In my opening remarks at our hearing last week, I and others made, the clear, made clear the willingness of Republicans to work with the Democrat majority here on this committee to find meaningful solutions that will help build trust in our communities and restore faith in our institutions. I think we all agree on at least three core concepts. Improvements are needed in transparency, training, and termination policies for those rare bad apples in law enforcement who violate the law and the legitimacy that upholds the character of our legal system. At the same time, Congress has to be careful to uphold the respect and appreciation that is due to every American patriot who faithfully serves us in law enforcement on that thin blue line. We have two big problems with all of this today. First, 
a growing percentage of the Democrat and progressive base and even some liberal members of Congress and mayors and city council persons are calling for the defunding of American police. This is pure insanity. Every day in America, our law enforcement officers are putting their own lives on the line to protect our communities from violent crimes and home invasions and property theft and sex trafficking rings and vicious gang violence and drug cartels and domestic terrorism. It was noted yesterday that in 2018 alone, the police in our country arrested nearly 12,000 people for murder, 25,000 people for rape, and nearly 1.5 million for assault. Who will do all this if we dismantle and dissolve our police departments? This is a recipe for disaster, and every reasonable person can see that. And it's a proposal that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. The second big problem we have today is with this broken process and the flawed product that it has produced. While this bill has some important and wise provisions, we all agree, the legislation that's been presented for our markup here is not the result of any deliberative legislative proceedings at all. In spite of the fact that we have clear bipartisan consensus on the need for meaningful reforms and a rare opportunity to set an example of working together across party lines for the best interests of all Americans, the Democrat majority has so far locked us out of the room and instead <clears throat> produced a bill that includes provisions which will have a net negative impact on communities that are most affected by crime and on the safety of the officers who put their lives on the line to serve them. I, I serve as the ranking member on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over some of the key areas addressed by this legislation. But the bill we're considering was, was released just 10 days ago, and my subcommittee, which could have been an ideal venue to build consensus here, has been afforded zero opportunity to meet and consider the complex issues and specific constitutional questions before us. So my colleagues and I will introduce some key amendments today to try to repair and improve this bill. I hope they'll be duly considered and adopted by our friends on the other side. What we need right now, and again, what the American people deserve, is a thoughtful dialogue, common sense, and valuable input, input from both the majority and the minority on this committee. This, this common ground is key if we're going to accomplish the goal of keeping our communities safe, upholding the civil liberties of individuals, and protecting the legitimacy of law enforcement. In the Rose Garden yesterday, President Trump signed his executive order on safe policing for safe communities, and he mentioned in his remarks, quote, Americans know the truth. Without police, there is chaos. Without law, there is anarchy. Without safety, there is catastrophe. We need leaders at every level of government who have the moral clarity to state these obvious facts. Americans believe we must support the brave men and women in blue who police our streets and keep us safe. Americans also believe we must improve accountability, increase transparency, and invest more resources in police training, recruiting, and community engagement. Reducing crime and raising standards are not opposite goals. They are not mutually exclusive. They work together, unquote. The president has done his part. And now we must do ours. I pray that we can work together now at this important moment for our country to solve these pressing problems. Thank you, and I yield back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Nadler of New York. Strike all after the enacting Without clause. objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will now recognize myself to explain the amendment. The amendment in the nature of a substitute would first and foremost change the bill's short title to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. This is a fitting tribute to Mr. Floyd whose tragic death sparked a worldwide movement in support of the reforms contained in this bill. I urge my colleagues to honor his memory by supporting this amendment and the underlying legislation. We know that there are countless other victims of police violence, and their tragedies are reflected in this bill as well. The amendment also makes a number of technical and conforming changes, as well as a limited number of changes to clarify and strengthen existing authorities in H.R. 7120. Among other provisions, the amendment would strike the death penalty from the sentences currently permitted under 18 U.S.C. 242, which makes it a crime for a person acting under color of any law to willfully deprive a person of a right or privilege protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States. 
It would clarify the qualified immunity section so that it is more clearly focused on law enforcement personnel and includes federal law enforcement officers. It would strengthen pattern and practice investigations, particularly by state attorneys general. It would clarify the operation of the police misconduct registry to make clear that information concerning misconduct by police officers involving misuse of force and racial profiling will be made public. And it would limit the use of facial recognition technology in connection with body camera and dash cam police footage required under this legislation. I urge all the members to support the manager's amendment as well as the underlying uh, bill. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for any comments he may have on the amendment. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? I'd like to strike Ms. the last word. Jackson Lee is recognized for purposes of striking the last word. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. Thank you for the leadership of this committee. Thank you to the chairwoman and the Congressional Black Caucus uh, and all of the members uh, who have gathered here for a significant day in the history of the United States of America. I think the real question has to be, what is the value of black lives? Are black lives valued? Is a black life valued? Are all black lives valued? Living in the skin that I live in for obviously all of my life, being around my family members and others in the community, I realize that that question has never been answered by this nation. And it's difficult to hear the rejection of the understanding of the systemic call of racism that has plagued every aspect of our society. And so what we do today is a message that Dr. King gave us so many years ago, that he might not be able to change hearts, but he can change laws. The sadness I feel today is mixed with joy because if we had passed these bills that we had worked on over a decade ago, if after our visit as a Judiciary Committee to New York after the killing of Abidu Diallo, if we had moved on legislation that we had been filing for years and years, yes, lives would be saved. If we had been able to move on the Law Enforcement Trust and Integrity Act that was named after George Floyd about 10 days ago, we might have been able to enhance the words protect and serve. And at the same time, we would have said to the nation, that we mourn any loss of any law enforcement, but we would have been able maybe to keep more of them alive. And yes, we would have seen black boys go home to their mothers, like Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Michael Brown, and Laquan McDonald, shot many times in his back. I am grateful for where we are today, and I'm grateful on behalf of the George Floyd family. What a wonderful and provocative and important statement Mr. Floyd made. They're under so much pressure. They're under so much loss. Their pain is so deep. We see it every day in our community. We're still praying and showing up in front of uh, various uh, recognitions of George Floyd, paintings, murals. And I remember that one thing that Mr. Floyd said in this hearing room, he wanted justice. When I told him that our efforts to name this bill after his brother were successful. The work that we did collectively together to get it named, and it is in this manager's amendment, he thanked us publicly yesterday in Houston. And so what we have to deal with now is to recognize that Dr. King's words were correct. We have to change laws in order to change hearts. And he was further correct when he said, now is the time and why we can't wait. We can't wait in Houston because we know the story of Jose Torres and Ida Lee Delaney, Danny Ray Thomas, Pamela Turner, and so many others that have never been in the line of justice, but they lost their life. But as the world saw a man's life seep out on the streets of America, they said no more. And I am grateful that we have in this legislation the in racial profiling. So it becomes law that you cannot racially profile African Americans, the descendants of enslaved Africans. We celebrate this week, Juneteenth, that recognizes that we are the only group, African Americans, that have been in bondage in this nation. 
There is not anguish. There is patriotism. We've served our country. And so the value of this patriotic legislation is that we're moving beyond conversation. We can't have any more conversations. We're ending racial profiling. We're affirming civilian review boards, funding them as a, an accreditation process and giving them subpoena power. What an amazing step toward opportunity and justice. And so I would say as we continue this debate, I too seek the partnership and friendship of my fellow Americans. They may wear the label of Republicans, but they are friends. They are friends because I mourn too the loss of Chairman Sensenbrenner's wife, who I've traveled with as well. I express my sympathy to Mr. Barr as well. That is the human decency in which we must operate. And it is to this moment that we say to America that African Americans, that black Americans deserve the same human decency and recognition of their humanity as anyone else. I ask the question, does black lives matter? I think today we'll stop the conversation and we'll continue to answer it by passing this legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jackson. I want to uh, recognize the presence here of our former colleague, uh, the White House Chief of Staff, uh, Mark Meadows. Uh, for what purpose does Mr. Armstrong seek recognition? Amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Armstrong of North Dakota. Add at the end of the bill the following, and conform the table of contents accordingly. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, this is a pretty simple amendment. This requires that the DOJ law enforcement record audially all, video, all interviews that are conducted, whether they are in custody or non-custodial. Uh, there's some narrow exceptions for confidential informants, and there are retention requirements for 10 years or in the case of capital cases or other until the case is um, disposed of legally. And this is an, an important amendment. And if our goal is to hold law enforcement accountable and improve transparency, and indeed we do because in subtitle C, we require federal uniform law enforcement to carry body cameras and dash cameras. But even as this bill introduced, if it would pass, there's a perverse incentive which exists where immediately upon that person being, in cut or being arrested or detained and turned over for an interview, there would be absolutely no requirement for that body camera to stay on or for any recording device to exist. I think it's time that our premier law enforcement agencies get into the 21st century. All the arguments in the past that have been used for not, require, not, not recording interviews just simply don't exist. It was too expensive. It was too cumbersome. It doesn't alter for the free, allow for the free flow of conversation. Well, we know that's not the case. And we know that because ostensibly the FBI said so in a 2004 memo. And again, the DOJ did in a 2014 memo. In which, in both memos, they required that in-custody interviews be either audibly or visually recorded. The problem is, is in-custody becomes an interesting term of art when we're dealing with our uh, friends in, D in federal law enforcement. Um, the FBI, to the FBI and DOJ, in-custody only applies following arrest and prior to the initial appearance when the defendant is in a place of detention with su suitable recording equipment because apparently federal law enforcement is the only group of people in the world that don't know how to use a smartphone. <laughs> Interrogations can often last for hours and notes cannot account for everything. Furthermore, trials often happen years after those interviews, making it ridiculous to believe that agents can cognitively recall specific details if they are not recorded. And sometimes, unfortunately, agents feel compelled to lie or they feel compelled to threaten their suspects. But when those same witnesses or subjects lie back, they are often charged with a crime or their plea deal is revoked. And we know this has happened. We have seen it in high profile cases. In the Michael Flynn case, there were two different 302s that were filed. And 302s really, they take on this air of federal authority. Here's what a 302 is. It's an officer's note. It's an officer's view of a transcript. You can give it a name, you can give it an official federal title, but that's all it is. And the first one was filed three and a half weeks after the interview, which is absolutely ridiculous in and of itself. 
Remember, can you recall a conversation you had three and a half weeks earlier, regardless of what you were doing? But the more troubling fact in this entire thing is the second one was three and a half months later. Three and a half months later, the redacted and revised 302 was filed. That shouldn't have happened. Those interviews should have been recorded. Um, in the Paul Manafort case, uh, in February of 2019, Judge Jackson held a hearing in that case to deal with lying about law, lying, lying law enforcement. And we know, and we know, we know exactly what happened in that hearing because there's a transcript of it. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened in the 12 interviews that they conducted with Paul Manafort because there's not a trans tra transcript of any of them. And that isn't done by accident. That isn't done out of convenience. That is done intentionally. And so during that hearing, the, the judge ultimately sided with the prosecution in that case, but she, she said on the record, this is a problem with not having grand jury testimony, but having to look at the 302. I may not be able to resolve it on its face of the 302. And you know what? She shouldn't have to. Recorded interviews protect law enforcement. They protect criminal defendants. They reduce burdens on the court system as they, as they reduce jury trials. And probably most importantly today, they increase public trust in law enforcement. And that's something we drastically need at this point in time. And with that, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Um, we, uh, we'd like to examine this amendment further. If the gentleman will withdraw the amendment, or we'll work with the gentleman to see if we can uh, fit it in on the way to the, to the Rules Committee. Will the, will the gentleman withdraw the amendment so that we can work it, uh, we can examine it further on the way to the Rules Committee? Not at this time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Who seeks Mr. recognition? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, Rhode Island. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized. Um, I want to begin also with expressions of sympathy to Mr. Sensenbrenner uh, on the loss of his beloved wife, Cheryl, and we all will keep him in our prayers and thoughts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your extraordinary leadership that brings us to this markup today. I'd also like to recognize the magnificent leadership of Congresswoman Karen Bass, the chair of the Crime Subcommittee and the Congressional Black Caucus on this historic legislation. Before we convene this morning, my thoughts turn to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Nearly a year ago to the day before he was gunned down in April of 1967, Dr. King visited my district in Rhode Island for an address on civil rights. I haven't lost faith in the future, King said that Sunday morning, but I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism or of racial inequality. More than 50 years later, we're here once again because of the madness of racial inequality. In our country, black people are more than five times as likely as whites to be arrested for the mere suspicion of a crime. The police are nearly four times as likely to use force when confronting a black suspect. And black men are two and a half times as likely as white men to be killed by a police officer. The fact is our criminal justice system so often victimizes people of color because it's built on a foundation of racism that was laid while the Civil War was still being fought. In January 1865, Congress passed a joint resolution proposing a 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution to outlaw slavery. But while the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, it replaced it with a new system of racial control that allowed black people to be arrested on minor offenses and put to work as unpaid laborers as punishment. We are still living with the legacy of that decision today. The imprisonment rate for black people is more than five times the rate among white people. The prison industrial complex has devastated generations of black men and women through Jim Crow, the war on drugs, and the continued harassment, intimidation, and killing of black men, women, and children today. The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Rashid Brooks, and so many more black Americans are just the latest in the long line of modern day lynchings that cry out for justice. It is our solemn responsibility to finally correct the painful injustices of the past 155 years. We must pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act because George Floyd mattered and because black lives matter. First, this bill makes it easier to hold bad cops accountable for their actions. It removes barriers to prosecution and recovering damages from officers who violate a person's civil rights. The doctrine of qualified immunity has created a system where it's virtually impossible to get justice for victims of police misconduct and racial bias. A system where an officer of the peace can escape liability by virtue of his badge and gun is the system that must end. 
Never again should an officer feel empowered to choke the life out of an unarmed black man whose crime was selling loose cigarettes. Never again should an officer shoot and kill an unarmed black man in the back as he runs away. We need to end the era of police officers behaving and looking like troops in a combat zone. And that's why the Justice and Policing Act takes steps to demilitarize police departments. Without trust, police cannot do their jobs. And it's hard to build trust when at first glance a law enforcement officer looks more like an occupying soldier. We need police departments to be trusted institutions in our community and the officers and advocates for the people who live there. To that end, this bill increases transparency while encouraging departments to meet a gold standard in training, hiring, and de-escalation strategies. It establishes the first ever national database of civilian police encounters, including the use of force and traffic stops, and requires the collection, analysis, and release of such data. It also requires the collection of data on police misconduct to track and prevent bad cops from moving from one department to another to avoid accountability. It addresses systemic racism and bias by cracking down on racial and religious profiling. It bans the use of chokeholds and no-knock warrants like those used on George Floyd, Eric Garner, and Breonna Taylor. Taking these steps will help save lives, ensure accountability, and improve public safety. All of us here today know that we can do better in this country. We can end the systemic racism and policing. We can and must do that. Our communities deserve this, and so do the overwhelming number of officers who do their jobs professionally and with honor every day. But as Dr. King reminded us at another speech in Rhode Island in October of 1966, the appalling silence of the good people is as serious as the vitriolic words of the bad people. So my colleagues, do not be silent. Rise to this moment. Set aside politics. Join us in fixing what is broken in America, and we'll be able to look back on this day and know that together, we made a difference, and as George Floyd's brother reminded us, your names will become famous too, like his brother, if you in fact do the right thing and respond to racial injustice in this country. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Gates seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentlemen, recognized. I, I wrote it down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Republicans will not support the defunding of police, the dismantling of police, the demonizing of police. We will not turn our streets over to the Chaz warlords, though some have, and perhaps even others in the United States Congress would. It's hard not to note, as we gathered here, the extent to which death hangs over this committee hearing, the death of spouses of two of our colleagues in recent days, the death of Mr. Floyd, Pat's death, the death of law enforcement officers that seek to keep our communities safe, the death of those who otherwise have passed in these, in these riots. Leaders bring life into meaningful reforms, and I think that's what we have the opportunity to do today. And I wanted to congratulate the bill sponsor on bringing together some ideas that give me hope that we can breathe life into meaningful reform. The president has unquestionably led on these issues. The president's executive order yesterday builds upon the hearing that we had last week. It builds upon the themes that were developed, the evidence that was presented, and I'm grateful that President Trump didn't wait around to take action, that he took action immediately on issues like chokeholds, bad cops, and databases that can inform more sound policing. I believe even more can be done. I believe that the reforms on no-knock warrants have merit. Uh, I believe that there are some immunities that we can look at uh, to ensure that policing is improved. Uh, and I'm hopeful that my Democrat colleagues will undertake the spirit of reform in a bipartisan way and will view our suggestions as offered in good faith. Mr. Uh, the gentleman from North Dakota's amendment unquestionably is offered in good faith, and I'd like to speak about it for a moment. There is no excuse for federal law enforcement in this country not to take a recording of an interview so that we are not left questioning people's different characterizations and memories from these interviews. I believe that the legislation on body cameras is very productive, but if we can move policing into the 21st century on body cameras, can we at least move the federal government entities that we control into the 20th century? Can we at least ensure that 
We don't have another circumstance like the Russia hoax, where as a consequence of federal agents who had well exceeded their authority as law enforcement officers when they became political actors, when they wanted to deprive the people of this country of the duly elected president, when they took interviews and then characterized them falsely, politically, we didn't have recordings to go back to in all of those circumstances. And if these things can happen to General Flynn, if they can happen to people working on a presidential campaign, I can only imagine the number of times where the FBI might have had someone uh, in an interview and the lack of a recording allowed the government to deprive people of their rights, to characterize things inaccurately. And so I know that Republicans are motivated to adopt the gentleman's amendment in large part because we saw the, the devastating consequences of the lack of a clear record in the Russia hoax. And that was, that was, I, it was very embarrassing for the Congress. It, I presume it might have been embarrassing for many of you when the facts finally came out in that case. But I, I think it's demonstrative to the broader point that if, if our desire is to improve policing and to create better balance in the relationship that police have with those they're serving, this is undoubtedly a good amendment. I'll conclude with this. If the overall theme is to keep police engaged and proactive in their communities, you're going to find the president and Republicans in Congress very willing to work with the Democrat majority in the House on those issues. However, if the goal is to keep the cop in the car, if the goal is to have police so stripped of all immunities, so deprived of all of the use of force that they might need to preserve their own lives, if the goal is to have police essentially on a level playing field with cartels and criminals when it comes to their equipment, then, then we would be unable to support that because that would be the manifestation of an effort to defund, dismantle, and demoralize the police, not an effort to improve the police. We want to reform, we want to improve, we want to work together, and we hope our Democrat colleagues will take this amendment and others that are offered in good faith and that you'll speak out against the dangerous efforts to demoralize those who are serving us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Gomer. The gentleman yields back. Uh, for our purposes, Ms. McBath, to address the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. General Lee's right hand. Thank you. And I want to offer my deepest, deepest condolences to um, our colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, Sensen Brenner, and the loss of his wife. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bass, for really doing such good work, so timely, timely, and uh, really needed. These past few months have given us just too much to fear, too many lives to mourn. We have lost loved ones to a virus we've never experienced before, and we've lost loved ones to the racism that has plagued our nation for centuries, the racism that took my son, Jordan, from me. But our strength as a nation has always come in our ability to come together to address our greatest challenges. We are coming together as we check on our neighbors with pre-existing conditions who can't go to the store. We are coming together as we march against injustice. Today, we come together to honor the life of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others, and we're doing it with action. And for that, I am completely filled with hope. This bill will strengthen our communities, restore trust in law enforcement, and ensure the safety of every American. This bill will save lives. I've been thinking a lot about Psalm 3417 lately, and it says that when the righteous cry out for help, the Lord hears and, de and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The righteous are crying out, and they are marching and demanding justice and we hear you, and we see you. So many of our officers nationwide are truly upholding their duty to protect and serve. They have the trust of their communities and as a result are better at ensuring everyone's safety. These officers know the people that they serve. They see them as brothers and sisters and neighbors and their departments reflect the diversity of their communities. We do have officers who serve with honor, who respect the dignity of every citizen. This bill is about making sure that every officer in every department 
is held to the high standard set by officers like these. It does that by ending racial and religious profiling because everyone deserves to be treated equally under the law. This bill invests in community-oriented policing. In my district in Georgia, the 6th District, our officers know that they must earn the respect of those that they serve, and they do earn it. Last weekend, I walked with families, community leaders, city officials, preachers, and police officers in a, officers in a solidarity march through Roswell, Georgia. I walked with Pastor Lee Jenkins and Roswell Police Chief James Conroy. We prayed together as a community. We talked about rebuilding and strengthening the trust that keeps our community safe. We talked about where do we go from here and how every one of us has a role to play. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act reflects a spirit that affirms that everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and viewed equally in the eyes of the law. This bill underscores our commitment to community-oriented policing that promotes everyone's safety and ensures accountability for those who fail to uphold their duty to protect us. And it rewards cities that are finding new ways to promote public safety. I am very proud of how we have come together as a nation, finally come together as a nation to work towards these solutions. And I am really filled with hope for the first time. I am truly filled with hope that these actions that we take today, these collaborations, Republicans and Democrats together will truly save lives. I know that there are kinks to work out and I know that there are amendments to be made, but this step that we take today is a first step in truly creating the culture of safety and preservation of life that people in this country are crying out for. We have a responsibility and accountability, and dare we not do what needs to be done. This is 400 years overdue. Let's stand in the gap and do what has to be done for all of our citizens in America. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Gomert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, comment was made earlier that uh, we don't want this bill weakened and I'm not aware of any Republican that has an amendment that would weaken the bill. Uh, we would like to make it stronger and deeply regret that we were not um, consulted to help make this a truly bipartisan bill coming out of the gate. Um, there's an awful lot of people on our side of the aisle who understand we need to make the law better and should. And many of us have worked in law enforcement, spent many years in it, and have good insights. So the process we're left to is uh, amendments. And my friend Mr. Armstrong has a good amendment here. Um, the only issue I have with anything that he said or in the amendment is when he said we need to bring the federal authorities into the 21st century. As my friend Mr. Gates pointed out, if we could just bring the FBI into the 20th century, it's a big help. And for anyone who knows that there is still some racism in law enforcement, I would contend it's a tiny percentage, but it's still there. We've seen it. Um, allowing the FBI to simply write down their version of what is said by a witness instead of doing what every cop on the street knows needs to be done, and that's a recording of what is said. Uh, the FBI is going to be able, either by faulty memory or by intent, 
sway the manner in which a witness's statement is portrayed and what is said is portrayed. That shouldn't be allowed. I mean, the FBI, until recent years, was considered by most of us to be the preeminent law enforcement uh, department or agency in the world. That has been sorely blemished. I don't think Christopher Ray's helped at all. But uh, this would go a long way toward preventing any officer, any FBI agent, any federal officer who has ill intent from being able to carry that out because the statement is a matter of record. It would be recorded, it would be, uh, it could not be edited, it would have to be played as it was, and that would help eliminate even the temptation of any federal officer to be less than candid in uh, efforts to recall what was said by a witness that could mean the difference between many, many years in prison or being the free person that he or she should be. So I hope that we can come together. Uh, this would have been a great provision to have in the bill and it would have been suggested and encouraged if we'd been consulted before the bill was brought forward. So I really hope we can come together on this. There's no reason not to have federal officers as proficient and accurate as local law enforcement in some of the smallest counties in the country. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Swalwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. The, the, the gentleman's recognized. And I also want to express uh, condolences to the Sensenbrenner family and the Barr family, uh, the tragic losses that they've endured in the last 48 hours. It was powerful testimony that we received right in this well uh, last week uh, from uh, Mr. Floyd and Mr. Underwood's uh, sister, and we have continued to see in this country individual and institutional tragedies that must move us to act, otherwise they will persist. And we are not helpless. People in the streets, they feel helpless. They feel that they're not being listened to. But we're not helpless. We are elected to represent them and to bring the change that they are calling for. But I think it's important for us to kind of calibrate where all of us are at, because it sounds like my colleagues on the other side want to welcome and embrace and work with us on needed police reforms. Not to say that all cops are bad cops, but that we're seeing too many exceptions today. And I say that as the son of a police chief, the brother to two police officers, and a former prosecutor myself. Things have to change. I and mean, no one's talking about, in this bill, defunding the police. We're talking about policing the police and fixing the police and reforming the police. But when I say we need to calibrate where we are all at, I've heard a lot of my colleagues on this side say black lives matter. And I'll be honest that when that movement first emerged, I didn't necessarily understand what that meant. I heard people say all lives matter, and I thought, well, yeah, all lives matter, right? People would say, well, you have a white privilege, and I thought, well, you know, I grew up living in 13 different houses, going to 11 different schools, first in my family to go to college, that there was no privilege there. And then it was explained to me by my African-American friends that even though you and so many others may have had hardships, your opportunity was not limited because of the color of your skin. That's what people say when they talk about a white privilege, mm -hmm. which is real and should be acknowledged. The founder of Black Lives Matter, Alicia Garza, says, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean your life isn't important. It means that black lives, which are seen as without value within white supremacy, are important to your liberation. Given the disproportionate impact state violence has on black lives, we understand that when black people in this country get free, the benefits will be wide-reaching and transformative for society as a whole. 
When we are able to end the hypercriminalization and sexualization of black people and end the poverty, control, and surveillance of black people, every single person in this world has a better shot at getting and staying free. When black people get free, everybody gets free. Black lives matter, period. And so I would yield to any of my colleagues on the Republican side who can unequivocally say, as we calibrate where we are right now, that black lives matter. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Does the gentleman believe that all lives matter as well? I think black lives matter. I think Reclaiming all lives matter. Reclaiming my time. Can anyone on the Republican side say unequivocally black lives matter? Unequivocally all lives matter. Why, why is that a problem to acknowledge? Reclaiming my time. I, I think it's clear that my colleagues on the other side would like to put up a straw man to not have the uncomfortable conversation that we need to have about race. Typically in police shootings, most of the focus is on the conduct of the officer and we never get to the harder part about the systemic issues we have in our country. Nobody is disputing that what the officer did here with Mr. Floyd should be defended. So we have to have the harder conversation about systemic issues in policing. Instead, we get this straw man of, well, you're trying to defund the police. Nowhere in this legislation is anyone seeking to defund the police. So until you're willing to get rid of the straw man, get rid of the confusion, get rid of all of the different tactics you're using to avoid the hard conversation about race in America, we are not going to get where we need to be to have equality, not just in policing, but in health care, in jobs, in education. Will the gentleman Black yield? lives matter. I'm I sad say to say no one on the other side Black lives do it. matter, unequivocally. Yeah. Black lives and do I matter. And I'll yield to Mr. Every life is precious, God-given, and black lives matter, unequivocally. Every Thank life you, is important. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I support the gentleman from North Dakota's amendment. It's a good amendment. And the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, is right on target. Cops wear body cams, but the FBI agent interviewing a three-star general doesn't have to record that conversation? That makes no sense, especially when you know the facts around that conversation that took place. Remember, in January of 2017, January 4th, 2017, the agents on the Michael Flynn case, three-star general, served our country for over 30 years. The agents on the case said, we want to drop this case. There's nothing here. They didn't want to pursue it. But what happened? The director of the FBI told Peter Strzok to tell the agents, no, 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 don't drop the case. We're going after Michael Flynn. The next day, January 5th, 2017, Jim Comey, meets with then-President Obama and talks about Michael Flynn. And what happens 19 days later? What happens 19 days later? These agents, not my words, Jim Comey's words, these agents are snuck into the White House. Mr. Comey doesn't follow the proper protocols, the proper process. He doesn't notify the White House counsel. He, doesn't, he sneaks them in to set up Michael Flynn. And there's no recording of that interview. There's the 302 notes. And guess what they do with the notes? They change them months later and prosecute a general, prosecute American citizen based on that. And all the gentleman's asking is, let's fix that. Let's at least have an audio recording of that conversation that took place. And the Democrats say, we need to study it. What? Let's just pass it. That is, that is as, com as, as Mr. Gates said, let's get with the times. Let's get with the times. We're doing a virtual hearing. We can't even see half the Democrats who are supposed to be on the screen participating. We can't even see that. But somehow the FBI can interview people, American citizens, charge them with something that turns out not to be a crime. We, we, we know there was nothing there because the Justice Department said there's nothing there. They're dropping the case. And you guys want to study making an audio recording of those type of interviews. This is as basic and simple and straightforward as it gets. The gentleman from North Dakota knows what he's talking about. He is worked in this area. So let's adopt this amendment, common sense, thoughtful, good amendment that, that needs to happen, particularly in light of what we have lived through the last three years, what we have now learned took place. This is as straightforward as it gets. 
and I would urge adoption of the amendment. I'm, I'm happy to yield uh, the remaining two minutes to my colleague from Florida if he still seeks some time. I thank the gentleman. I would, I would just comment that in, in the effort that we're here on to offer amendments like the gentleman from North Dakota that would apply to all Americans equally, as we're here to craft legislation, like the theatrics of serving us up the question on a political theme seem to be a bit misplaced. I mean, it would, it would, it would be as if, if I were willing to yield to any Democrat willing to say that blue lives matter, right? Not super productive. So I think if we acknowledge that all lives matter, that there are definitely problems in our society that we have to solve, that Congresswoman Bass has put together some, some very compelling ideas that we should evaluate in good faith, that the president has already acted on some of Congresswoman Bass's ideas and by trying to get to the root of these challenges and these problems, I hope that that would be the way we would continue the hearing. I yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, um, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My colleagues, we are here today for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Charlena Lyles, Manny Ellis, John T. Williams, and all the names that we'll never know whose lives were cut short by police. We are here to answer the cries for justice we've heard in the streets across the country with this bill, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, a bill that the New York Times has called the most aggressive intervention into policing by Congress in recent memory. And I'm very grateful to you, Chairman Nadler, and to Congresswoman Bass for, for your hard work to bring this bill forward. In my district, people of color are 30% more likely to have police point a firearm at them than white people. Seattle is 7% black, and yet black people accounted for nearly 29% of the incidents of use of force. We have been under a consent decree for eight years, and while we've made some important progress, the truth is that we are far from finished and the immediate use of force on the streets to the peaceful protesters in recent weeks show us the work that we still need to do. What we see locally tracks nationally. A November 2019 report by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found an increased likelihood of police use of force against people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ people, people with mental health concerns, people with low incomes, and those at the intersections of these groups. USCCR also found a troubling lack of data on the issue, a problem that leaves us piecing together reports in order to understand the depth of the problem that so many black and brown people across the country already know to be true. Mapping police violence found only 27 days in 2019 where police did not kill someone and black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. And stunningly, nationally, officers were not charged with a crime in 99% of the killings by police from 2013 to 2019. Is it any wonder then that tens of thousands of people across the country are heartbroken and furious that we have not done sufficient work or really anything to address these grave injustices and the constant loss of life with no accountability? The Justice and Policing Act is a crucial step forward to begin addressing centuries-old pervasive violence against the black community and communities of color. The bill bans chokeholds like the ones used to murder George Floyd and Manny Ellis in my home state. It establishes them as a civil rights violation, bans no-knock warrants for drug cases like the one that was used when officers murdered Breonna Taylor. It establishes a public police misconduct registry that tracks complaints at the local, state, and federal level. And it adopts accountability measures like reforming qualified immunity. It improves data collection by requiring the reporting of all incidents of use of force, stops, and searches, and the demographics of those involved. And importantly, the bill provides grants for black and brown communities across the country to reimagine how we ensure community safety for everyone, so that black mothers and fathers do not have to constantly warn their kids to stay away from police officers instead of seeking help from them. That cannot be our model. And this bill begins to make the changes that will allow for everyone, regardless of the color of their skin, to be safe. Some in the media and even some of my colleagues on this committee 
would like to change our focus from these essential reforms to things like digitally altered pictures on Fox News that spread lies about what is happening in my district, where community members have come together to plant community gardens and re-envision public safety, bringing much needed peace to an area that has long been the center of acti activism. Do not be distracted. Let us keep our focus on what is in this bill and what Philanese Floyd demanded we do to not allow George Floyd to simply be a picture on a t-shirt. The Justice and Policing Act says to the families of George Floyd and so many others, the wrongful deaths of your loved ones will not be in vain. We must listen and respond to the calls of black organizers, advocates, and civil rights leaders across our districts and countries, and do the long culture shifting work to change how we approach public safety. Too often, our police 20 seconds. are on the front lines responding to decades of defunding of things that mm -hmm. people really need, mental health, housing, education, reforming a broken criminal justice system, and so much more is part and parcel of what we must fix. It is not enough to say Black Lives Matter. We must do the work to cement this essential Time. principle into policy and practice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Representative Buck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Swalwell, I want to state unequivocally that I believe black lives matter. And I also uh, want to state unequivocally that I recognize that you have lived a privileged life. And I also uh, want to welcome you and uh, so many others uh, on your side of the aisle to the pro-life movement. I keep hearing about the sanctity of life, and, and I, uh, I think it is time that, that we uh, deal with this issue and, and that we find common ground on other issues and, and protecting uh, life from uh, conception to natural death is essential um, to the dignity of, of, of people in this country, and I, I, uh, I welcome my friends on, on all of those issues. Um, I also think that uh, it is uh, outstanding, and I, I, I thank the uh, gentlelady from California and the chair of the uh, subcommittee here, Ms. Bass, for recognizing the difficulty that police officers face in their day-to-day -day lives and how, and, the, and how we as a, a legislative body and how state legislatures across the country have failed in dealing with mental health issues and so many other uh, social issues and how we uh, place on police officers an unfair burden. And, and while I agree with parts of this bill, there are parts of this bill that would place an even greater burden on those police officers, the good police officers, the police officers who are protecting our young as they go back and forth to school, who are protecting our citizens as they go to the store to pick up a prescription, as they are uh, protecting uh, uh, our citizens in their everyday lives. And I think it's absolutely essential that we uh, recognize, and I thank the gentlelady for, uh, for their recognition that the police officers have uh, such a tough job. Um, I have uh, mentioned to my uh, friend and colleague, Mr. Armstrong, that I can't support this amendment. Um, I understand the compelling reason behind this amendment, and I believe that the FBI should be held accountable for the gross misconduct that it engaged in uh, uh, investigating the Trump campaign um, I think that when we require out-of-custody interviews to be uh, recorded, we are going to seriously limit the uh, FBI's ability to uh, carry out its mission uh, in the anti-terrorism area, in the white-collar area, in so many other areas where um, it is very difficult to predict the, when um, an interview is going to take place, uh, much less uh, how to foster the best uh, atmosphere for that interview. So um, I, I have reservations about this, but I think one of the, one of the serious um, failings of the Judiciary Committee in the past year and a half has been its uh, failure to fully investigate the uh, gross misconduct that the FBI engaged in with the Trump administration uh, and the uh, uh, Trump campaign. I think when you look at the uh, actions and what we have, what has been revealed so far in the press and in the, in the Senate, 
it compels this committee uh, to, to study the issue, to hold hearings on the issue, to publicize, to shine light on that misconduct, and to make sure that that misconduct doesn't happen again against a Democrat administration or a Republican administration. And it's so unfortunate that my Democrat colleagues feel it's okay to sweep something under the rug because it was uh, uh, the, the, the target of this investigation, the target of this misconduct were Republicans and uh, was somebody they don't like, President Trump. While you conducted a, a witch hunt, a, a partisan impeachment hearing, uh, down the line in the House, down the line vote on, on impeachment, you can't even look at how uh, a federal agency abused its power to, uh, to, to engage in political activities. Uh, something that I think we all find in, incredibly uh, offensive and, and uh, sad that the FBI's leadership would tarnish the image and, and the great work that's being done by so many uh, FBI agents. So I thank my colleague, uh, Mr. Armstrong, for bringing this amendment. I thank him for shining light on this serious problem that we have uh, in the FBI. And um, I look forward to making sure that, that we do everything we can to expose that behavior. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Mercoso Paul. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think it's a good opportunity for us to regroup and remind America why we are all gathered here today. We're here, like Congresswoman Bass said earlier, for fundamental change change that our communities are calling for. The deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and just over the weekend, Rayshard Brooks, have called pain and more division in our country. And what the people are asking for, what they're peacefully marching for, is change. All of us today have the opportunity, my colleagues, my Republican colleagues, my Democratic colleagues, we have the to have the courage to confront the crisis head on. And we have the responsibility in Congress and in this committee to pass laws at the federal level that will hold law enforcement accountable for their actions and ensure that they are protecting and serving our communities. I know that we can all agree on that. My constituents in my district have overwhelmingly indicated to me that that's what they're asking for, greater accountability. My office conducted a survey last week, and we got over 1,200 responses from constituents on both sides of the aisle, different ages and races. And what were they all in agreement with? That they wanted to see greater accountability for officers that were accused of misconduct. And what have we seen? We've seen thousands of Americans from all walks of life marching together, demanding change. What the people want to see is changes in police oversight and responsibility for those who fail to uphold the law. And they want to know that the law is applied equally to everyone, every American citizen. I've witnessed from personal experience in my area that law enforcement in Miami and in my district are making changes. They are trying. I have met with them and I commend the large number of officers who are working to serve and protect the people they serve. But accountability means transparency, and the efforts in this bill establish a national registry for police misconduct and require reporting on the use of force. We need these meaningful, meaningful changes to build trust in our communities. It also means that working on the front end to reform police practices and addressing the systemic racism in, that is ingrained in our society and in our government. The reality is that people of color live with and face prejudice throughout their entire lives. Our federal and state law enforcement agencies need to enact reforms that are responsive to the nation's pleas and that live up to the standard of equal protection under the law. We need to take action that ends racial profiling, bans chokeholds, and sets a standard that use of force should only be used as last resort. What the president signed as an executive order yesterday does not go far enough. And we've seen that when a new president takes over, they can repeal the executive order signed by previous presidents. That's why in Congress, as an independent branch of government, we need to ha take the responsibility to enact all of these measures into law and ensure that we ban chokeholds, not only under certain cir circumstances. 
I am proud to support the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act because it works to make all these changes. I am also proud to support this bill because it supports greater community of law enforcement. This bill promotes the use of civilian oversight boards, which will build bridges between police and the communities, giving the people a voice in their policies. They ensure officer accountability through fair and open investigations and work to shape public trust in local law enforcement. Miami-Dade County is looking at the idea of reviving civilian oversight of police, but it's only effective if it's structured correctly. And that's why HR 7120 sets a baseline for effective civilian oversight. And I think more work can be done in the future to bolster their use across the country. So please, let's not get distracted by political talking points. We shouldn't be political today, members of the judiciary, all of us working together. Let's show the American people that we are going to take action, that we have the courage and the will to make sure that we hold the police departments accountable and protect the people that they're charged to serve. Thank you, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania, Ms. Reschenthaler, seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, it's, it's general man, but, but it's sorry. okay. I understand things are fluid today. Um, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've he heard some of my colleagues try to talk about the fact that the Democrat Party does not want to defund the police. But let's just look at their own words on this matter. And this is all in the words of individuals in the Democrat Party. Brian Fa Fallon, in early June, he's the executive director of Demand Justice. He's also the former press secretary to Hillary Clinton, and he, he's the spokesperson for Attorney General Eric Holder. He tweeted, quote, defund the police. On June 5th, Representative Omar, she represents Minneapolis, as we all know, she tweeted, and I quote, the Minneapolis Police Department has proven themselves beyond reform. It's time to disband them and reimagine public safety in Minneapolis. Minneapolis City Council member Jeremiah Ellison, who's coincidentally the son of Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, he tweeted, and I quote, we are going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. And when we're done, we're not simply gonna glue it back together. We're going to dramatically rethink how we approach public safety and emergency response. It's really past due. Ellison then also publicly pledged his support to the leftist terrorist organization, Antifa. Lisa Bender, president of the Minneapolis City Council tweeted, we're going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, Patrice Cullors, a co-founder of the BLM movement, wants to see police forces abolished entirely. Steve Fletcher, Minnesota Council City member, he's, he stated that he and the city council president and the chair of public safety are calling to, and I quote, disband our police department and start fresh with a community-oriented, nonviolent public safety and outreach capacity. And in L.A., Mayor Eric Garcetti is looking to defund the police to the tune of over $250 million of cuts. So, Mr. Chairman, we constantly hear from the left that words matter. That's the mantra of the left. Well, words do matter. And the Democrats want to, and this is in their own words, the Democrats want to defund, dismantle, and abolish the police. So, Mr. Chairman, these are their words, and their words certainly matter. Now, if I could address one more point that I've heard today, I heard my colleague, one of my colleagues, try to minimize CHAZ, the autonomous zone in Seattle, the six square blocks in downtown Seattle that Antifa has taken over. Well, I've heard it minimized as something like it's a peaceful protest, alluded to as something that we would see in the 60s, the summer of love, but let me just quote the chief of police in Seattle. Uh, Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best said, and I quote, rapes, robberies, and all sorts of violent acts have been occurring in the area and we're not able to get to them, unquote. So before we minimize Chaz, think about that. Rape, robberies, and all sorts of violent acts. So let's call this for what it is. It's a terrorist organization that has taken over six city blocks in Seattle, a quote unquote autonomous zone, and Seattle and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle 
are minimizing this behavior and allowing rapes, robberies, and all sorts of acts to occur under the name of quote unquote peaceful protests. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield to my friend and colleague from North Dakota. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. And I, I appreciate Mr. Buck's comments, and I think this is where we're at. This type of reform is really hard, and it's really hard to do well. And not all differences are ideological. He's a prosecutor, I'm a defense attorney. I would be more susceptible to his argument if the FBI hasn't system systemically circumvented what they consider a custodial versus a non-custodial interview for well over a decade. But also with that, in that regard, I would like, I mean, we are asking state and local departments from the federal government to do a lot of things. And we are dictating how to do a lot of things. At the very least we could do when we do that is what we, what we have said is require basic technology and fundamental fairness with what is supposed to be the premier law enforcement agencies in the country. And to Mr. Chairman's point about going to rules, I was in rules during FISA Rioth, and I watched Ms. Lofgren's amendment die in some black hole that I don't get to be in the room when that vote happens. That's why we're here. We need to do these things here. This is simple. And just before my time runs out, I have some unanimous consent requests. Uh, FBI memo dated 323-2006, titled Electronic Recording of Confessions and Witness Interviews. F DOJ memo dated 512-2014, subject concerning electronic recordings of statements. A report by the Northwestern University School of Law Center for Wrongful Convictions in the summer of 2004, police experiences with recording custodial in inter interrogations, the Justice Project, electronic recordings of custodial interrogations, and specifically for my friend Mr. Br Buck, the grand jury target, tracking key issues in white collar prosecutions. With that, I yield back. Without objection, the statements are accepted and the gentleman's time has expired. And the, uh, I now recognize uh, Ms. Ms. Scanlon. And I'd like to, uh, may I move to strike the last word? General ladies recognized. And could I yield briefly to Ms. Bass? Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I have to uh, correct my good friend, Representative Russian Schaller, since you called out my city, Los Angeles. Uh, I will tell you that our mayor did not defund the police in Los Angeles on any given day. We have 40,000 people who are homeless, 40,000. And so what he did was reallocate money to address the problems that the police department never wants to deal with because they shouldn't. Thank you, I yield back to the good lady. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bass and everyone who's worked so diligently to bring the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill before us. We are witnessing a long overdue moral reckoning in this country and we can't wait any longer to act. In the week since we held our last hearing, another black man has lost his life at the hands of the police when he was shot in the back in Atlanta. We have to act now. I want to thank the gentleman from North Dakota for bringing this promising bill to our attention, and I look forward to working with him on it to include it in the final bill. I appreciate his bringing his experience as a prosecutor to propose a substantive amendment. Worthy. Defense attorney. Sorry, defense attorney. But, but bringing that experience in this field to us to, to work to make the bill better. I particularly appreciate the seriousness with which he approaches the issue of actually addressing police accountability rather than making irrelevant political arguments or suggesting toothless proposals that will not make the changes we need to dismantle systemic racism in our country. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, I want to say that I respect, respect Representative Bass, and I think that she works hard. Um, there are parts of this underlying bill that I agree with, and I think there's parts of this underlying bill that most Republicans and the President could agree with. But it's disappointing that from what I've been told, there was no reach out to Republicans to work on this bill. And so there are parts of this bill that I can't support. 
And the reason that I can't support it is because I talk to constituents and law enforcement officers, a wide variety of law enforcement officers, and they said portions of this bill will undermine their ability to protect communities. Now, in response to Representative Swalwell wanting a Republican to say Black Lives Matter, Mr. Swalwell, of course Black Lives Matter. Of course, my black two grandsons, their lives matter. My life matters. Native Americans' lives matter. Hispanics' lives matter. White lives matter. Everyone's lives matter. And so do unborn children that are born alive from a botched abortion, which Republicans have brought forward, I think, 80 to 100 times a motion on the floor of the House of Representatives saying, please give medical care and save the lives of unborn children that are born alive. And the Democrats have failed to let us hear that bill. So of course, all lives matter. And with any time I have left, I yield to Mr. Armstrong. And he does not want, he does not need any more time, so I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Deming seeks recognition. Mr. Liu seeks recognition and Mr. Liu is recognized. Oh, uh, we'll recognize Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is one of the most important hearings this committee will have because what has happened in Minneapolis has brought the nation's attention to problems that this country has had since 1619 when the first slaves were brought into this country. And we had slavery until 1863-65, Emancipation Proclamation slash into the Civil War, Juneteenth. And then we had Jim Crow. And then we had post-Jim Crow, which was the Southern strategy, which was a continuation of a racist policy that we've had for years to keep black people down, to not give them rights, to not give them opportunities to participate in the American dream, to have health care, to have education, to have job training, to not be discriminated against in housing, to not be discriminated against in employment. And, and it all came to the bear. That is the issue that brought us here today, was George Floyd, killed by a police officer with no concern for humanity, the, one of the most cruel acts ever witnessed, live, by individuals on the street and then immediately thereafter by recordings, video recordings, to where we all saw that officer put his knee on the neck of the man who said, I cannot breathe, and he didn't give a hoot because he was a policeman who had been upset that the, Mr. Mr. Floyd apparently didn't cooperate in getting in the back seat of the car, and he was going to teach him a lesson. He was going to teach him a lesson that he would remember for eight minutes and 46 seconds, not forever, but for Mr. Floyd it was forever. Eight minutes and 46 seconds became forever because he didn't do what a policeman wanted him to do. And a policeman doesn't have that power, and he didn't have that power in Atlanta when a man asleep at the Wendy's ran away. He had a taser, but that's, the policeman's not supposed to kill somebody because they're running away with a taser. They should have not used deadly force, but they did it for the same reason that Mr. Floyd was killed, because that officer's ego was hurt because that man got away from the officer. That man got that officer's taser, and he was going to teach him a lesson. Police should not be teaching people lessons that they would, and kill them because of it. They ought to teach them lessons about, you really shouldn't do this, and let me explain to you why. community oriented policing. And there are a lot of policemen that do that. But there's some and quite a few bad apples, 
and they're mostly focused on African Americans because they focus on people who have the least power in society because that's where they get off. What I heard last week and what I've heard today from my Republican colleagues has been disheartening, disheartening, and disheartening. And America should be repulsed by it because this hearing's about police, it's about racism, it's about overuse of force against individuals that cost them their lives. It's not about abortion. It's not about Mueller. It should be more about Mueller, but it's not about Trump. Orange Lives Matter. It's not about that. It, it's not about defunding the police, and it's not about Officer Underwood. It's about police overuse of force often against African Americans and America not doing what it should have done rightfully by the people they enslaved and treated as second class citizens for so many years. That's what this is about. And not to address that subject and to bring up these subterfuges, these ruses, is a disrespect to every African American and every right thinking American. And that's what we've gone on when this committee last week in the hearing, they didn't ask questions about the bill, they talked about defunding the police. Then they come up and they go, well, this person, this Democrat may be for defunding the police, one member of Congress and this one and that one. Well, Steve King talked about white supremacy. That doesn't mean every Republican was a white supremacist, but that's the way they're interpreting any one person talking about defunding the police. And talking about white supremacy, Mr. Ms. Underwood was brought here to sh talk about the riots. That was, that was a bait and switch too. Officer Underwood was killed by a guy named Carrillo who killed us, the Santa Cruz Sheriff. And that's when they saw that he'd used a white van, a Ford van, and found out that he'd killed Officer Underwood, a white supremacist member of a group called Boogaloo that wants to bring about an impending civil war. But they're not talking about getting rid of white supremacists or people that want an impending civil war in Boogaloo. They didn't know that was the case when they brought him up. But that's what they're talking about, because they wanted to switch it from protesters to rioters. Well, we're all against rioters. We're all for the police. I'm for the police. I think they can be improved upon. But let's get to the issue today, and that's unjust policing and unjust practices against African Americans. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purposes does Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. I wanted to give just one further response to Mr. Swalwell, who asked this question. Apparently, you know, he's just not been listening to his colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I think every one of us have said unequivocally over the last few weeks that there is inherent dignity in every single life, not just American, every life around the world. I've said in every interview, national, local, regional, I've said in our subcommittee hearings and in this hearing before in opening statements that, that it's not just that lives matter, it's that every single human life has inestimable dignity and value. And our value is not related in any way to the color of our skin, where we come from, what zip code we live in, where we went to school, how talented we are, how good looking, what we contribute to society. None of that is relevant. Every single human life has an estimable dignity and value because it's given to us by our creator. And I have further exp explained, and so have all my Republican colleagues, that this is an essential thing. It's essential to who we are as Americans. We, we, we find this as our foundational creed. We find it listed in the second paragraph, the Declaration of Independence, our nation's birth certificate. G.K. Chesterton was the late British philosopher. He said America is the only nation in the world that is founded upon a creed. And he said it's listed with theological lucidity in the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What is a self-evident truth? It's something you cannot not know. Why is that? Because it's stamped upon your heart by your creator. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Remember, the Declaration does not say we are born equal. It says we are created equal by someone, by God. And they said, because we're created by God, he gives everybody the same inalienable rights. And among these rights are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This was a promissory note, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, to future Americans. We, we have not lived up to that ideal. We're working on it. The, the first paragraph... Uh, the first line of our Constitution says we do this, we the people do this in order to form a more perfect union. What the House Judiciary Committee is about is working together to form a more perfect union. My friend, I, I don't know how you've missed all this, but we are all united on that. We all agree that there needs to be meaningful reform, 
But what we're doing here is having thoughtful dialogue and debate, exactly the kind that was envisioned at our founding, to form and come together with the best answers, the best solutions that will, that will advance the ball for the most American people. That's part of the process. And, and part of the thing that we've lamented today is that we, we haven't been part of the process yet. <clears throat> the Democrats pr proposed this bill, went, went together in a room somewhere, and, and, and did not allow <coughs> us in it. We, we, we respectfully requested to be a part of the process. Staff reached out to staff, and we were rebuffed in that request. So if, if everything that Mr. Cohen just said and others have said is true, if you really want to have meaningful reform, if you really want to improve American policing in a way that will work and will maintain public security and safety, then it seems like you would be open to the thoughtful ideas that we have on the other side. We ought to be doing this together. As I said in my opening statement, the American people expect that and they deserve it. We don't need partisan squabbles in here. We need all of us to work together and to treat one another with the dignity and respect that our declaration entitles us to and that the founders recognized was a self-evident truth. Look, we've got, I appreciate Ms. Scanlon and others uh, acknowledging the thoughtful amendment of, of Congressman Armstrong. He comes to this very thoughtfully. We had a meeting last night. He talked about it at length. This is his background, his expertise, and he has a lot to offer, and you ought to listen to him. We've got 20 other amendments here that are equally thoughtful, and we ought to have a, an important debate. I hope the American people are watching this. I hope they're recording everything we say, and let's not engage in these squabbles about whether we all think life is precious, because every single one of us does, and when we get beyond that squabble, we can get onto the meaningful work of the committee. I'll yield to Mr. Gates. I thank the gentleman for yielding. In response to the gentleman from Tennessee, he said this is, a hearing is about police. It's not about Mueller. I, don't, I know that it seems like impeachment was a very, very, very long time ago, eons ago, but the gentleman from North Dakota's amendment doesn't target Mueller or the operations of, of his team. It, it, it seeks broadly to affect this 302 process, but specifically the circumstance we describe occurred before Mueller. Before Mueller was ever appointed, before there was even a basis for this embarrassing hoax, you had Jim Comey telling the FBI to go in and trap General Flynn, and they didn't use recordings. And so it just would seem illogical to say that we're here in a discussion about police and law enforcement, but we're going to absolve from that discussion our own FBI. I think the FBI is a relevant topic when talking about police. Uh, the time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Liu, if we have him. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman Nadler and Representative Bass for your hard work on this legislation. I want to start off by noting that it was a white police officer that put his knee on George Floyd's neck for over eight minutes and murdered him. It was a member of a white supremacist, actually it was a member of a white wing group that was arrested for killing Patrick Underwood. And we're here because black lives matter. And very few Republican officials have been able to say that. The president hasn't been able to say it. The attorney general hasn't said it. Most Republican members of Congress haven't been able to say it. And why does that matter? Because you can't fix the problem if you can't even identify the problem. And if you say black lives matter, but then immediately qualify it with all lives matter, saying all life is precious, it shows that you don't understand the problem. The problem is we have a system that does not treat all life as precious. It's a system that consistently undervalues black lives. Now, do blue lives matter? Of course. The system already protects blue lives. Is all life precious? Absolutely. Except the system doesn't view it that way. And that's why we are here. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this system. It wasn't just one rogue cop that killed George Floyd. It was an additional two police officers that had their knees on his body and a fourth officer that was stood as a lookout. But then there was this whole training involved. They were trained in procedures that obstructed people's airways. And then there was the Minneapolis Police Department spokesperson that gave entirely misleading account of what happened. And then there were the civilians and police officers who knew about Derek Chauvin's prior misconduct and didn't take strong enough action. It takes an entire village 
to allow for the persistent systematic murder of black Americans by government. And if you don't get that, if you think that this is just about a few rogue cops, you don't understand their problem. Right now, black Americans are killed at a rate twice as high as white Americans by police officers. That's not a few rogue cops, that's an entire system. Now, are there good cops? Are most cops good? Absolutely. Just like most people on this committee, I hope all of us think we're good people too. But good people can perpetuate a bad system. We are part of a system that has repeatedly discriminated against minorities. Just take this pandemic. Blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Pacific Islanders die at far higher, higher rates than whites in education and housing in our prisons, there are huge disparities between colored people and whites. And we're part of that system. We help create it. Does that make us bad people? That's for historians to judge. But now that we've been made very aware of the police brutality against black Americans, we have a responsibility to fix it. And the first thing we have to do is to understand the problem. The problem, again, is that black lives are being undervalued. And either you can help us, my colleagues on this side, to fix this problem, or you can allow the inherent racism of our society to continue. We've got a great bill here systematically these reforms. This is a systematic problem. It is not a matter of a few rogue cops, a few bad apples. Please understand that. Please be able to say Black Lives Matters without qualifying it. Show us you get the problem. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We seem to have uh, gone far afield from the amendment before us. Mr. Armstrong's amendment simply requires federal law enforcement to record interviews with suspects and witnesses. Well, one of the provisions of this bill that I strongly support is the encouragement of police cameras to accurately document police encounters and interviews with the public. And there's a very important reason for that. It provides us with an eyewitness that has an absolutely perfect memory, a video, that would protect police officers and the public alike from false charges. Now, Mr. Armstrong's amendment is perfectly aligned with this provision. Just as a police video eliminates all doubt about what happened in a particular encounter, including what was said, this provision eliminates all doubt about what was said in a particular interview. I don't see how anyone who supports the use of police cameras to document encounters would then oppose a provision that would use a police recording to document interviews with sus suspects uh, and, and witnesses. So I, uh, I strongly support this amendment and would ask that the majority consider it. The gentleman yields back. I would remind the gentleman and other gentlemen that for the safety of their colleagues and the decorum of the House, they should be wearing masks, Mr. Jordan. Um, and uh, I now recognize Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sending my condolences to Mr. Sensenbrenner and Mr. Barr on the loss of their beloved wives. Life is precious, as the ranking member uh, reminded us, drawing on the words of uh, George Floyd's brother. Um, life is precious, and in the midst of this pandemic, which has cost more than 115,000 lives, we can show that we truly believe life is precious by wearing masks when we're not speaking in this committee room. Mr. Chairman, the whole premise of government, of civil government, is that we'll be safer inside the social contract than we'll be outside of it, in the state of nature, which Thomas Hobbes said was a state of war, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. So we exchange the habits of violent self-help, revenge, and tribal justice for trust in the rule of law and the impartial administration of justice. But the American social contract has never been like that for the African-American community. It has been a majestic dream laced with violence and speckled with racist poison, 
Where was the social contract for George Floyd as Officer Chauvin pressed the air out of his body and asphyxiated him, murdering him over a period of eight minutes and 46 seconds? Where was the social contract for Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old emergency room technician who was shot at least eight times in her body, in her own bed, never even having been charged with a crime by officers executing a no-knock warrant? Where was the social contract for 12-year-old Tamir Rice, gunned down after a snowball fight in a park in Cleveland? Where was the social contract for Michael Brown, for Eric Garner, for Rayshard Brooks? Where is the social contract today for African-American citizens who often experience fear of the police whose salaries they are paying? The Justice in, Poli in Policing Act is the beginning, just the beginning of repairing the broken social contract in our country. It bans chokeholds and strangleholds. It requires that deadly force be used only when absolutely necessary to save life. It stops militarizing law enforcement and therefore stops confusing the police whose job it is to protect and defend our people with the army which is trained to kill the enemy. It requires body cameras and dashboard cameras. It ends racial, ethnic, religious profiling in America. It removes the perverse doctrine of qualified immunity in civil rights lawsuits so that neither federal nor state and local officers can escape liability for violent assaults against citizens simply sh by showing that their exact misconduct, no matter how egregious, had not taken place in exactly the same way before. These are serious, meaningful changes that are the bare minimum any of us would accept and should accept operating under a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, that is, not knowing whether we ourselves and members of our families would be a citizen with a knee on our neck or a SWAT team in our bedroom in the middle of the night. The Founding Fathers would be proud of this package. The vast majority of the constitutional amendments in the Bill of Rights are efforts to control the police power of the state. The Third Amendment, no quartering of troops in people's houses. The Fourth Amendment, no unreasonable searches and seizures. Warrants only based on probable cause. The Fifth Amendment, the privilege against self-incrimination. The Sixth Amendment, the jury trial. The Eighth Amendment, no double jeopardy, no cruel and unusual punishment in our country. The Ninth Amendment, our founders understood that tyranny begins with the abuse of the police power. And the social contract begins with protecting the dignity, the safety, and the security of each and every citizen and their families. An officer who arrogates to himself the power to kill a citizen who has been subdued appoints himself not just cop, but legislator, prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner. Officer Chauvin appointed himself God when it came to the life of George Floyd. The good cops in America, most of the cops in America favor reform and oppose the disgraceful actions of Derek Chauvin and those who stood by and did nothing and watched him murder a citizen. The good cops should not be faulted for the crimes of the bad cops because here we don't believe in collective guilt, guilt by association, and mass punishment, the principles that we have had to repoke, invoke repeatedly in this committee. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Klein see recognition? Move to strike last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The horrific killing of George Floyd has led to millions of Americans speaking out to seek action in the wake of his tragic murder. And I am glad we are here to address it. And I was deeply moved by the testimony we heard last week and had high hopes that we would be able to find a bipartisan way to move forward on real reforms. While I'm still hopeful we can co find common ground as we have in the past, I'm disappointed that the debate over solutions has been sidetracked by a coddling of leftist anarchists and a refusal by many on the other side to reject those in Seattle and in other places across the country who want to defund the police. This simply is not a realistic option and distracts from real reform. Our dedicated police officers who serve our communities work to ensure that lawlessness does not prevail in our streets and neighborhoods. The anarchy unfolding within Seattle's 
autonomous zone, or CHAZ, is an example of what defund the police would look like if implemented across America. I believe there are many ways we can continue to work together rather than put forward policies that divide us. Congress should be working in a bipartisan manner to ensure that law enforcement develops and utilizes the tools and tactics to keep our communities safe while protecting the rights of the people they serve. While H.R. 7120 is well-intentioned, we must make additional changes to the bill in order to strike a balance on reform while respecting the need to maintain the rule of law. Many of the policies included in the bill before us are ideas that can achieve bipartisan consensus. Increased data collection about officer-involved shootings, prohibiting the use of chokeholds and no-knock warrants, making lynching a federal crime, and reducing the militarization of our police forces are all areas where we can potentially find bipartisan consensus. Unfortunately, this bill was crafted without the input of Republicans, and we need to make revisions that not only protect citizens, but ensure the foundational principles of the rule of law are respected in order to get this legislation across the finish line together. It means spending more time here in this room today, uh, in and we could have avoided uh, a lengthy day today with consultations occurring before uh, the markup today. As a committee, we should be working together to find solutions to the pervasive problems that exist in our nation and ensure that all Americans are being afforded access to justice under the law. Yesterday, the President made it clear through his executive order, he is committed to keeping our community safe and ensuring a fair justice system for all Americans. I truly hope we can seize this moment in time so that Americans can come together, and I hope as legislators we can craft a solution today to make our community safe while strengthening the bonds between our fellow Americans and ensuring justice for all. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Ngu seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Nadler, for swiftly bringing up H.R. 7120, the Justice and Policing Act, for markup today. Um, I also uh, want to thank Chairwoman Bass for her incredible work over these many weeks in crafting this legislation. I know she's engaged a broad group of stakeholders and has had many conversations with Democratic and Republican members of the House, as well as the administration, and I thank her for her leadership in addition to her many duties as the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus and, of course, as the chair of the Crime Subcommittee, she's taken it upon herself to be a mentor to uh, new, young black members of Congress like myself. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to her for her friendship and her mentorship. I also just want to say that uh, I certainly appreciate uh, my friend from North Dakota in terms of his thoughtfulness, and I you know, recognize that he approaches this issue in good faith. Um, I will be unable to vote uh, in support of his amendment. I think Mr. Buck raises some uh, important points with respect to potential unintended consequences, but I also think that it's worth considering and, and studying as we move the bill to the floor. But I want to talk about the broader bill and ultimately why we're here today. As a nation, we continue to feel the immense pain and distress over the recent killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others. However, these latest killings did not appear out of nowhere. They are rooted in generations of inequality and injustice. And it is time that Congress address these disparities in policing and create meaningful and structural reform, which is why uh, we are taking up the Justice and Policing Act, which I do believe is a bold and transformative piece of legislation that will increase public safety and will ensure accountability, establishing a national use of force standard, bringing transparency into policing by standing up the first ever national database of civilian police encounters and providing additional tools to the Department of Justice to root out police misconduct through the use of pattern or practice investigations. I also want to emphasize why, in my view, this amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by uh, the chairman is so important. As we all know, the Civil Rights Division has the statutory power to investigate unconstitutional pattern and practices of racial bias and violent policing. It's been a successful tool in reforming systemic police misconduct in the past, and yet it is a tool that the current attorney general, Mr. Barr, has refused to use uh, in Minneapolis or other areas, and ultimately a tool that the Trump administration has largely discarded. Uh, there is no question that these investigations, the resulting consent decrees, uh, have had an impact. They've played an essential role in reforming uh, troubled police departments. An academic evaluation of Los Angeles, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh consent decrees found that court-ordered reforms are likely to result in departments having a stronger, more capable accountability infrastructure and more robust training. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, the DOJ has demonstrated that it is unwilling to use the tools that Congress has provided 
uh, to address these issues. Uh, so we must look to our state attorneys general. Uh, we worked, my office, with Colorado's attorney general, Phil Weiser, uh, and proposed an amendment to the Justice and Policing Act that would provide express authority to state attorney generals to conduct these investigations. The state AGs are in a unique position due to the familiarity and understanding of historical context in their respective states. And it's imperative that they fill in this, this gaping hole that uh, has been left by the Attorney General's Department of Justice. I'm very grateful to Chairman Nadler for including this amendment as part of the ANS before the committee and, and support its passage. So again, I, put simply, I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of this legislation. I appreciate my colleagues uh, considering it respectfully, and I would certainly urge them to support this bill. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Uh, who seeks recognition? The, ge uh, the, ge uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. I'd like to move to strike the last word, please. Gentleman's recognized. And thank you. And first of all, let me express my condolences as well to our colleagues, Mr. Sensenbrenner and Mr. Barr, for their families' losses. Um, and I'd like to also thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Chairwoman Bass, for your work on this legislation and Ms. Bass, let me just say that this represents a lifetime of work for you. And I totally agree with you. We must have change and change has to happen now. And it has to be meaningful change because our communities, our streets demand that we regain the public trust of our public safety officers. Um, you said something in your opening statements that struck me, which was, that we should not expect police to fix our social issues. You have a very good point. Um, and one of the issues that uh, I'd like to take note is our, our uh, national drug policy right now. Federal cannabis policy essentially outlawing cannabis. And uh, as you know, when we talk about arrest disparities, specifically cannabis related, over 650,000 Americans are arrested uh, every year for violating cannabis laws. And according to the ACLU, in every single state, black folks are more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, uh, and in some states, 10 times more likely to be arrested than others. Uh, many communities have lost many of their loved ones to incarceration due to cannabis-related convictions. And uh, although cannabis reform in terms of uh, its criminalization, will not undo the practices that have led to these demonstrations that we're seeing today. Decriminalizing cannabis will be a major step in the right direction. And as you know, last week during our community hearing, Professor Butler stated that the legalization of cannabis will help uh, create equal justice under the law. Uh, and Congress, in my opinion, must move to address uh, decriminalizing cannabis. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to yield, yield the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back. Uh, who seeks recognition? Uh, uh, Ms. Garcia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to join all the others in expressing my condolences to colleagues who have lost their loved ones. And also to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, Chairwoman Bass for the extraordinary work that you all have done on this bill. Uh, you know, it just completely continues to baffle me that, that some suggest that this is all about defunding uh, police. Uh, I, I hope that they've read the bill. Uh, it's all its uh, 137 pages, because I fail to see anywhere in this bill anything about defunding police, disrespecting police, or anything that would would cause anyone to think that. So Mr. Chairman, I think we need to kind of take a deep breath and kind of really look at what we're talking about today. It is past time for Congress to make systematic changes on issues of racism, police brutality, and racial profiling. We must put an end to the unnecessary use of force by the police that have resulted in the death of one too many black and brown Americans. As a person of faith, I believe the responsibility falls on each and every one of us to ensure that everyone, everyone is treated as a child of God. 
However, the reality is that George Floyd was not treated as a child of God when he repeated his last words, I can't breathe. We cannot go back to business as usual and allow George Floyd to be forgotten, perhaps like many others before him. We must lead on this issue to ensure that George not, is not just one more black life claimed by the system. As elected officials, it's important that we reform our federal criminal civil rights statutes to protect black and brown Americans who just want to live and breathe and just walk down the street without fear. Justice demands that we must put an end to brutality, racial profiling, white supremacy, and the vicious racism that continues in America. Justice demands that long-suffering Americans be made whole for being denied their rights as Americans. Is there anything that history has taught us? It has taught us that our laws must boldly affirm that yes, black lives matter. We cannot keep ignoring this as a country. In the Latino community, we too are affected by police brutality and racial profiling. As we seek out the truth and speak out when justice demands equality for all, it is important for Latinos to stand with our black brothers and sisters on this issue because we are affected together. I believe that this bill is the righteous step to the due process that is necessary. As you know, I come from Texas, a state that is home to millions of Latinos and Blacks, uh, and unfortunately too, it's a state that has deeply been deeply affected by multiple incidents of police brutality over the past few years. Many of these incidents have been conducted with unjustified force. I firmly believe that this bill would make Americans safer by guaranteeing police accountability under the law and requiring, requiring frayed police community relations. This bill will save lives and respond to the gross injustices that have resulted in the deaths of so many, George Floyd, Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Laquan McDonald, Sandra Bland, Antonio Arce, and Pamela Turner, among others. I say their name because today we are honoring them with real transformative action. Mr. Chairman, I cannot support this amendment and I strongly support and urge all my colleagues to vote for the underlying bill uh, that is so critical to make real transformational change in this country. We must do it and we must do it now. Thank you, thank you. I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Jeffrey seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your leadership. I thank uh, Chairwoman Bass for her tremendous leadership uh, as well. I don't doubt that this amendment is being offered in good faith. I do not support it. And it has also led us into a discussion that is at irrelevant as it relates to the question at hand. Video Florida was not brought to me by a fellow member of Congress. It was not brought to me by my chief of staff. It was not brought to me by my legislative director. It was brought to me by my young black son, who after Ahmad Aubrey and after Breonna Taylor presented the video to me and simply said, it's happened again. Dad, what are you going to do about it? That's why we're all here. Not to talk about Michael Flynn. That's why Americans of every race are in the streets demanding justice and systematic change. What are we going to do about it? Not about Michael Flynn. What are we going to do about Amadou Diallo, Sean Bell, and Eric Garner? What are we going to do about Tamir Rice and Walter Scott and Oscar Grant? What are we going to do about Sandra Bland and Stephon Clark and Breonna Taylor? What are we going to do about George Floyd, who narrated his own death for eight minutes and 
46 seconds. We're not here to talk about Michael Flynn. That's beneath the dignity of this institution and the lives that have been lost. So like so many other young people across America, my young son says he wants to go and protest. And though, of course, like any father, I have concerns, but I let him do what he thinks is right in Brooklyn. But I have to have that conversation with him again that so many of us have had with our young black children. Make sure you have your ID with you. Not because you're a threat and not his driver's license because he's too young to be able to drive, but because without that ID, your high school ID, someone in law enforcement may think that you're a threat and can detain you for that reason alone. And some may even look at you as a threat because of the color of your skin, just like they did 12-year-old Tamir Rice. And then, of course, I had to say, do not respond or react to any unjustified abuse against you. That's what Eric Garner did. He said, I've had enough. And then he said, I can't breathe 11 times and was choked to death. So even if you're completely in the right, you're being harassed, you're being abused, you can't respond because it may result in your life being taken. And then, of course, I had to say, and if you are detained, don't say anything, don't sign anything. Even if they say to you that you'll be let go, what do you think happened to the Central Park Five? They were given false confections by law enforcement to sign. So we're not here to talk about Michael Flynn. We're here to solve a problem of police violence, harassment, and the absence of dignity that has occurred not month, not year after year, but decade after decade. I support the purpose of the Mr. Chairman, gentleman from Ohio Secret. Mr. Chairman, I uh, last word and yield to the gentleman from uh, uh, North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anybody who thinks this amendment isn't relevant to what we're doing here has no idea how law enforcement works. And before we want to go too far into this, I want to reiterate under this bill, without this amendment, this is what Federal agent required to wear a body camera. Federal agent required to have a dashboard camera. In a very scenario gets the side off. Turn them off. You don't need it anymore. When you're being talked to, when you're being to deal with. And just so you know, said this last week, I come from a state that's 88% right, white. So these, these issues are a little different to me. But I have seen a Native American woman with obstruction because she was clearly intoxicated and not represented by counsel in her first interview. And shockingly, her second interview didn't match up. I've seen a Hispanic who speaks broken English, without an interpreter, nor a lawyer present, get his plea deal redu re revoked because his first interview was different than his second interview. I'm guaranteeing you this. Both of those clients wish those interviews were either at least audio recorded, and none of them were in custody, according to federal agents. Back. Thank you. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the gentleman from Texas. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and to follow up with Mr. Armstrong's comment, um, if you truly believe 100% in your heart, there is no one who is racist at all in any federal enforcement department totally appropriate you to vote against this amendment but if there is the possibility that any federal even one federal law enforcement officer anywhere is
is racist, then you ought to vote for this amendment. And I appreciate all the wonderful speeches everybody's made, but failed to address this good amendment. Uh, thank you for the good speeches, but this amendment is what we're talking about now. And it will make a difference. It will make law enforcement better. It will prevent people, even if they, well, obviously, even if they have any racist inclinations from exhibiting those because it will all be recorded and you can't hide it. So I applaud the amendment and thank you for that. And uh, I, too, um, totally express my sympathy for Jim Sensenbrenner's loss, Andy Barr's loss, and I'm grateful to everybody since to that wonderful back to my friend from Ohio. Thank you for claiming my time. I'd also like to uh, add my condolences uh, to the uh, spouses uh, who passed away, uh, Ms. Sensenbrenner uh, and Ms. Barr. Um, and these were truly great people. And uh, this area is very important as we are. And there are many things that we really could work out in a partisan manner had we been consulted ahead of time. And I'm hoping uh, that a number of the amendments that I can offer one, but we have three, uh, we're going to be working with uh, Senator Tim to get these actually into law if at all mm -hmm. possible. Um, because there's a lot of good things we could do in the area to reform uh, police the vast majority of whom are professionals and work extremely hard and put their lives at risk every day. Um, but apparently there's not a lot of bipartisanship. We'll see. we got more time left in this committee, but we keep seeing a lot of shots across the bow from the other side, which is unfortunate. Um, and I'd like to now yield to the gentleman, our rank member. Um, I thank you for yielding. The gentleman from North Dakota is exactly right. The individuals he referenced, the two examples he gave, I do wish that Views were recorded, and as the people's Mr. Jeffries talked about, probably wish those interactions were recorded. And I know General Flynn wishes his interview recorded because we know what they did after that. They went and changed the very notes the day it happened. Oh, way, two agents after the General Flynn I think he was lying. They thought he was being straightforward and honest. But they went ahead and changed it because the FBI was out to get him. So I think every example, the examples the gentleman gave from North Dakota, who's a sponsor of the amendment, the, je the examples that Mr. Jeffries gave against the amendment, they probably would have their interview recorded too. And I know General Flynn would have liked his interview recorded. And yet, and yet, everybody's going to vote. They're going to vote against it. Absolutely no sense. They're going to vote against it. I hope this passes. I hope you have a change of heart. I hope we pass the gentleman's amendment and get on with the other good amendments that we're going to offer. I yield back. Yield back. The gentleman yields back for the purpose of uh, uh, Ms. Escobar is ready. Uh, Mr. Chairman, move to suspend. General Lady's recognized. Mr. Chairman, here and yet other. Well, I have no doubt of Mr. Armstrong's desire to improve. Uh, our legislation. I have to express doubts about um, some of my colleagues, and I feel like I need to discuss about why we are here. Last week, Bill and Lloyd sat in front of us just one day after a memorial. I asked our colleagues to stop political games, and focus on why they were present, and to focus on what is in the. Fortunately. Not surprisingly, they didn't. Most of the members of the minority party chose instead to focus on the defund the police movement, which is not in the bill. And today at the beginning of this hearing, the ranking member told us that there would be thoughtful amendments offered. I want to remind everyone why we are here. In the face of horrific police brutality and systemic racism that demands just and honest response, in the face of hundreds of thousands of Americans marching in the street, for justice, we have to, our First Amendment. First Amendment that we're debating is about the Russia investigation. Are our Republican colleagues surprised when the American public believes that they have yet to understand the movement we're seeing hold in our country? This moment 
is a reckoning, and we either rise in this moment or we don't. It's about time that we face the racism that has found its way into our institutions. It's about time we call it out, and it's about time we take action. Until there's that recognition and that action against the corrosive and deadly role that racism plays, change won't happen. It's meaningless games are an insult. Enough of time wasting commissions, forces, incentives. I support this bill because black lives matter. I support this bill because it finally forces a reckoning for lives needlessly lost. And unfortunately, no country is exempt. Andres Cortez, Daniel Rodrigo Sainz, Mercedes de Mayo, David Alejandro Ganda, Daniel Ramirez, Eric Emmanuel Salas Sanchez, in my community, many unknown people killed local law enforcement, many of them suffering from mental illness. No community is exempt. These tragedies will continue until we act. I believe that the countless dedicated law enforcement professionals across the country are as hungry for reform as we are. Reform protects good cops and it exposes bad cops. Reform keeps communities safe, everyone in the community, whether they wear a badge or not. It's time for that can't happen until we have honest conversations. I urge my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, it's not too late to think of the innumerable lives lost needlessly at the hands of brutality. Work with us toward justice. Mr. Chairman, I want to yield the remaining time to my colleague, Representative Jayapal. Thank you, Congresswoman Escobar, for those powerful words. I did just want to correct the because my city was again named uh, by Congressman Rushenthaler, and I just wanted to convey that I spoke to my chief just now, Chief Carmen Best, about a portrayal of comment of my colleague. She has tried to convince her that her comments were taken completely out of context. They were not in the area at all. I know colleagues want to Fox News. Do not. I want to point out that something is completely false. And it's like those that local business owners approach are people who demanded my protection payment have been completely debunked directly by business owners who have instead said that local businesses are wrapping up much more than sales that are being harvested by coronavirus. Fox News has admitted photoshopping images showing of a burn that weren't even in Seattle. It is effective to keep bringing this up and a distraction from the real work in is my district, and I welcome anyone who wants to see what's actually happening to come and visit me. I will happily take you around. In the meantime, let's stay focused. Congresswoman Escobar has clearly outlined for us on the real task ahead of us, the bringing about of real, meaningful justice, the justice the policing before us, done. not something that's a half measure, not something less than what but something that brings about justice for all of those who are defending it for their families. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman is back. Is the gentleman from California recognized? I just tried to the last one. Gentlemen, ladies. Committee has concerned about this. Never be considered the old this bill in Congress. It is absolutely necessary that all of the in this bill adopted, not just the Senate. Uh, heartbreaking if to have ordered by and really heartbreaking to listen to Mr. Jeffries, who saw the video to his attention. This cannot continue in America. Having said that, I do believe. Amendment. Obviously, this is a we have amendment. The amendment by Strong has merit. We do that. That is a problem. For instance, I do have a concern, however, I have laid to Mr. Armstrong about the lack of notice uh, in to explain why I'm not able to support the amendment at this moment. As mentioned, Mr. Chairman, 
we can work your arms strong between them and the floor to get a clarity about than was but it is not function. I thank you and I will go back. The yields said before our intention the question now on the amendment by the from North Dakota. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Please have it. No. Clerk will. Mr. Mr. Ms. Ms. No. 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 Jackson Lee. No. Owen. Georgia. Georgia. Of Georgia. Mr. Snow. Ms. Bass. Ms. Snow. Mr. Rich. No. Freeze. No. No. Selene vote. Well. Mr. No. Who votes no? Mr. Raskin? Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. No. Ms. Garcia? Ms. Garcia votes Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose votes no. I've at this moment, but I'm looking forward to the motion on including possibly this legislation. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McBath votes no. Ms. McBath, I would like to discuss possibility together on getting this through but I don't know. Votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes Mr. Brenner? Abbott? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Mert? Aye. Mert votes Mr. Collins? Aye. Mr. Buck? Roby? Mr. Roby, no. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reshen votes aye. Aye. Mr. Strong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. I also vote, but after we've discussed the biggest problem in the fact that the unredacted were given to the yeah, I'd committee. I'll like take to make a H with as well. That, um, Mr. Cohen. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Chairman, how is that recorded? Recorded. All well votes no. Has everyone who vote, wishes to vote voted? Wait one minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Demings, if you would turn on your video. Vote no. Okay. Ms. No.
Report. Mr. Gomert, how did you vote? Yeah, I voted yes, and I'd like to make a speech, Mr. Gomert. Women votes yes. Stop. Thirteen I twenty five no. The amendment agreed to. The committee will now recess.
committee will be in, re in uh, will reconvene. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Reschenthaler. Add at the end of the bill the following and conform the table of contents accordingly. Mr. Chairman, I reserve an instruction to the amendment. The gentlelady reserves. General is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, over the past few weeks, we have seen thousands of Americans exercise their right to peacefully protest. And I applaud these individuals for spurring the important debate we're having today about police conduct. However, we're also seeing rioting, looting, and violence. This destructive and frankly despicable behavior led to the murder and the maiming of law enforcement officers, including David Patrick Underwood and David Dorn. What? And, these destruction, and the destruction of cities and the destruction of minority-owned businesses. Rioting and violence is not protected by the First Amendment. Those participating in such reprehensible actions should face the full force and extent of the law. One such group inciting violence in our communities is that of leftist extremist political movement, Antifa. Antifa has engaged in violent and threatening acts against American huh? citizens, law enforcement yeah, officers, elected officials, yeah. and even our military service members. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to share just a few incidences of their violence yeah. and their threatening behavior. Mm -hmm. On 20 January 2017, that was the day after President Trump's inauguration, six police officers were injured and over 200 violent left-wing protesters were arrested on vandalism and assault charges. Protesters smashed storefront windows, they smashed bus stops, they hammered out windows of cars, and they launched rocks at the police. On November 8, 2018, Antifa activists threatened and vandalized Fox News commentator Tucker Carlson's residence. And I might add, they did this while Tucker Carlson's wife was in that house. On 10 January 2019, a leader of Antifa from Washington, D.C. was arrested and charged in connection with assaulting two U.S. service members in Philadelphia. On 31 May 2020, Three individuals associated with Antifa were arrested and accused of inciting riots and looting at a Target in Austin, Texas. There are additional examples, and there's additional accounts. I've included some of them in the actual text of my amendment, but for sake of brevity, I'll leave it with that. I think everybody here gets the idea. There can be no mistaking that Antifa is involved in the recent violence that we have seen following the murder of George Floyd. Attorney General uh, Bill Barr has even noted that the DOG has, and I quote, evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups, as well as actors of a variety of different political persuasions, have been involved in instigating and participating in violent activity, end quote. We cannot let groups who spew hatred who engage in violence and intimidation. We cannot let these groups control our communities through fear and undermine an important national dialogue. My amendment would require the FBI to study Antifa's tactics and operations, as well as whether Antifa should be labeled a domestic terrorist organization. This would also require, my amendment would also require a report to be provided to Congress on Antifa's terrorist activities. Mr. Chairman, I think this is just common sense. Frankly, I think this is just being pro-American. If you support peaceful protesters, and if you want to ensure violence does not drown out their voices, then you should vote for my amendment. If you support small business owners, those small business owners whose lives and livelihoods have been destroyed 
by looters, then you should vote for my amendment. In his remarks, my colleague, Mr. Cohen, my colleague from the great American city of Memphis, Tennessee, my colleague said, quote, we're all against the riots. Well, if you believe that violence, rioting, and looting is wrong, then you should vote for my amendment. If you believe that violence, rioting, and looting does not reflect the values of America, then you should vote for my amendment. I truly hope that we can all come together to protect our communities and speak with one voice against hatred and violence. Thank you, Chairman. I yield the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. Uh, the amendment is errant nonsense. According to the most recent reports, there have been no arrests whatsoever in the United point, States. Point of order, Mr. With, Chairman. Is it appropriate the, for the chair of this committee to be calling amendments nonsense? Yes. The, uh, um, I beg to differ with the gentleman. <laughs> the gentleman is not recognized. The, as I said, the amendment is errant nonsense. According to the most recent reports, there has been not one arrest in the United States of anyone from Antifa uh, or of Antifa with respect to any crime or any accusation whatsoever. The amendment, therefore, is beating a nonsensical uh, dead horse. Uh, I yield the balance of my time to the gentlelady from Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I reserve, uh, uh, excuse me, I withdraw the objection uh, and thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for his interest. Just remind him that we are here to discuss the police accountability bill uh, that deals with the transformational uh, effort and reimagining of the nation's police departments. Uh, we empathize and sympathize with our officers, uh, many uh, who work every day to protect us, and we thank them. No one in this committee has ever taken to charge any officer uh, of goodwill and good work of not doing their job. So we stand with Americans on believing in law and order. But we also believe in truth. And I cannot understand how this relates to the eloquent plea of the Floyd family asking for justice. Tears in their eyes. I don't see how this comports with the eight minutes and 46 seconds when an officer of the law sworn to protect and serve, officer of the law sworn to intervene, allowed a man to die on the streets of America. This particular amendment does not have any relation to that. And then, as my chairman has indicated, this is fact-finding, then we need to find the facts. Uh, this needs to be thoroughly studied. The facts need to also tell us what role Boogaloo has been playing in the divisive and vicious acts against law enforcement. We understand that an arrest was made of someone affiliated with Boogaloo that is alleged to have killed a sheriff and the law enforcement officer on the front steps of in Oakland, California. I don't hear any amendments on that issue. That means that this amendment fails because of its incompleteness, but also because the issue we are addressing is trying to assume that the American people are with us today. They are with us today because they too want a nation of laws and democracy. My good friend from Maryland indicated what we were founded on, and that is the numerous Bill of Rights that gives to the civilian population its right to oversee the government. Today, that is what we are attempting to do, is provide legislation that gives justice to all of those names that we have accounted for over and over again. Laquan in uh, Chicago, who was shot almost 20 times in the back, or the young man in Atlanta who could have gotten a cup of coffee, Mr. Brooks, and been home with his daughter on Saturday for her birthday party and not seen the pain of their family, or those who watched Tamir Rice and the officers said, I didn't know he was 12 years old. When I went to the street in Ferguson where Michael Brown was killed to see how narrow the street was, how much de-escalation, which is in this bill, of the officer's behavior would have saved his life. So 
Uh, I think there is an unreadiness with this legislation or this amendment. Uh, it certainly is incomplete. It certainly has uh, inaccuracies. It certainly doesn't count for right-wing extremist groups that have been killing individuals uh, who happen to be people of color and are threatening and attacking them, such as the perpetrator who killed uh, the, uh, those at Mother Emanuel. So I believe uh, that the amendment is not one that I could support because it may be germane, but it is not relevant to transforming police. Uh, it is incomplete. It is biased. It directs us against a group without looking fairly and squarely at those who lift violence, uh, raise up guns, and kill not only officers, but people of color. That, I think, does not answer the cry from the Floyd family and all the others who have suffered, who are crying out for justice. Those families who've lost their loved one, they want justice, they want 7120, they want it now. And, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back for our purposes. The gentleman from Florida seek recognition. Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was listening carefully to the gentlelady from Texas suggest that the amendment was incomplete because it focuses on violent left-wing extremists, and she would like it uh, to focus on right-wing extremists as well. And I would suggest perhaps a conforming amendment. I'm relatively certain that the gentleman from Pennsylvania well would be willing to accept the suggestions of the gentlelady. And so. Uh, I would yield to the gentlelady if, if we were to satisfy your concerns about completeness so that we could really get to the root of the issue about left-wing and right-wing extremist groups that would use these protests to cause harm and chaos. Would the gentlelady join us in that? I, I thank the gentleman, um, if you're yielding, I've, I'll be very brief. I thank the gentleman uh, from Florida for his graciousness. Uh, I believe uh, this amendment requires far more study and review and a friendly amendment without discerning whether or not the amendment on its face is accurate, I think would be premature. But I look forward to working with you um, on this question. As you may know, I'm on Homeland Security. These issues are extremely important to me. I think at this moment, this is not an amendment that is uh, fully vetted, uh, and I would uh, not be able to support it, even if it was amended. And I thank you for your gracious offer. But to thank the gentlelady, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're able to work on that together in all sincerity. Um, but, but I would probably push back against the characterization that this is unrelated. I've listened carefully, as my Democrat colleagues have said, that if we, if we move money away from police to homelessness or other issues, that we can get to the root of some of the violence and some of the concern that, that creates chaos on our streets. And I would suggest that when we look at what's happening in the CHAZ in Seattle, we certainly see this Antifa group cheerleading that effort. And uh, I heard the gentlelady from Washington say earlier that we were mischaracterizing that, that, that this is really a, a place where there are community gardens. And so I went and looked up the community gardens in the CHAZ, and they're racially segregated, some of them. They're the white gardens, and they're the black gardens. And you know, I, I was raised and studied in law school that separate was inherently unequal. Um, I also have reporting specifically from this area where Antifa is cheering on violence. Uh, this is reporting from KIRO Channel 7 News, where an auto shop called Car Tender that was uh, in this particular area got no response to dozens of 911 calls. And this is what Mr. Mason said, the owner of that, that uh, auto shop. He said, nobody showed up when literally our lives were on the line. I think the mayor and governor need to get their act together because this is beyond a protest. And we also heard the gentlelady from Washington say, well, Chief of Police Carmen Best, her comments were taken out of context. I can only take her at her actual words when she said rapes, robberies, and all sort of violent acts have been occurring in the area and we're not able to get to them. So gosh, it, it doesn't really seem like that would be taken out of context. And then uh, there's a reporting from PJ Media uh, this is the title. It says, Chaz Reparations. Speaker tells white people to pony up cash for black people. And I watched this video, and it was, it was a demand within this Chaz zone that everyone who was white give someone who was black $10. Um, I've never really seen that happen at a community garden in, in my district. Uh, there's also a report from the Daily Caller. I've been scared every day. Seattle resident speaks out about life behind the border in Chaz, and there, um, there's a discussion about the lack of sleep, the screaming, the gunshots, um, and the terror that's in the community. So 
again, I, you know, I'm just from North Florida. In our community gardens, we don't really have a lot of gunshots or racial segregation or demands for racially based payments. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that just as we've all come together, I think, to condemn violence against people uh, who should not die in encounters with the police, just as we've all come together to condemn riots, I would certainly think we could come together and say what we see happening in Seattle is not something that we want to see visited uh, on the streets in our districts, in our communities, with the people that we care for. Would the, would the gentleman yield for a question? Uh, I have, sure. We, we heard just today that two people in this group, Boogaloo, have been arrested for killing two law enforcement officers. One, Mr. Underwood, whose sister was brought up here to try to make it look like it was the rioters. Wouldn't you agree that that should be the major group we should look at right now? A group of people that want to incite a civil war and kill two police people because they are police I, people? I would suggest that we don't have to make that choice, uh, Mr. Cohen. I would suggest that uh, I was persuaded by some of those very comments from Congresswoman Jackson Lee, but I hope you're equally persuaded that what we see going on in Seattle is not the behavior that we should tolerate in a great nation, and I would yield to Mr. Johnson. With four seconds, I have a CNN article that says Boogaloo, Bugaloo, whatever they call themselves, is not a white supremacist group. They have mixed ideologies, and they, they identify with all sorts of stuff. Anarchy is their, is their unifying... Gentlemen's I'll time has expired. Go back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Deming, seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. I also want to thank... Um, Chairwoman Bass for her leadership as well. I extend my condolences to my colleagues who have lost their loved ones. Um, I rise in opposition to this amendment. It's been quite interesting listening to my colleagues talk about looting and rioting, right wing and left wing extremists and law enforcement. Mr. Chairman, I would ask if my colleagues really know it all who law enforcement is, what it means, and what law enforcement takes an oath to do, who the good men and women who do the job well, who they really are. Do you really understand that law enforcement officers are held to a higher standard as they should be, as I was when I was among the ranks? When we know better, we are supposed to do better. I served as a career law enforcement officer. I loved the job because I went to work every day trying to make a difference. But I tell you today, I love the job, but I do not love bad cops. And I say to my colleagues, we have an opportunity right now, here today, to take our rightful place in history and pass this law that will hold bad cops accountable. Now, I ask you today, who among us would not want to do that? I heard one of my colleagues say earlier that this is hard. No, it's not. We need to stop saying that doing the right thing is hard to do. It's not hard. Not if we have the political will and the courage to take our place in history and right the wrongs in our system of justice. Mr. Floyd's murder was brutal and senseless, and I pray to God that every person in our nation, every member of Congress, every law enforcement officer who's committed to doing the job right, and persons around the world believe that and that everybody joins us in holding them accountable. Now, who among us would not want to prevent something like that from happening again? I've also heard a lot of discussion today about all lives matter versus black lives matter. Let's don't play with this. It is just too extremely important. As I thought about that phrase, all lives matter and black lives matter, I think the founder of Black Lives Matter, the movement, said it best when she said, all lives will matter when black lives matter. All lives cannot matter until black lives 
matter. So I plead, I beg, I appeal to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Let's get this right. Every good law enforcement officer needs us to do that. The families who have suffered at the hands of bad law enforcement officers need us to do that. And quite frankly, our future needs us to do that. So I stand in opposition to this amendment. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back for what purpose, for what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to support the gentleman's amendment, um, the chairman said after Mr. Rischenthaler presented his amendment that it was, quote, nonsense and that no Antifa, no one from Antifa had been charged or arrested. That's just not true. If you, and, and all you got to do is look at his amendment. He gives countless examples. On November 17, 2018, an Antifa member was arrested after attacking conservative, conservative demonstrators in Portland, Oregon. January 10th, 2019, the leader of Antifa from Washington, D.C. was arrested and charged in connection with assaulting two United States service members in Philadelphia. June 29th, multiple Antifa activists targeted and assaulted conservative journalist Andy Ngu in Portland, Oregon. Following the event, CNN reporter Jake Tapper stated, Antifa regularly attacks journalists. It's reprehensible. And all, and it, we could go on, all the amendment says is let's figure this out. Let's study this, let's find out about it, and let's get that information back to the Judiciary Committee of the United States House of Representatives. And as my good friend from Florida said, if there are other organizations we need to do this for as well, let's do it. Once again, the, the, just like our First Amendment, this makes so much sense, and yet the majority is going to vote against it. So I, I support the gentleman's amendment. It is clear. It is, gives the examples. It directly contradicts what the chairman said that no Antifa member has been arrested or charged. It, it, there's all kinds of examples of that. And with that, I would yield the re remainder of my time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I thank the ranking member. You know, I've heard my colleagues across the aisle say this amendment is nonsense, that it's irrelevant, that there's no proof. And just as the ranking member was just saying, there's ample proof. The Attorney General himself, and I read the quote originally, he said that there's evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups as well as actors of a variety of political persuasions have been involved in instigating and participating in violent activity. That's our attorney general. And in my amendment, you'll find multiple examples. On 10 January 2019, a leader of Antifa, Antifa from Washington, D.C. was arrested in connection with assaulting two U.S. service members in my home state of Philadelphia. Would my colleagues across the aisle say that that's nonsense? Would they say that's irrelevant? Would they say that there's now no proof? On 29, on, uh, 29 June 2019, a journalist, Andy No, who was reporting in Portland, Oregon, he was assaulted, he was targeted by Antifa. Jake Tapper himself said, quote, Antifa regularly attacks journalists. It's reprehensible, end quote. So for the journalist Andy No. Is this nonsense? Is this irrelevant? Is that not proof? On 13 July 2019, an armed Antifa supporter attacked and heard, hurled incendiary, incendiary devices at an ICE facility in Tacoma, Washington. Is that nonsense? Is that irrelevant? Is that not proof? There's ample proof, Mr. Chairman. And I would encourage my colleagues from the from across the aisle to vote for this amendment. We're just trying to get a report to Congress so we can get more information. Why block this? This is simply an attempt to get facts to Congress so we can deal with what I believe is domestic terrorist organization that has already attacked law enforcement, has attacked US service members, and has attacked journalists. Will, will with the gentleman that, yield? I, uh, no, I yield to ranking member, my colleague from Ohio. I thank the gentleman again for his amendment for uh, for his statements. And lest uh, the majority say that, well, the examples given by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, examples that I gave, were prior to the most recent riots associated with the tragedy that took place in Minneapolis just last week. Just last week, three Antifa members arrested in Austin, Texas, uh, Texas for rioting and looting. So there's a pattern here, clear pattern. And we want to look at it, and we want to report 
back to Congress. And as the, again, as the gentleman from Florida said, if you want to add some other, we're, we're fine with that. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get the information for the House Judiciary Committee. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the uh, uh, gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to extend my heartfelt condolences to my colleagues, uh, Mr. Uh, Sensenbrenner and Mr. Barr, on the loss of their dear wives. I have my deepest condolences. And I also want to extend my de deepest condolences to the wife of Rayshard Brooks, who lost her husband this week. I hope that you won't feel offended that I mentioned Rayshard Brooks' wife. As I mentioned, our colleagues uh, here in uh, Congress, we're all equal. Uh, his wife and his three little baby daughters and his 13-year-old stepson will miss him. Uh, he was taken away from us on Friday night. You know, he had committed the offense of being caught in a car in a drive through line asleep behind the wheel. I don't know what kind of a day he had, but the police thought he was drinking. So they called the police in. They called uh, the, the police who arrived at the scene uh, and tapped on his window and woke him up and told him to go park in the parking space and, and sleep it off. And then he thought to himself as he was walking back to the car, what am I gonna do with this guy? And so he made the decision, I'm gonna call in the uh, DUI task force. And so the DUI task force arrived about 10 minutes later, and over the next 30 minutes, they administered one field sobriety test after another. And guess what? Rashad Brooks passed each and every one of them. The stupid heel toe test, nobody walks putting one heel in front of the other. People lose their balance all the time who are not under the influence of anything because they have balance issues. Not Mr. Rashad Brooks, no balance issues. Perfectly did that, did the nystigmas test, uh, did uh, all of the other things that the officer wanted to do. Turn around, shake your booty uh, with your eyes closed, all kinds of crazy tests that they administered over the next 30 minutes, wearing on Mr. Brooks's patience just messing with him out there on Friday night. And finally, the officer pulled out his inherently unreliable uh, uh, field uh, breath test and told him to blow into it, and he blew into it. He had done everything else they told him to do. He blew into it, and he blew a .10, just a little bit over the limit. And so, boom, they decided to do what they wanted to do at the very beginning, which is arrest this black man and uh, he resisted and ran away and got shot in the back twice. And this is what we are here to talk about today. This is not about Antifa. There is no such thing as Antifa other than those who oppose right-wing, white power militias, nationalist groups. People who oppose them in the streets are called Antifa. This is nothing more than a figment of Donald Trump's imagination and those of his willing and complicit followers. Um, so we're not here to talk about uh, Antifa. We're not here to talk about violence, rioting, and looting. We're not here to talk about defunding the police. We're not here to talk about Chaz in <coughs> Seattle. We're not here to talk about abortion. We're not here to talk about the impeachment hoax. We're not even here, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about Benghazi or Hillary Clinton's emails. We're going to hear that before the day is over. We're here to talk, talk about the George Floyd legislation that we, Justice and Policing Act, that we are considering here today. That's what we're here to talk about. And uh, my friends, uh, Mr. Brooks needed a guardian the other night. He did not need a warrior. Instead, warriors showed up, <coughs> took him down, took him out. And it's time out for warrior training and time out for warrior duty by cops who will use unnecessary and deadly force with a trigger finger 
with a trigger mentality roaming the streets of our cities, towns, and villages in this country is time out for that. This is what the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act gets at, these common sense measures. And so I'd ask that we stop the nonsense and get down to the business at hand, and that is to pass this legislation through this committee. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the uh, uh, gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? I uh, strike last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, I, I don't often agree with my colleague, the other Johnson, Mr. Johnson from Georgia, but I want to acknowledge two things that he said were absolutely right. First of all, of course, uh, the widow and children of Richard Brooks deserve our prayers and sympathy like everybody else. Um, that aside, you're also right to call it an impeachment hoax, but I'll move on. Listen, uh, I, I just wanted to clarify what I was saying earlier. There's a lot of talk about these groups. I think uh, Mr. Gates, Mr. Reschenthaler, I think they're making a great point that sure, we should expand it. And I, I think uh, Ms. Jackson Lee made a good point as well. But on this Boogaloo movement, um, th this is an article, a lengthy article from CNN breaking down who these, who these people are. And I just want to take a, a moment here to read you these excerpts so that we're all clear about who this group is. The Boogaloos are an emerging, quoting from the article, are an emerging incarnation of extremism that seems to defy easy categorization. They are yet another confounding factor in the ongoing effort among local, state, and federal officials to puzzle out the political sympathies of the agitators showing up to the mostly peaceful George Floyd rallies who have destroyed property, looted businesses, or in the case of the Boogaloos who descended in, on Minneapolis, walked around the streets with assault rifles. Boogaloo members appear to hold conflicting ideological views, with some identifying as anarchist and others rejecting formal titles. Benjamin Teeter is apparently one of the leaders of the group. He does an interview with CNN here, and he said he identifies as an anarchist. His mission in Minneapolis, he said, was, quote, to protect protesters from police and white supremacists whom he deplores. And it, it goes on and says, uh, far from a cohesive group, uh, this is quoting uh, J.J. McNabb, who's a fellow at George Washington University who studies anti-government extremism. He says, quote, while there are pockets of white supremacist boogaloos, apparently, the younger and bigger groups are generally not. While there are boogaloos who support police, the younger and bigger groups detest them. While there are boogaloos that want to discredit protest, angry at the murder of a black man, there are younger boogaloos that are incensed by the murder and want to join the protest. They share jargon outfits of love of firearms and a desire to use violence to gain power, but they don't actually share a common goal once power is achieved, uh, the professor said. Last thing I'll quote to you, again, to this gentleman, Mr. Teeter, not a gentleman, not, he's an anarchist, he's a troublemaker, but he's a, one of the leaders of this group. He also recently attended protests decrying the COVID-19 lockdown. It, just to get a sense of how profoundly scrambled the Boogaloo ideology can be, he said, quote, I'm a member of the LGBT community, and he describes himself as a non-voting left anarchist. He said, people think I'm of a Nazi group, and I'm not. Look, I'm just saying, this is very complicated and very complex, and there are a lot of troublemaker groups out there. This is just the latest that sprung up. We, Mr. We Johnson, will you all. yield? I'll yield, sure. Thank you. I just want to say, I know that speaking about racial injustice and the brutal killing of George Floyd is hard. It's hard to talk about. It's hard to watch. It's even harder to experience. And so I just ask you to think about the families who, who represent those who have been victims of police violence, who are watching this hearing. And they're hearing an effort. I, reclaim the first, my time, Ms. Cicilline. Reclaim. My point? No, I, no, listen. You I know what your point I, is. You don't like what I'm saying because you don't want to hear no, the rest of the point. No, I don't you like it. You talked about Robert Mueller, Antifa, Michael reclaim Flynn. Reclaim my time. It's time. Ms. Cicilline. I don't like your point because you're politicizing this and we're not. This is a reasonable amendment that is tied directly in, into this yeah. uh, bill and it is germane and it's something we all ought to be concerned about. And, and <laughs> I mean, we, we're saying everybody equally, all the troublemaker groups, why would you have a problem with that? And I take offense and so do all of my colleagues when you pretend like we don't empathize with, care about, sympathize with these losses because we do and we're on record saying it and stop saying it otherwise and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Pennsylvania seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, too, want to add my sympathies uh, and prayers uh, to the families uh, of Mr. Sensenbrenner on the passing of his wife and Mr. Barr on the passing of his. 
and for Rep. Il Ilhan Omar on the passing of her father from COVID, uh, and so many others who are suffering during this time in our country's history. You know, we're considering this bill today because the world watched George Floyd slowly murdered by a police officer. Eight minutes and 46 seconds with a deranged knee to the neck as the man cried out, I can't breathe, and cried for his dead mama. That's what we're here today about. And so I rise and raise my voice in opposition to this amendment, which is not about that. Our streets are filled with urgent calls for, from our fellow citizens. Tens of thousands have filled the streets because of what happened to George Floyd. His death gave birth to a civil rights movement, rebirth to a civil rights movement. What happened to George Floyd, sadly, is not an aberration. It is a shameful norm. Sherilyn Eiffel last week told us this is a civil rights moment. Let's treat it as such with that seriousness. So right now, there's no national government registry of police misbehavior involving shootings. Since the uprising in Ferguson, Missouri, the Washington Post has endeavored to catalog every fatal shooting by an on-duty police officer. Since 2015, they've found 5,000 such shootings, over 100 of them in my own state of Pennsylvania. And what they found is that African Americans are three times more likely to die as a result. This demands our action. The demands are, could not be any louder. The death toll rises literally every day. Just this weekend, as Mr. Johnson just pointed out, we witnessed the murder of Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, another young black man, 27 years old, a father, 27 years old, like my youngest son, Alex. This black man was shot for falling asleep in a drive through line. Should not have been a death sentence, falling asleep at the wheel as you're stopped in a drive through In a functioning society, that encounter would have resulted in Mr. Brooks driven or escorted home. Instead, he's dead. I am the mother of three white sons. Every mother worries for the safety of her sons. But I do not worry in the same way that African-American moms worry. I don't have to have that talk. One of my sons spent a little bit of time in high school on the edge of trouble, if not in the center of trouble, being pulled over by cops. But he didn't wind up dead. When we say black lives matter, what we are saying is that black people deserve the same room to live life that white people are afforded. It's not a competition. It's a call to live up to that sacred ideal that is our country's founding. In the past two weeks, we've seen a democratic proposal to deal with police systematic racism. That's what we're here to talk about. I don't think my colleagues on the other side are going far enough. I don't think they want to address the root cause of the issue of racism in our criminal justice system. Because if they did, they would want to ban chokeholds. They'd want to mandate dashboard cameras, body cameras, establish a police misconduct registry, reform qualified immunity, ban no-knock warrants, require that deadly force be used only, and I mean only, as a last resort, not in a drive-through line at Wendy's. This proposal is reasonable, it is necessary, it is long overdue. I remind my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, as Sherilyn Eiffel told us, as Mr. Philanese Floyd told us, we are at a civil rights moment What's not helpful, not worthy of this moment is talk of defunding the police. That's nowhere in this proposal. Don't be confused. Not worthy of this moment is to bring up abortion. That's not the topic of this markup. Perhaps you walked into the wrong markup. Not worthy of this moment is Michael Flynn, Donald Trump, hoax this, hoax that. We can do that perhaps next week. Today it is about black lives mattering. It is about racism, it is about equality, it is about reforming our policing. Our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, when they raise these ruses, these straw men, show a lack of seriousness about the murder of George Floyd and what it represents. I will be voting no. The world is watching. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For our purposes, Mr. Big, seek your recognition. Move to strike the last word.
Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm struck here because I, I think this amendment is, is related. I think it's, I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. I think it's relevant to the underlying uh, purpose of this bill. I, I, I listened to my friend from Texas, uh, Representative Lee Jackson Lee, uh, talk about well maybe we should expand this. This is it's not complete. And a suggestion was made by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, that maybe we expand it. And then I actually was kind of surprised to hear this one from, from the gentleman from Georgia, uh, uh, Mr. Hank Johnson, uh, say that uh, there's no such thing as Antifa. So I thought, well, you know, I, maybe he's right, and maybe I've just missed this. And, uh, and so I said, well, where would I go? Well, I'm not going to go to Fox because Fox has be actually been uh, castigated multiple times here in this hearing today. So I'm going to go to... Uh, uh, a source that I think that everyone can agree um, w should be an expert on this, and that would be the CNN site. So I said, well, what, what do they say? And they said Antifa is short for anti-fascist. The term is used to define a broad group of people whose political beliefs lean toward the left, often the far left, but do not conform with the Democratic Party platform. So I said, how did, how did the group start? The exact origins of the group are unknown, but Antifa can be traced to Nazi Germany. I was stunned when I read that. And anti-fascist action, a militant group founded in the 1980s in the UK. Modern day Antifa members have become more active in making themselves known at public rallies and within the progressive movement, said Brian Levin, director of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University, San Bernardino. Quote, what they're trying to do now is not only become prominent through violence at these high profile rallies, but also to reach out through small meetings and through social networking to cultivate disenfranchised progressives who heretofore were peaceful, Levin, close quote, Levin said. And so when I look in on page four of the amendment proposed by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, and Attorney General William Barr is quoted, um, and uh, that, that quote, if you want to see that, you can go to uh, ABC News from, from the same day where he says, Evidence uh, that he has found, DOJ has found evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups, as well as actors of a variety of different political persuasions, have been involved in instigating and participating in the violent activity, close quote, that we have seen. This is, this is why this, is, this amendment becomes important, because we are trying to get at the root of good policing. We're trying to get at the uh, root of uh, reestablishing peace and safety for all Americans. And uh, it goes on, this ABC News article goes on to say that they have found, and, and you're correct, you're correct. It isn't just Antifa that's been violent. They say that there's been a whole, and the, the quote I think they said is, witches brew of a lot of different extremist organizations, close quote. So if, if we really want to get at that, maybe we, Maybe we could uh, expand this. Maybe we could all come to some kind of consensus on this amendment and include this in the bill. And that's, that's all I think that that's would be reasonable here. And so with that, I'm going to yield the balance of my time to uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler. I thank my colleague from Arizona. You know, I'm truly troubled by the fact that my colleagues across the aisle want to treat Antifa with kid gloves. The fact that the victims of Antifa have been minimized as... Uh, quote unquote, right wing nationalists. The fact that Antifa has been described by my colleagues as a quote unquote, figment of the president's imagination. Maybe the FBI is a figment of the president's imagination because I can read you what the FBI has said. The director of the FBI on 4 June 2020, this is Director Ray, he provided remarks about recent protests across America where he noted, and I quote, the FBI have quite a number of ongoing investigations of violent anarchist extremists, including those motivated by Antifa or Antifa-like ideology, end quote. In fact, since June of this year, the Department of Justice has filed charges against over 75 individuals allegedly involved with recent riots, including targeting law enforcement officers, setting police vehicles on fire in the third precinct of Minneapolis, Minnesota was Would the destroyed. gentleman yield for just a quick uh, question? No, no, I, I reclaim my time. So before we minimize the victims of Antifa by calling them right-wing nationalists, I ask, are law enforcement officers right-wing extremists? And before we try to dismiss a terrorist organization, a domestic terrorist organization, as a quote-unquote figment 
of the president's imagination? Can we not look at the crimes that have been committed? Can we not account for how these victims have been terrorized by Antifa? Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, let me just start by saying I am absolutely sitting here offended and angry as hell. And I want to explain to my, what we always say is how we refer to each other, my good friends on the other side. By the time I'm finished, you will be clear that we are not good friends. As a black male who went to the fifth best public high school in the country, who was a victim of excessive force, who has a black son, who has worries that you all don't. And to my colleagues, especially the ones that keep introducing amendments that are a tangent and a distraction from what we're talking about, you all are white males, you never lived in my shoes, and you do not know what it's like to be an African-American male. And all I'm saying is, if you are opposed to this legislation, let's just have the vote. But please do not come in this committee room and make a mockery of the pain that exists in my community. And it reminds me of the argument about the 1964 Voting uh, Civil Rights Act or the 65 Voting Rights Act, where 126 people voted against a Civil Rights Act, 85 people against a Voting Rights Act, because they had all these side issues Either man up and say you don't believe in it, or let's talk about the real issue. And yes, we're not interested in watered down version of this bill. I'm not interested in equality with all deliberate speed. This is a crisis. People are losing their lives. So if we have other things that we want to fix, then fix them in another bill, fix them at another time. But people are dying as we talk. So I am not interested in moving at a snail's pace. I am not interested in a watered-down bill that mandates nothing. I'm not interested in studying Antifa. I'm not even interested in studying the Klan or sovereign citizens right now. Because that is not the imminent threat that black men face on a daily basis. And right now, too often, it is law enforcement, those who were sworn to protect and to serve. And so all we're asking today is to deal with that. I don't mind dealing with other pieces of legislation. I don't mind dealing with other issues that you all may have. And, and what I don't want to leave this conversation with and why I'm speaking now instead of later it's because I don't want you all to leave here saying, well, we didn't know. We didn't know that's how you felt, Cedric. I want it to be crystal clear, and I will give you the benefit of the doubt that it is an unconscious bias that I'm hearing, because at worst, it's conscious bias, and that I would hate to assume from any of the people on the other side. Will the gentleman yield? Sure. I appreciate your passion. Are you suggesting that you're certain that none of us have non-white children? Because you, you reflected on your black son and you said none of us could understand. Matt, Matt, stop. I'm not about to get sidetracked about the color of our children. We're talking no, about black kids. I reclaimed my time. You said that. You I reclaimed my time. I but know. You want the discussion? I know that the gentleman, you want a bill? gentleman reclaimed his time. I said I claim, reclaimed my time. I already know that there are people on the other side that have uh, black grandchildren. It is not about the color of your kids. It is about black males, black people in the streets How do that are getting killed. And if one of them happens to be your kid, I'm concerned about him too. And clearly I'm more concerned about him than you are. So, so let's be clear you're, about you're that. Claiming, so you're claiming you're I more am, concerned for my family than I do? Who in the hell the do you think you are? Gentlemen, if the, the shoe gen fits. Listen, you don't know how much we care about will our families. Suspend, kick this dog is outrageous. Holler. You should take those words down. The I know you care will about your family and love your family. The gentleman week, will suspend. It. The gentleman will suspend. The time belongs to the gentleman from Louisiana. Cedric, would you yield? Was, you was that a nerve? Yeah, uh, you damn right it was a nerve. I yield to the gentleman from Louisiana. I say this. Honestly, I appreciate you yielding. 
you are my good friend, and we hail from the same state, and I respect you, and I love you. And I, I say this honestly. If all that you said is true, and I believe it is, then why didn't the Democrats allow us to assist with this? Why draft a bill in the dark of night in a back room somewhere and then present it to us whole cloth? If you really wanted us to work together, and we want to, why not give us that opportunity? Do you have an answer for that? You know, I do have an answer for that. Because you all were in charge for a while. We've been in charge for a while. I have been singing this same song since 1991. People on the streets right now are demanding action right now. We saw what was just presented in the Senate. It was a watered down bill. And right now, this is a national crisis. And we don't want to move with all deliberate speed. So those ideas that are good, we are willing to meet and to talk about. And the author of the bill, Ms. Bass, Congresswoman Bass has indicated willingness to continue to work as we go forward. But as of right now, this is a critical emergency for people in this country. And I just think that we should not debate everything from Flynn to all this other stuff. We know what we're talking about. The in time here. Of the Let's vote it up or down. The time of the gentleman has expired. What purpose does Ms. Lesko seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. General ladies recognized. Uh, I think that we all need to take a deep breath. All of us, Republicans and Democrats, care about the recent issues that have happened. And I, I do support, as I've said before, parts of this legislation. And I do respect Congresswoman Bass. And I know she works hard and means well. But there's other parts I don't. And it's because law enforcement has said it would undermine their job. Um, and with that, I yield my balance of my time to Mr. Rushenthaler. I thank my colleague from Arizona. Look, I think we're being presented a false choice here. We have a lot that we can agree on. Transparency, training, terminating bad actors. We, we pretty much all agree that we should have body cams. We can agree to a certain limit, limiting of chokeholds. We can agree, like I said, to more transparency. So why not take a look and have a study on Antifa? We know that police in Seattle are not allowed to go in to the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And I feel that when colleagues across the aisle minimize the victims of Antifa, usually police officers, journalists, members of our military, when colleagues across the aisle minimize these victims as quote unquote right-wing nationalists, we really do, do a disservice to not just the victims, but then we turn around and we dismiss Antifa, which is a terrorist organization, a domestic terrorist organization. And when we downplay, as my colleague from Georgia did, Antifa as a figment of the imagination of our president, we really do a disservice to law and order. And again, we disrespect the victims of this domestic terrorist organization. And when my colleagues from New York and Texas say that this is nonsense, it's irrelevant, that there's no proof, again, we're minimizing the damage that Antifa has done. We're minimizing the victims that have been uh, targeted by Antifa. And these victims deserve to have Antifa looked at. And we in Congress deserve a report of what I see as a domestic ter terrorist organization. You know, ABC, in 20 June of this year, they reported that Federal Intelligence Bulletin had stated, and I quote, anarchist extremists continue to pose the most significant threat of targeted assaults against police, as well as targeted government buildings and police vehicles for damage, sometimes with improvised incendiary devices, end quote. I don't think that our police are right-wing extremists. And I don't think that an ABC report that's reporting on the FBI is a quote unquote figment of the president's imagination. In June of this year, reports indicate that some Antifa activities, that some of them seized control of a six block area in downtown Seattle. I referred to this just a moment ago as the autonomous zone. Local law enforcement has not been allowed to engage even though the business owners are suffering and there's reports that I've read earlier today of rape and assault going in the autonomous zone. So I don't think that those six city blocks in Capitol Hill, Seattle, and I've been there many times, I don't think that Seattle and those six blocks are called Capitol Hill is a bastion of right-wing nationalists. 
So again, when you call that area a right-wing uh, nationalist area, you're minimizing the victims of Antifa. And again, I don't think that the autonomous zone is a figment of Mr. Trump's imagination. I've already talked about Andy No, who's a journalist. He was targeted specifically. I don't think that Andy No is a right-wing nationalist. And I don't think when Jake Tapper said, quote, Antifa regularly attacks journalists, it's reprehensible, unquote. I don't think that's a figment of the president's imagination. So let's not minimize the victims of Antifa. Let's take them seriously as a domestic terrorist organization. And with that, I yield to someone who's truly my good friend, my colleague from Florida. I thank the gentleman for yielding. It, it is just so insincere for the gentleman from Louisiana to say, well, if you just don't like the bill, just vote no. You know what, I dare you. Go ahead and call the previous question. If you're not interested in our feedback, in our suggestions, in our, in our uh, contribution to the legislative process, any member of this committee could call the previous question. So just do it. Don't complain about it. I would also suggest that our amendments don't make a mockery of this process. We come in good faith. I said at the hearing with uh, Mr. Floyd's brother, I said at the start of this hearing, I thought Ms. Bass has put together some good ideas and we wanna work with you on them. And so to just flare your anger and to, and to pretend you know about our personal experience. The time of the gentle lady, the time of the gentle lady has expired. Down. The four purpose is a gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I thank my distinguished colleague from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond, for his powerful words. And I just ask my friends on the other side of the aisle to imagine in this moment, this historic moment when we have before us the single most transformative piece of legislation to reform policing in America, where the eyes of the nation are on this committee and families who have lost loved ones to police violence are watching. And our Republican colleagues are saying, please, can't we talk about something else? Please, we don't wanna talk about racial injustice. We don't wanna talk about police brutality. We don't wanna talk about fixing the policing in America. Instead, let's talk about Robert Mueller, and let's talk about Antifa, and let's talk about Michael Flynn, and can we talk about abortion? In fact, let's talk about anything else but the really hard issue of fixing policing in America. And so to the families who have lost loved ones, I say, do not worry, this committee will not be distracted. We will remain focused on this comprehensive bill, on the death of George Floyd, the Justice in Policing Act, which will make a difference in the lives of all Americans. Because we all understand that no matter what race you are, what ethnicity you are, we all know that growing up in a healthy and safe community that our children can thrive in is important. We also know that there are too many politicians in this country who describe people as dangerous based on nothing more than what they look like or where they come from or where they live. Stoking fears seems like a strategy for those politicians to avoid taking responsibility for the decisions they're making. But let's reject those messages of fear and division and come together, people from all racial and ethnic groups and elect people and work for reforms that will in fact make policing work for everyone in this country. And I say to my Republican colleagues, can you hear the voices of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are protesting peacefully all across America, demanding that we do something about this very serious problem and to fix policing in this country so that people don't have to worry about being treated differently because of the color of their skin, so they can have confidence that certain things like chokeholds are barred forever, that we have accreditation of police departments, that we hold police officers accountable. I was a mayor of the city of Providence. The good police officers wanted reform more than anybody because they didn't want to be painted with a broad brush when they see the killing of someone like George Floyd at the hands of a police officer with his knee on his neck snuffing his life out as he pleads for his mother. That requires us to do something. At the very least, it requires us to focus on the problem at hand and consider in a serious way the solutions put forth in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Please, I know it is not your intention, 
But let's not dishonor the lives that have been lost by refusing to talk about this issue. I know it's hard. These are uncomfortable conversations for some folks. But you know what's harder? Living these experiences that Mr. Richmond spoke about, living the experiences of all of the people that we've seen lose their lives at the hands of police. This is a moment to do something about it. The traditional effort to distract, to deflect, to, to, to focus on something else simply is not going to work this time because the American people aren't going to tolerate it. They're demanding action, and that's what we're going to do today. I urge my colleagues to reject this amendment. And uh, in an effort to really get back to the subject at hand, I ask unanimous consent that this article entitled, There's Racial Bias in Our Police Systems, Here's the Overwhelming Proof in the Washington Post from June 16, 2020, be made a part of the record. Without objection, and the gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Move the strike, last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for offering uh, his amendment. And I would note, uh, I think the uh, chair of this committee, obviously you have considerable power and uh, ability to run this committee virtually in any manner that you want to according to the rules, but I think it's completely inappropriate for you to comment on a, a member on either side although I'm guessing it's generally going to be directed on this side, and to say that his amendment is nonsense when it's clearly not. Um, I think many folks, and I would hope to think on both sides of the aisle, uh, would hate, hate groups on both the left and the right. Um, and uh, Antifa is without a doubt a domestic terrorist group. Um, I know it. Most of the people on this committee uh, know it. Uh, some will admit it. Others won't. Uh, Mr. Rensselaer knows it. He offered the amendment. The President of the United States knows it uh, because he wants to label it a domestic terrorist organization. Even Twitter, who's gotten some criticism lately, knows it uh, because they've shut down Antifa-affiliated accounts. Uh, we know that Antifa spreads hate, promotes violence, encourages rioting, uh, and, and, and in fact participates in it, even leads it. And those, the protesters obviously had every right to be uh, out in, in the streets protesting uh, what happened. Uh, the violence, much of it, uh, was Antifa uh, connected, uh, we think. What, what is less clear uh, is how Antifa is organized and how they're funded, which is critical to their operations. This amendment seeks to find answers to those important questions so that we can make sure Antifa and Antifa-related groups are stopped so that they can no longer divide this nation. Protests have arisen in cities all over America. Under our Constitution, they have every right uh, to speak out under our First Amendment uh, and peaceably, and I would emphasize peaceably, assemble. After all, what happened to George Floyd should never have happened in America or anywhere else for that matter. Unfortunately, not only uh, not all the protesters have acted peacefully. Um, windows have been broken, uh, stores have been looted, police cars, police officers themselves have been targeted in my district, uh, in Cincinnati, in my congressional district, and an officer was struck in the helmet um, by a bullet. Um, that conduct, that type of conduct, and the violence is just as unacceptable uh, as was the despicable killing of George Floyd in the first place. I, be, I believe we should investigate and bring to justice the group or individuals behind uh, these acts of violence, just as the individuals responsible uh, for the death of George Floyd must be brought to justice as well. And I would yield uh, my remaining time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I think the uh, I think the colleague, my colleague from Ohio, you know, I I guess it's the former district judge of me, or maybe the former prosecutor and defense attorney, me, but I cannot get my head around the fact that victims of crime, victims of this domestic ter terrorist organization have been minimized and dismissed as right-wing extremists and right-wing nationalists by my colleagues across the aisle. Again, this, this minimization of victims is really troubling, especially when the victims are journalists, when the victims are members of the police. And I'd be remiss as a former Naval officer if I did not, again, draw attention to the incident that took place on 10 January 2019 when a leader of Antifa from Washington, D.C. was arrested and charged. And for those across the aisle, they're asking where the proof is. I think that an arrest and charges are proof 
at least proof that this could be going on, but I digress. An individual was arrested for assaulting two United States service members from my home state of Pennsylvania, from, Pil from Philadelphia, and this took place in 2019. So when you minimize the victims as quote unquote right wing uh, nationalists, you're really calling those members of the US military right wing nationalists, which frankly is offensive. And when you say such ludicrous things that Antifa is a quote unquote figment of the president's imagination, when you say that Antifa and this amendment is nothing but nonsense, that it's, that it's irrelevant, that there's absurdly no proof, I direct you to the litany of examples. And I would put at the top of that list the assault that took place on two Yev service members in Philadelphia. And with that, I yield. Gentleman yields. The, um, the, uh, for what purpose does the general lady from California seek recognition? Uh, I move to strike the last word. General lady is recognized. Um, uh, colleagues, I, I think that we keep having this conversation on Antifa. I have absolutely no idea why, because I don't believe there is one person over here on the Democrat or the Republican side of the aisle that has anything to do with, any concern about Antifa. So when we raise the question of the relevancy, that's why we raise it, because what does it have to do with us? Uh, I think it, my uh, colleague raised that it's not connected to the Democratic Party. I think over here we're all Democrats, so I don't know what Antifa has to do with anything. And then it seems as though there's a lot of concern about left-wing organizations, and I, I do hope my colleagues acknowledge there are right-wing movements but there doesn't seem to be the same concern about that. Uh, my colleagues have also said that there was no outreach on our side of the aisle to uh, Republicans, and since I am the chief sponsor of the bill, I did want to correct that because that's just false. Uh, it might be true that the individuals that have spoken I didn't speak to, but I have spoken to many Republicans, both here in the House and in the Senate, and with your leadership, and with the White House. So there was participation. I think that after this bill passes out of the committee in the House, there'll be more discussions. But I think that's why my colleague that I sit next to is saying, why are we having all of this extraneous conversation? Either we talk about the bill and vote about the bill or move on or bring in another amendment or something. But it seems like we keep having these conversations about nothing that has to do with this bill. And with that, I'd like to ask my dear friend from Seattle if she would like to say something about her city, since her city seems to be so popular. Everybody knows about your city. I'm not sure how many people were there lately. But if you would like, I would be happy to yield time to you. I thank you, Chairwoman Bass. And I am just stunned at how much Seattle is coming up with falsehoods over and over again. If we do want to talk about Seattle, I would say that there are many things we should talk about in Seattle. We should talk about the killing of John T. Williams, a seventh generation woodcarver, who was an extremely talented artist and had difficulties and battled problems with alcohol and mental health for much of his life. He was shot by an officer driving his patrol car who saw John T. Williams walk through the crosswalk, apparently hunched over with something in his hands, and then he was shot because that was seen to be some dangerous uh, weapon. That was proven to be absolutely false. Williams was holding a scrap of wood and his single blade pocket knife that he used to carve the wood that was closed. No criminal charges were ever filed against that officer. Charlena Lyles, a pregnant woman with mental health issues who was shot dead by police officers in front of her children. Che Taylor, shot in February of 2016 by police who said they thought he was reaching for a gun. There was no gun, and he was doing everything that police asked him to do. No charges were ever filed against that officer. Three people shot dead, and those are just a few examples. At least, Congresswoman Bass, Che Taylor's life was given the kind of recognition we are trying to give here with the Justice and Policing Act when two years after his death, his brother and a number of families who were killed by police, who had members who were killed by police violence, worked to put together a de-escalate Washington initiative to the people that changed the incredibly restrictive standard of proof of malice that was required for accountability. 
and provided training for police officers to de-escalate. That initiative passed overwhelmingly across our state with the support of many major law enforcement groups. The things that keep being said today in this hearing are absolutely false. And members on the other side keep repeating them, but just because you repeat them does not make them true. I understand you want to distract from the question that is before us, which is what are we in Congress going to do about the murders of George Floyd and so many others? What are we going to do to bring real accountability and to provide the kind of justice that people across this country are fighting for? You, you can keep talking about Seattle if you want, but nothing that you have said so far is true. And the reality is that our Mayor, you, you said, Congressman Reschenthaler, you said that cops aren't even allowed in. That is just false. The chief of police has been there every single day. There is plenty happening in that area, and it is a peaceful protest zone. So please stop listening to Fox News or whoever else you're reading. It's just not true. And I would ask that if we're going to talk about Seattle, let's talk about the murders of these people, uh, many others, and our attempts to really provide justice. I thank you, Congresswoman Bass, for giving me the time. And again, I invite any of my colleagues to come and visit me in Seattle. I'm just a few miles away from the autonomous zone, and the, uh, uh, I can promise you that you can watch the, the, movies with the rest of us in the that The time show. of the uh, gentleman has expired. Uh, for what purpose does a gentleman from uh, Ohio seek recognition? Georgia, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've sat and listened to this today and, and the interesting issues of how we do legislation and how we come about it in this committee and what amendments are, and what amendments are good and what amendments are bad. I've sat for 18 months. Most of that is ranking member. And I have heard Republican amendments referred to on many occasions as stupid or foolish or other things. And I go back to something because I know my friends on the other side of the aisle, including my gentleman from Louisiana, who we've worked on many things for, Ms. Bass and others, we've worked on stuff before. The gentleman from New York, bills that get into law make a difference. Bills that simply get talked about in committee are simply for sound bites for those cameras up there. So the reason it was brought up just a little bit ago is why there was not a lot of discussion between many of us on how we could get this bill done. I just simply go back to the First Step Act. We did a lot of stuff for several years. I grit you. This is a very much of a needy time. We've actually been on this uh, committee, and for some of us, including uh, Mr. Richmond and others, we were in Houston, we were in Detroit, we were in other places on a police working group under the previous Congress. And we worked and we heard some of these ideas. Should have them some been moved on faster? Yes. But we haven't had the chance to until now, until the tragedy of a murder in Minneapolis. And yes, there is somebody on this side and many of us on this side. And in fact, most all of us who cannot bear the thought of what's happening. And we want to get it fixed. But also, it is not unfair to say that there are some things that we would like. Now, there may be some amendments I vote for. There's some amendments I may not vote for. But that's the committee process. But to simply say... Vote it and move on is not being honest with the American people. You don't pass laws that way. The Senate has got a say in this, and they happen to be controlled by Republicans. The president it has a say in this. He will, and we have a say. And one of the things is, is not that we have to do anything to fix with them, but let's at least find bigger issues to find. And we can weed those out. Because when I read this bill, you know what will never happen here, and I'm from the state legislature perspective, there are parts in this bill I would love for us to have detailed discussions of, because I'm saying, why did we use this word? It's too broad. It's going to get misinterpreted, and it's going to actually hurt people. It's going to bind our police officers instead of help our police. It's going to take our communities and get them frustrated because they said, this bill helps me, and it actually doesn't. But we're not doing that. And, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and you, you did a great job just a second ago talking about it, and I appreciate it. And I'm just bringing it up. Then let's go back to something bigger. I'm not, the, the amendment is fine. It's from the rest, Ms. Rathon, and we're going to look at it. But to simply say that let's pass this bill because we've got to do something, fine. But then let's also remember as we look forward that there's going to be a time when we're going to have to conference this if we truly want it passed. If we truly want the president in the Oval Office of the Rose Garden to sign this, we're going to have to come together. And that means that, as just like the gentleman said, I would have loved to have seen more things in the First Step Act. But guess what? I couldn't get it. You know why? A lot of times because my Democratic colleagues couldn't get there, and I had Republican colleagues who couldn't get there. But we kept negotiating. The gentleman from New York was outstanding in that. You and others were outstanding in that. Let's begin to understand this process now that this is how we're supposed to get it. What we have just heard 
And I've heard this before just a few moments ago. Are we not hearing the voices of those in the streets? Yes, we're hearing the voices of those in the streets. Because I'll remind you, I also had voices for those who were incarcerated. And nobody cared. Nobody was listening to the ones who were shackled while they were giving birth. But it took members looking at it from both sides of the aisle and having a discussion and debate in committee and outside of committee that actually made a difference. I understand passion. As many of you know, and I've said it before, I understand it from sort of both sides. I've been a defense attorney, I've been a prosecutor, but I'm a son of a state trooper. And I watched him come home after having battles and having confrontations. It broke his heart. But when we understand this and we start talking about participation, participation in this committee means that when amendments come up, you debate them, you vote them up and down, just like a bill. And was said just a few moments ago by the gentlelady from Washington State, mental health issues, you described several events of mental health. I remember when we actually passed a bill in this committee and we actually worked together because we passed it uh, on suspension and it was the uh, Comprehensive Mental Health and Criminal Justice Act. When we actually gave money and did grants so that federal officers and others could train state officers on how to identify mental health conditions with those that they come in contact without immediately going to, it's a criminal act or belligerency or something else. They're actually able to do their job. So let's work through this. You may disagree with the members. I may disagree with the members. But also, in the end of the day, if you want this to truly be, it will not happen in this room. It starts in this room, but it doesn't finish in this room. you got to have the Senate you got to have a three-pronged chair here doing it. And I'm willing to work on this because I've been working on it long before we ever got to here. And the folks on the other side of the aisle know that. In fact, if you don't believe it, just go to Georgia. I'm criticized for it regularly. So get over it. Let's get this thing done. Let's get something that works. And then move on so that the American people can finally say, Congress did their job. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized. I don't know where my friend from Georgia has been the last eight days because we had a hearing on this topic. Sitting right over there. And Republicans had every single, yeah, without a mask, I remember watching you. We had an opportunity to talk about the bill, to improve the bill, to make suggestions, to ask the experts, and they didn't do it. They talked about defunding the police, a sham issue. They talked about, they brought Miss, Miss Underwood up here, their prize witness. And she didn't know at the time, I talked to her briefly, they didn't know that it was this boogaloo group, the Hawaiian shirt crowd, that is the most significant crowd shown to have participated in trying to mess with the rioters and, and change the discourse because of their behavior to try to get some benefit for them in anarchy or white separatist or whatever it was. Some of them are white supremacists, Mr. Johnson. I read your piece from CNN. Some of them are. Some of them are anarchists. None of them are Black Lives Matter. And they are the most focused most identified group to have interfered with these protests that exist. And yet we get Antifa up here. Antifa is not a group like the Ku Klux Klan. They don't go and put on their hoods and robes and, and do their thing around a cross. They aren't organized at all. There's been no proof that they've done anything in these riots. This is all about real estate. One of our members, who I think is a real estate appraiser when he's not a lawyer, one time said, the most expensive real estate in the District of Columbia is between Donald Trump's ears. Today we're seeing a lesson in real estate. A whole bunch of people talking to the most expensive real estate in, in the District of Columbia. But if you read John Bolton's book, and I had not had a chance to read it, but I've read the New York Times clips, there's not a lot in between those two ears. He thought Finland was part of Russia. He didn't know Britain had a nuclear bomb. Much of what he said was absolutely not true, according to Mr. Bolton. And that's the most expensive real estate in D.C. to a lot of the people here, and that's where they're talking about Antifa, that's where they're talking about defunding the police, that's why they're talking about abortion, they're talking about anything but the real issues, which is police practices that need to be reformed to make people respect the police and to make police respect all people, and to see to it that African Americans are not subjugated to police and to others because of the color of their skin and a history of racism that's gone on since 1619 and that continues to pervade our debates, our politics, our social life, our economic life, and our whole culture. If anybody, as Mr. Richmond told you, doesn't get it, they simply don't get it. There is racial bias. Ms. Gupta got it. S Senator Cornyn of Texas doesn't get it. 
There is racial bias. It's built into all of us, and it's hard to escape. It's even harder, apparently, for some people to admit it. You know, the, Mr. Collins said that the voices of some, he, I guess he was quoting Mr. Cicilline, about the voices on the streets. Have you, have you listened to the voices on the streets? You don't have to listen to the voices on the streets. Just listen to your conscience, if you have one, and vote for this bill and stop all of this malarkey about Antifa, about defunding the police, and about Mr. Underwood. Get back to reality. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back for our purposes, Mr. Buxy, recognition. Word. Gentlemen's recognized. M Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to ask you to be fair, and I'm addressing the chair right now. When, when a Democrat goes over, they go over by 20, 30 seconds and you gavel them down. When a Republican goes over two or three seconds, you gavel them down. We need fairness in this hearing. We also need fairness when the, the gentleman from Tennessee uh, makes derogatory statements about the President of the United States that is against the rules of the House and he should be uh, gaveled down and he should be warned about that. We also need fairness when the gentleman from Tennessee talks about other members. If you have a conscience, that's a derogatory statement that he should not make about other uh, members of, of the House. And, and we need fairness in how we conduct these hearings if we're going to get to a better result. And I uh, yield to my friend from Georgia. I appreciate it. And, then I'll, and I'm just going to make it very clear. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. You proved my case again. Thank you for doing what you do. You proved my case again. The whole thing, what I was saying, went right over the head, and you proved my case again. All that was missing was another cheap stunt or a bucket of chicken, and I yield back. Typical. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for what purposes, the gentleman from California seek recognition? Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, 13 years ago, I partnered with the California State Senate Democrats in advocating for an Open Records Act for complaints against police officers. Five years ago, I co-sponsored Hank Johnson's Stop Militarizing the Police Act. Uh, this year, I co-sponsored legislation to end qualified immunity. If you're seeking bipartisan support for police reform, you would have it for the asking. If you had sought consultation and compromise and cooperation, if you'd reached across the aisle, you would have found many, many sincere allies. Not only did you not offer Republicans a seat at the table, you haven't even offered Republicans enough seats in the committee room, disenfranchising many of us who felt this matter at hand was far, far too important to simply phone in. I agree with several of the provisions of this bill, but I disagree with a lot of the sentiments expressed here today uh, by majority members. Our police forces are among the most trusted institutions in our nation for a reason. The vast, vast proportion of police officers are good and decent people motivated by a desire to protect and serve our communities. To characterize them as systemically racist or systemically abusive is an insult to them and an insult to our society. Without law enforcement, there's no law. And without law, there is no civilization. Demoralizing and demonizing the very people who every day put their lives on the line to assure the safety and rights of every citizen is an insult to those who serve and it's destructive of the very foundations of our civilization. I also reject the notion that America is systemically racist. Yes, there are racists of every color in every society. That is the basest side of our human nature. But no nation has struggled harder to transcend that nature and to isolate and ostracize its racists than have Americans. The American founders placed principles in the Declaration of Independence that they believed would someday produce a nation of free men and women of all races and religions together enjoying the blessings of liberty and the equal protection of our laws. Lincoln denounced any other claim as, quote, having an evil tendency, if not an evil design. An evil tendency and an evil design 
are exactly what the radical left have reintroduced into our society, and it is tearing us apart. My views on law enforcement were shaped when I had the honor to work for the former Los Angeles Police Chief Ed Davis. Uh, his approach to law enforcement proved very, very effective. During the time he was chief in Los Angeles, while crime skyrocketed nationally 50%, he actually brought it down in Los Angeles. He believed in the policing principles of Sir Robert Peel, that the police are an extension of the community. Chief Davis believed that and he practiced it. He introduced neighborhood watch enlisting citizens to, to work in partnership uh, with police. He introduced the basic car plan that matched patrol officers with individual neighborhoods so that they would become a familiar and recognized and trusted presence uh, in each neighborhood. I believe the closer we adhere to these principles, the more effective law enforcement becomes and the fewer abuses we will see. Major parts of, of this bill before us move us closer to these principles, particularly the reform of qualified immunity, the need to open police records of misconduct, the restrictions of no-knock uh, warrants, the restrictions of introducing military hardware, and the encouragement of police cameras. If these provisions were presented as standalone bills, I think you'd be able to demonstrate significant bipartisan support for them. You certainly have mine. But by politicizing all of this, uh, by excluding the minority, by rolling these into a bill that imposes a laundry list of operational restrictions and procedures upon every police department in, in the nation makes them simply unsupportable. Getting back to, to Peel's principles, policing is a uniquely community-based function. New York, New York, and Weed Patch, California, and yes, there is such a place, are very different, uh, uh, and they have very different needs and challenges and standards. Assuring the protections of our Constitution for all of our citizens is a unique federal function, but running and micromanaging every local police department is far beyond our competence or authority. So even though there are provisions of the bill that I strongly support, I can't support it. The attempt to federalize our local police departments, denigrate our law enforcement officials, and politicize what should be an issue bringing all of us together. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The uh, question occurs on the amendment by Mr. Reschenthaler. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The noes have it. Uh, the recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Jeffries? No. Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Yes. Mr. Gomert votes yes. Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Mr. Buck votes aye. 
Ms. Roby? Ms. Roby votes no. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Are there any other members who haven't voted who wish to vote? The clerk will report. Mr. Richmond, you are not recorded. Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 25 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. What purpose does the gen For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman, uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Gomert of Texas. Page 135, strike line 16 through 23. Insert the following. Whoever commits murder in the commission of a kidnapping shall be punished by any term of years, including life or death. The uh, gentleman is recognized Mr. for the Chairman, purpose I'm of explaining his objection to the amendment. The gentlelady reserves an objection. The gentleman is recognized for the purpose of explaining. Thank you. There's been allegations that we're not serious about dealing with the issue. At page 129 of the amendment in the nature of a substitute, Title IV says justice for victims of lynching act. And then it goes through from page 129 to page 135 with uh, numerous findings and my amendment doesn't change any of those. Congressman Bobby Rush worked very hard on all of those. Um, those are left intact. Then on page 135, section 403, it just says that chapter 13 of title 18 U.S. code is amended by adding at the end of the following. Whoever conspires with another person to violate these certain sections shall be punished in the same manner as a completed violation of such section, except that if the maximum term of imprisonment for such completed violation is less than 10 years, the person may be imprisoned for not more than 10 years. Now, the original bill that Congressman Rush had was a much better bill. And I asked him on the floor, why did this get watered down? It shouldn't be a 10-year sentence. It ought to be life. In his original bill, it was life. But it got watered down because apparently the Democratic leadership said, if you want to vote, you got to water it down. So he did. So this was really more of a symbolic addition or a vote on the floor. And I think it's legitimate to have it in this bill but not like this. It needs to be closer to what Congressman Rush originally had that addresses just how heinous a lynching is. And he wanted it, he's been fighting for years to have it named after Emmett Till, do something about uh, lynching. Let's get serious. And I voted against it because it's absurd to have a 10-year maximum mentioned and only talk about conspiracy and say we've dealt with the Emmett Till situation. For those that don't know, he was a 14-year-old African-American in 1955 on summer vacation. He was visiting relatives near money in the Mississippi Delta region. He spoke to a 21-year-old uh, young woman who was white, married, and was proprietor of, with the, of a small grocery store there. What happened in the store is a matter of great dispute. Till was accused of flirting or whistling 
And the woman originally alleged she, he touched her waist. Several nights after the incident at the store, the woman's husband, Roy, and his half-brother, J.W., were armed, and they went to Till's great-uncle's house. They abducted this poor uh, 14-year-old boy, took him away, beat him, mutilated him, and then shot him in the head and sank his body in the Tallahatchie River. Several nights after the incident, the story, um, well, these men publicly admitted in a 1956 interview with Look Magazine that they had killed Emmett Till. If this bill, the way it is right now, had been passed into law before this happened in 1955, it wouldn't have had any effect. A 10-year maximum for conspiring. My amendment is serious and it puts a serious penalty on this. Let's give Emmett Till's legacy something more serious than conspiracy and 10 year max, if something more than that. Let's do it right. Those two men deserve to be found guilty and they deserved the death penalty. I have looked two people in the eye, they were both white, and, and sentenced them to death. I had one tried for capital murder who was black and I sentenced him to life pursuant to the jury's findings. In this case, I would have had no problem looking these guys in the eyes and sentencing them to death. Let's get serious. You want to do something serious? You say we're not serious. I say you're not serious unless you join me in putting a serious legacy onto the name of Emmett Till and the hard work, many years, that Bobby Rush has put in to making something where it should be. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I recognize myself uh, in opposition uh, to the amendment. Lynching is a heinous, heinous crime. Murder of, la of black people of African Americans or of anybody else, obviously it's a heinous crime. This bill establishes for the first time in federal law the crime of lynching. It is a great step forward in addition to all the other provisions of the bill which we've been discussing, which are great steps forward to stop the, uh, the, ra the systemic racism in this country, to stop the murder by police officers of <laughs> of so many black, uh, black uh, African-American people. Lynching is made a crime, a federal crime, by this bill for the first time, and it's very necessary to do that. But we're not going to make this bill barbarous by having a death penalty in it. The death penalty is a barbarous penalty, not deserving of existing in the United States, and its application over the years has been also systemically racist. But gentlemen, you? No, I will not yield. The death penalty has been systemically racist. It is barbarous. We, it is essential that we make lynching a federal crime, which we do in this bill. And uh, that is why we're doing it. And we are not going to uh, contaminate the great act of making lynching a federal crime by enacting a barbarous death penalty. Uh, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. I yield to the gentleman from Texas. I appreciate my friend from Ohio yielding. Look, I understand Democrats are in the majority. I would like this amendment adopted to give real teeth to lynching laws. And if, if striking or death from the language of the amendment will get the uh, chairman, since you say your big objection is it's barbarous because it includes the death penalty, you're in the majority. I understand that. That has consequences. I'll strike death off of it if it will get your vote, Mr. Chairman, and I would yield to you uh, for that question. Will you vote yes if we eliminate the death penalty?
The gentleman's time is his own. Yeah. And I yielded to you, Mr. Chairman. I know you're busy doing all kinds of other things other than this bill, but with regard to this amendment, you're in the majority, and if I don't have your approval, apparently nobody is going to go different from you. It's, it's a group thing, but I will strike the death penalty part from this, since that was your big objection in your comments, if that will get your vote. Will you vote for it if I eliminate the death penalty from this amendment? Mm -hmm so that it has a maximum life sentence. Uh, does the gentleman yield to me? Yes. Uh, the answer is no. We're going to, to uh, the, th this section of the bill was uh, fashioned by the two authors of the bill, uh, and I think it does exactly the job that we wanted to do. Yep. <laughs> I wish we were serious about putting real, well, real teeth in. Is, I, I Gomer, reclaim my, my, my time. Obviously, this is a serious amendment meant to put serious teeth into this bill. I think what happened to Emmett Till deserved a death penalty and should in the future, but elections have consequences. You're in the majority. You won't vote for a death penalty. I'm willing to strike that because I want teeth in it, not just some symbolism for the death of Emmett Till. Will the gentleman this from recognizes what happened to him as lynching, and it was punish it. And I will yield, yield to my friend from Texas. It's, it's, it's my time, and I'll yield to the gentleman down here. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think the gentleman from Ohio. You know, there's there's really a number of re reasons that you have uh, criminal law, and you enforce and instill penalties. One is societal retribution and to make the society whole. Another is specific deterrence. You want to make sure that that individual. Uh, uh, cr criminal does not repeat uh, the same type of crime, so you you have some kind of penalty, or you have a societal or a general deterrent, because you don't want anybody else to look and say uh, that they can do something and get away with it. I I, I think the offer to make this to remove the death penalty and make this a life sentence is eminently rational and supportable, and we should do that. I mean. The, the Emmett Till case was horrific. The first time I ever heard about it was just absolutely mind-blowingly devastating. But if, 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 if you're not going to do it because, uh, because you think the death penalty is barbarous, which is what I thought uh, the, chair, the chair said, I just point out that uh, the officers in Minnesota, uh, one, one is subjected to, to life in, in, in prison or even the death penalty. I only raise that because I think in a lynching case, to say that you, the max you can get is 10 years is not going to provide the general deterrence that we need in our society. And I, 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 that's why I support what my friend from Texas has said. This is critical. If you don't want to include the death penalty, surely someone who engages such, in such a heinous crime as lynching we should face up to a life sentence in prison. With that, I'll yield back to the my time. I agree with the Gomer Amendment. Uh, lynching is a hate crime, uh, which should carry more than a 10-year sentence. And the fact Mr. Gomer made a good faith offer and withdrew uh, the death sentence and it was rejected by the chair is uh, almost incomprehensible. Are you to yes, I would ask unanimous consent, just so that it has a good chance of passing that we strike the two words, or death, from my amendment. Point of parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman. He's asked to strike two words. The uh, gentleman is recognized. Yes, I move to strike the last word, whatever the easiest way. But if you remove the death penalty, it is already uh, the case under 18 U.S.C. 1201 kidnapping is already punishable by imprisonment for any terms or for life. So your amendment would basically just repeat what is existing. No, it on. makes lynching a federal crime so, punishable. But this your amendment, but my, my point is, if it involves kidnapping, which is what your amendment does, that is already punishable by life in prison under federal law. It is not specified as lynching. This uh, makes it lynching. 
which was yeah, the point what, of the, the original bill. That's what the Justice Policing Act does. I, I would, uh, I, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yield back? Well, I'm oh, waiting for a ruling on the unanimous consent of uh, the uh, request. The word, there was no Repeat objection. the unanimous consent request, please. As unanimous consent to strike the last two words of the amendment or death. Objection is heard. Who, uh, who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentlelady from uh, Texas seek recognition? Take the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is recognized. First, I want to re uh, remove the objection I had on the overall amendment, uh, and then uh, I want to um, speak the obvious, uh, the, the heinous and violent and vile killing of Emmett Till more than 50 to 70 years ago, the fact that his name is invoked and we are talking about this is shameful that we had to wait this long, but we are grateful for the proponents of this bill, a senator from New Jersey and the congressperson from Illinois, who have um, found that to get a federal statute against lynching uh, is something that they have worked for for a very long time. Uh, I think it is important to clarify uh, that the uh, statute that we are proposing in this legislation is an add-on. It means that state and local governments, whatever jurisdiction it occurs in, uh, can proceed against uh, this vile perpetrator. This touches a chord in my heart because I have had, in the last 48 hours, two young men of color hung in my district, hung in my district. I could come here and cry before everyone. I am getting texts from my constituents about what to do. I am grateful that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has responded. But I also want to say, and my colleagues, I want you to be able to understand what it means to the George Floyd family to maybe not even have gotten a call, but the first view that they had of his dying moments of I can't breathe might have been an unsolicited filming by a young patriot 17-year-old. Or be in the position to get the phone call of Tamir Rice's mother or Trayvon Martin's mother. All these mothers got phone calls or some notice, some, some uh, unsympathetic notice. Or Laquan McDonald, who had at least 20 shots, if my recollection serves me, running away. Or Mr. Brooks' eight-year-old daughter, who was looking for a birthday party, who, as Mr. Johnson said, Mr. Brooks was very cooperative and all a guardian a officer had to do, someone acting transparently as a guardian could have accepted him passing those uh, tests about whether he was under the influence and let him walk home to his family. This is where we are today. We are not answering the pain of mothers, and I've called them off, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, those in my district, Donald Ray and Pamela Turner, Ida Lee Delaney, people who died in my congressional area. So what I believe is that we have to give justice today. It is a shame how long Emmett Till had to wait. It is a shame that in the midst of George Floyd and the pain of his family, another family within days was suffering the same violence. It is well to acknowledge good policing and the heroes that have helped us on the hill. But as a mother of a black son, and there are others here, my dear friend, my, my, my colleague, Congressman McBath, who sits here in reality for what she experienced. Don't underestimate that call or that neighbor saying, did you see what was on TV? And they not know what had happened. They sent their child out, whoever it might be, getting cigarettes, playing in a park, Tamir Rice, with a BB gun. 
whoever it was, going to a store in Minneapolis. And so I just hope we can get back to George Floyd's Justice and Policing Act. Because, Mr. Chairman, if we don't, the calls will keep coming. Some mother will pick up the phone. Some father will pick up the phone. Some grandmother will pick up the phone. Or maybe they'll get somebody running down the street, knocking on their door, saying, did you hear what happened to your child? I can't take it anymore. I worry about a grown son because he's a black male. So can we get to the point, there are other times to do all this legislation. Mr. Chairman, I ask to offer into the record uh, this front cover that is potent and powerful, the New Yorker, that shows the face of George without, Floyd. Without, without objection. And in it, Mr. Chairman, are the multitude of faces that have died in these tragic and unfortunate circumstances, they cry out for us to give them an answer, and that is justice the and unanimous consent. Without objection, the time of the, the gentlelady yields back. The question occurs on the amendment by Mr. Gomert. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. No. The noes have it. No. A uh, recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? <laughs> Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Aye. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Collins? Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Yes. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Are there any members who, have, who wish to vote who haven't voted? Mr. Collins? I do, Mr. Chair. Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Are there any other members who wish to vote who haven't voted? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? 
from Colorado seek recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that correction. Um, I uh, have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120 offered by Mr. Buck of Colorado. Strike section 102 and redesignate provisions accordingly. The gentleman is recognized for the purpose of explaining his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hear my colleagues' concern about the urgency of reforming police enforcement in America and improving safety. I have witnessed the kind of type of leadership that we seek right now in this issue, and I'm referring to um, the work of Mr. Cicilline from Rhode Island on the Antitrust Committee and how we have held field hearings and we have held congressional hearings in D.C. and we have held uh, and we have staff working together to, to work through complex, difficult issues and uh, seek a report that will convey uh, a bipartisan view of how to uh, reform antitrust issues in, in a, a positive and lasting way. I have also witnessed this amendment process and I have witnessed our efforts here. And while we have spoken about this issue for a long time, we haven't had the chance to work closely together. I offer an amendment today that I think uh, everyone would agree is germane. It is not uh, frivolous. It, is, it goes really to the heart of a, of a very important issue. And uh, that issue is uh, qualified immunity. The goal of the legislation is to make citizens safer, police more accountable, and to reduce racial disparities in the enforcement of our laws. Laudable goals. If you take away qualified immunity from police officers, you reduce the effectiveness of police and make communities less safe. If you cause officers to hesitate before they act, innocent people will die. Take, for instance, the city of Baltimore, how the city of Baltimore responded after politicians handcuffed the police department following the death of Freddie Gray and the ensuing riots. The New York Times found that Baltimore ended 2015 with 342 homicides, a 62% increase from the previous year. Some neighborhoods saw their homicide rates triple. 93% of the victims were black. The indirect consequences for neighborhoods were just as harmful. The Baltimore Sun reported that approximately 315,000 doses of opioids were looted during the riots. These drugs hit the streets, and by 2017, Baltimore reached a new high with 692 opioid deaths. This was a direct result of police pulling back from neighborhoods. Baltimore Police Department dispatch records show that the number of field interviews dropped by 70%. The number of suspected narcotic offenses reported through proactive policing dropped by 30%. As Reverend Rodney Hudson of Ames Memorial United Methodist Church in West Baltimore stated, quote, drug dealers are taking control of the corners and the police's hands are tied. We have a community that is afraid, end of quote. These calls to sideline, sideline the police will have a grave impact and will only take us further from providing safety, justice, and equal protection for every man, woman, and child in this country. Having said that, I would ask my colleagues to join me in this amendment, pass the amendment, make this a stronger bill, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I will recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment would eliminate, I'm sorry, the bill would eliminate qualified immunity. The amendment would strike that provision of the bill. This is one of the most important provisions of the bill for anyone who wants to crack down on police brutality and on police misconduct of any kind. Qualified immunity was invented by the Supreme Court in a series of cases decided in the 1970s and 80s. We never had qualified immunity before the 1970s and 1980s, and the world didn't fall in. Police officers weren't afraid to make arrests. Qualified immunity distorts the foundational civil rights law, 42 U.S.C. 1983, which does not provide for any official immunity and was intended to allow victims of misconduct by state and local officials to recover damages 
and vindicate their constitutional rights in federal court. Qualified immunity bars civil rights plaintiffs from recovering from winning in court unless they can prove that an officer violated, quote, clearly established law. In effect, this means that plaintiffs in police brutality cases have their claims thrown out unless a prior appellate court has already held that the exact same type of conduct and the same type of circumstances violates the Constitution. This is almost never the case. Qualified immunity means that civil rights cases are dismissed before they even reach a jury. Qualified immunity has been criticized across the political spectrum, from the Cato Institute and the Koch Foundation on the right to the ACLU and the NAACP on the left. Study after study has shown that qualified immunity allows egregious misconduct to go, on, to go unpunished and unaddressed, even when a court finds that an officer's conduct violated the Constitution. Even if the court finds that an officer's conduct violated the Constitution, he cannot be held liable because of the doctrine of qualified immunity. We must get rid of this egregious and horrible doctrine. It is one of the key points of the bill. It is one of the key ways in which we can uh, crack down on police brutality, in which we can crack down on, mis on the kind of misconduct that uh, victimized George Floyd and all the other people we have talked about here today. So I am very much opposed to this amendment. I urge everyone to vote against it. It is, one of the, it is probably the most pernicious amendment we may see. I yield back. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues and uh, give my condolences, thoughts, and prayers of my family to the family of Representative Barr and Representative Sensenbrenner and the uh, loss of their wives. I couldn't imagine dealing with such a tragic loss um, and what they're going through. So know that our family is, is praying with you. I also today mourn the death of Officer Julian Keene, who was fatally shot Sunday morning in Hendry County. Officer Keene served with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for six years. Officer Keene bravely dedicated his life to protecting and serving the public, and this tragic death will not be forgotten. I just got off the phone with the second in command at Henry County Sheriff's Office just to give my condolences and my thoughts. And through their investigation, they have found, and this just happened this past Sunday, they have found that the moment that the criminal knew and found out that the officer was a law enforcement officer because the officer was reacting in plain clothes off duty once the officer told him he was a police officer, the criminal pulled out a gun and shot him and killed him. Prior to that, it wasn't a threat. As soon as he knew he was a law enforcement officer, he pulled out a gun and shot him. So I believe that uh, Mr. Keene's life mattered. Uh, an African-American officer who served with distinction in the state of Florida, and my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family. Uh, I rise in support of Mr. Buck's amendment on qualified immunity. I had a round table. I represent nine counties in the state of Florida. I had a round table yesterday with most of the sheriffs in my district, and unequivocally, the biggest issue that they had is the piece in the bill as it relates to qualified immunity, and I'll explain why. First, I think there's a real misconception about what qualified immunity is in the general public. And they also shared this concern that more people need to talk about the fact that it's not just a full bar immunity. If you act outside of your standards and protocols and outside of your training, then you don't have immunity. That's why it's called qualified immunity. If we take that away from our officers, not only are you going to see that they had two major concerns. One, many, many people in their department will just quit. Uh, my, dep my brother, who's a deputy and a supervisor, talked to him last week. He's already had two officers in his squad quit because of everything that's going on. Uh, there, you're going to have a real problem and challenge recruiting officers, good officers, to join the force because they know that they're going to get sued even if they don't violate any standards and protocols because obviously we know the trial system in America and it's easier to settle those cases than to take them to trial. And if they're moving within their standards and procedures, the, the immunity only applies. If they're outside of that, like what we saw, the atrocious death of Mr. Floyd, then obviously that's not going to make them immune from injustice. Taking that away, I think, is going to be hugely detrimental, not only to the safety of our officers, but also to the recruitment and retention of good quality officers in the state of Florida. So I rise in support of Mr. Buck's amendment. 
and uh, look forward to supporting it. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Armstrong seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm skeptical of qualified immunity. Uh, I hate the concept, or, and I really hate the implementation, particularly out of 19, the 1982 case, U.S. v. Harlow. Uh, I agree with the chairman and his uh, rec or his resuscitation about the barriers to entry in these cases. And I wish we'd have a hearing on this because. I also think I support the amendment as it currently stands. And the reason is, is I absolutely agree qualified immunity needs significant reform. But I also think it needs to be replaced with something. And it's a lot different time than it was in the early 1970s and how this will end up working and how this will affect smaller departments and how this will affect places across the country. Because what will happen is this will not be a fight between the officer and a plaintiff's lawyer. This will be a fight between a department's insurance company and a um, officer. Uh, the reality is many officers have wives, they have kids, they have mortgages, and they don't have that much money. Uh, we don't pay our officers nearly enough, in my humble opinion. But when you are a small department and you are going to care in order to recruit people, you're going to have to carry that insurance. And what that means is when there is a suit, there's going to be a lawyer provided by the insurance company. If the officer wants his own lawyer in the proceeding, he's gonna have to hire one. And you will have settlements, and you will have pre premiums, and you will have these things go up. That doesn't mean I don't think it needs reform. It doesn't mean I don't even know if I would, I'm, I'm not sure I wouldn't support completely abolishing it. What it means is, with all due, well, <laughs> With all due respect from my um, colleague for Florida, I was the one that said this stuff is hard, and it is. And it's not hard if you don't care about the policy, and if you don't care about getting it right, and if you don't care about the unintended consequences, and how it affects a rural department with five cops. Then it's not hard. Then you can do these things. But if you do care about all those things, and you care about local control, and you want to see reform, and you also want to see good law enforcement, then this stuff is hard. And it should be, and that's why we're here. But we should have hearings on this. We should get the answers to these questions because I am absolutely, truly sympathetic to both sides. But I'm also, I'm under, I live in the world of reality. I've represented plaintiffs in a qualified immunity case and was shocked at how little options we had. I've also represented officers in justifiable shootings and know the types of stressors and things they go through on a daily basis in an incredibly difficult job. So the reason I think I'm going to support this amendment isn't because I actually agree with it, no offense to my friend from Colorado, but I don't think we can get rid of it without having a serious conversation about what comes next. And with that, I'll yield to my friend from Colorado. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And, and I think um, I agree absolutely with what you say. I would love to see qualified immunity uh, reformed. I'd love to see a thoughtful process that, that is involved in how we reform qualified immunity, uh, what the boundaries are, and how we train officers about qualified immunity. But taking it in uh, a, a fashion like this, where we don't hold hearings, where we don't listen to the officers and the needs of departments and how they recruit good officers so that we don't have more bad officers, we have more good officers coming into departments, I think is an essential part of this. And then um, I, I thank uh, Mr. Stubbe in, in his remarks and how we uh, define qualified immunity, because I think it's very important to define it. If an officer acts outside of the training and the rules and the regulations of that department, qualified immunity does not apply. It's only when an officer is acting consistent with the rules and regulations of a department that that officer is protected by qualified immunity. What, uh, what we're seeing now with chokeholds, so many departments independently have, uh, uh, have, have rightfully, in my view, stopped the technique of, of chokeholds um, that I think we are, uh, th that if an officer uh, did that, not to protect that officer's life, but uh, just did it to subdue a, 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 a suspect, um, that would be acting outside the department's rules and that officer would be subject to a uh, civil suit personally. And I think it's so important that we define what qualified immunity is and not, and not just uh, keep it vague. So thank you very much for yielding.
Yeah, and I think to that point, I would say I agree with um, both you and Mr. Stubbe in concept, and I also agree with the chairman in practice, and I would encourage people, regardless of what side you are on the aisle, look at some of the cases that have been thrown out because of qualified immunity, because if it truly did work like that all the time, I think we'd all have a lot more confidence in it. But in, in reality, in a lot of ways, it doesn't. So with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's not get uh, confused. Uh, you know, immunity, uh, sovereign immunity, limited immunity. Uh, the bottom line is courts have found a way to contort the facts and to also contort the law <coughs> so as to render police officers not liable for every action that they take to harm the people that they are accused of uh, mistreating or harming. Uh, this is just the reality of it. Uh, the courts have found a way to deny justice through the civil process to aggrieved individuals <coughs> seeking compensation for the loss of um, their loved one. And it's time for us to end that charade, that legal charade that hides behind a bunch of man-made exceptions. Um, and, uh, you know, you find a way to avoid holding folks accountable. That's why we have the kind of police misconduct that we have today is because they have not been held accountable through the courts, either criminally or civilly. So fortunately, we're changing both the criminal law and the civil law to make it easier for officers to be held accountable when they violate the law. Now, I'll agree that most police officers don't violate the law. That's why they should not mind uh, when they can be held liable for uh, their misdeeds. Uh, most are not going to commit any misdeeds, and so they have nothing to worry about. It's just like me as an attorney. Uh, you know, I mean, people could sue me as an attorney, so that meant I had to have malpractice insurance. I had to actually go out and purchase malpractice insurance. And um, I'm sure that there will be products available to uh, protect police officers. Those products, insurance products, would be paid for by their employer, just like the employer pays the judgments any time when uh, police officers, and, and it's a, it doesn't happen often, but whenever they are held accountable in civil courts, their employer, the city or the county or the state, always steps up to the plate and indemnifies the officer. They're often uh, held liable along with the officer under respondent superior uh, laws. And so, you know, bottom line, People who decide to go into law enforcement, they're not, they're not going to be uh, dissuaded from going that route simply because they can be held accountable. Uh, so it's nonsense, uh, these arguments that we are hearing about, uh, you know, what we're doing is going to kill uh, the ability of, of uh, agencies to recruit officers, uh, that's just not going to happen. We do need to raise the pay of these officers so that they don't have to work two and three jobs just to make ends meet. There's a lot we can do to foster good policing as opposed to the bad policing that we have being fostered. And one way of curing good, uh, bad policing is giving people the ability to sue. Uh, these officers, giving them some redress. That's the way it should be in America. Nobody should be above the law. So I support uh, the underlying bill. I, um, I do not support this amendment, which guts an essential provision of the bill, and I'd ask my colleagues to uh, do the same. And with that, I will yield. Would the gentleman to yield? I'll yield to uh, the gentleman. Uh, thank you. I just want to ask, isn't it true that even without qualified immunity, in order for an officer to be held liable uh, for the use of force in a civil rights case, 
the, the plaintiffs would, or would have to show, already have to show that the officer's use of force was unreasonable, uh, even without qualified immunity? It would. Thank you. I yield back. And with that, I will yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does uh, the, uh, Mr. Yeah, the gentleman from Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Mr. Uh, Gates, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, Gates seek recognition. Uh, move to strike last point. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will be oh. the third Republican now to express my support for reform to the qualified immunity doctrine for many of the reasons that the chairman referenced. And again, there are, there are Republicans who wanted to work on these things with you and perhaps we would actually have an amendment and compromise bipartisan legislation that could really do some good on qualified immunity had we been invited to the legislative process. But instead, we've been called insincere. Our motives have been called into question. How we love our own family members has been criticized. We were told that our amendments make a mockery of people's pain. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I believe that we could make some progress on qualified immunity. And Mr. Chairman, I, I was hoping to use the remainder of my time to enter a, a constructive colloquy with you. And, and I would ask, have you given thought to some of the concerns that Mr. Armstrong raised about the financial impact of a change in the doctrine? and the insurance market and a small agency's ability to pay for that? And, and have we sought input from some of those folks so that we might understand in real dollars, in budgetary percentages, what that would mean? Because I don't think there's a single member of this committee who would want to sacrifice elements of good policing uh, for the sake of maybe you know insurance that wouldn't need to be purchased if we had a well-tailored doctrine. General. Uh, yes, we have, we have obviously considered these things, um, um, and it is clear that given the uh, requirement in the law without qualified immunity that a police officer be found to have used force unreasonably, um, you're not going to have that any kind of problem except where you should have a problem, where a police officer has used force unreasonably, has beaten someone or killed him or what, whatever, there should be liability. Um, and that's under the in underlying law if we repeal the, um, the qualified immunity statute. No, let, let and, me grant that as and the, and the, and the, and the, the cost? Well, the, and the cost is indemnified. I, I point out the cost is indemnified in 98 point something percent of the cases by the departments. And we had no problem. There was no problem with these costs before the doctrine of qualified immunity was invented by the Supreme Court in the 1970s. Have we, have we looked at what insurance products might be available and, and how, you know, like in Niceville, Florida, where we've got under 10 officers, uh, how they might be able to acquire well, I can, all, all I can say is uh, the experience before 1970 showed there was no problem with this. And uh, if, if a department, frankly, allows police officers to use unreasonable force, it ought to be liable. Um, I, I actually, I think there, there, there should be liability. And let me ask this question. Have you thought about qualified immunity doctrine as how it intersects with the sovereign immunity doctrine? Because to Mr. Johnson's point, if you have a defendant who's not particularly collectible, the petitioner wouldn't even have the ability to recover for the redress of, of their loss. Whereas in the sovereign immunity doctrine, you have a more collectible defendant and maybe the well, ability to make- To, to, to answer the question, if the police officer cannot uh, 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 acts unreasonably and, 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 and injures or, or kills somebody, he ought to pay. And if he can't, the department ought to pay. Um, and departments ought not to have police officers who, who use force unreasonably. And again- Does the bill do that, it, Mr. Chairman? Yes. For my, so the bill well, no, says- no. The, the bill Does the bill say that if the officer can't pay that the- No, the bill pay? doesn't say that. Okay. But that's-, that's, that's that, Might that be that, something the what? chairman would consider? It's current in collective bargaining agreements. It's, it's, it's current in 98% in of collecting bargaining agreements in the United States uh, that, that, the, that the department will indemnify the officer. Okay. And again, we, the qualified immunity doctrine, which we seek to repeal in this bill, did not exist before it was no, invented I, by I the Supreme Court in the 70s, I've, and you didn't have a problem. I have a limited time, and I have one more question. It's been very helpful. I, I thank you a great deal. 
police you know, the, the White House has expressed some concern over policies that might lead a police officer not to get out of the car. And so I just wanted to give you the chance to respond to the concern that if you go too far in abridging these immunities, you, cons you constrain the active and engaging policing that mayors like Rahm Emanuel have said are, are really important. So I just wanted to give you the chance to respond. To well, that. thank you. No, I don't agree with that because without qualified immunity, there is no liability. Frankly, with or without, well, without qualified immunity, if we get rid of it, there is still no liability unless the police officer has used unreasonable force. And police officers should not use unreasonable force, obviously. And uh, to say that uh, police officers, that people aren't going to want to be police officers because they want to use unreasonable force is frankly a slander on people who want to be police officers. I, I don't think that was the argument, but I, I appreciate your indulgence. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does um, the gentlelady from uh, uh, Pennsylvania seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady is recognized. I wanted to just make a comment on masks. I do appreciate uh, that this week, as opposed to last week, a majority of the minority party is wearing masks. I would ask that all members of the minority party, when they are not speaking, wear masks for the good of all of us. We wear a mask to protect each other. On the question of qualified immunity, uh, yesterday, attorney uh, Esley Merritt testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee in a hearing about police use of force. Mr. Merritt is a civil rights lawyer whose practice consists of representing the families of black Americans killed by law enforcement. The fact that an attorney can have such a practice is an indictment of the status quo worthy of a discussion in and of itself. But I want to bring to your attention what he said. When asked what reform we absolutely have to take on, he said the one with, without all of this effort will be for nothing, qualified immunity. You don't have to be a lawyer, a member of Congress, or a criminal justice expert to understand the calls of protesters marching in the street across this country. They want accountability. Eliminating qualified immunity is how we get it. Qualified immunity is a doctrine made by judges, not by Congress, not by statute. It prevents victims of police brutality from holding police officers civilly liable for civil rights abuses unless the exact circumstances of their case have previously been judged by an appellate court. Think of the absurdity of that. To put it in perspective, it's like barring me from bringing a suit, a gender discrimination suit, against my employer, unless a court has heard a case with the exact same type of sexist behavior before. It's a preposterous doctrine. The whole point of the legal system is to allow people to seek recourse, redress for the wrongs they have suffered. If we exempt the officer of the justice system from facing the consequences for the harm they do, it corrupts the legitimacy of the entire system. Taking this step will not bring ruin to the police departments. For example, as the chairman just pointed out, 99% of police departments are covered by insurance policies their cities have purchased for lawsuits. State and local enforcement are indemnified by their employers. All this will do is bring accountability to the bad actors for police misconduct. From what I've heard, that's what everyone in this chamber wants. And I will correct uh, the characterization of my colleague on the other side of the aisle in terms of what the administration has offered in terms of police reform. In public, he has recommended to police officers that when they put defendants or arrestees in the car, they rough them up. Don't protect their head. That's the kind of reform our president is interested in. This bill will go a long way to correcting those kinds of an absurd wrong. Systemic racism is within our police system. It is within so many of our communities. And this bill will go a long way uh, to correcting some of those wrongs. With that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm now the fourth Republican by my count to express my support for thoughtful reforms to the Qualified Immune Doctrine. And I, based upon our discussion with the Republicans um, on this committee last night, I think I speak for almost all of them that they also agree. 
And it is precisely for that reason that I support the Buck Amendment. I think it's very, very important. As has been said, we have to acknowledge that something as complex and expansive as qualified immunity should not be removed or changed without serious debate and thoughtful study and consideration by this committee. Th this has simply not been allowed here. Uh, I have a different set of experiences. I was an attorney, constitutional law background, litigated cases in federal courts for nearly 20 years. I understand the frustration of navigating doctrines created through what often amounts to the policy preferences of the judiciary. I understand the perspective offered by Justice Clarence Thomas when he wrote a few years ago, quote, until we shift the focus of our inquiry to whether immunity existed at common law, we will continue to substitute our own policy preferences for the mandates of Congress, unquote. Per the intent of the framers, Congress ultimately has the authority to properly clarify and intervene in matters of policy that govern our legal system, and qualified immunity is obviously no exception to that. However, this should be done prudently, especially one of this magnitude with this many possible ramifications. This morning, I sent a letter to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, who is the chairman of our subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties, where I serve as ranking member. My letter asked for a hearing on this very subject so that we can do our duty and properly and methodically study this area of law in more depth before we make such sweep, sweeping changes. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter that letter into the record by unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you. Simply put, the broken process here has produced a flawed product. I've spoken to key leaders in law enforcement community in my state and district, and they have expressed serious concerns over the sweeping manner in which this bill eliminates any protection at all from serious civil penalties for individual officers. They are deeply concerned with the apparent lack of awareness that exists over uh, the practical effect of this change. As one of my sheriffs told me last night on the phone, no rational person will want to do this job anymore. How in the world do the sponsors of this bill think we will be able to recruit qualified new officers if all police are already under such tremendous stress and increased danger, intense scrutiny and unwarranted criticism, and now Congress is going to tell them that even if they perform their difficult duties in strict accordance with their training, they can now face unrestricted personal liability in lawsuits. That's what the sheriff says. He's on the ground. He's the one recruiting and training and hiring new officers. With respect to my friend from Georgia, there is absolutely zero comparison between an attorney carrying his own professional malpractice insurance and a street cop who may encounter inherently dangerous physical encounters with assailants and violence offenders on a daily basis. It's absurd to suggest that those two things are even comparable. My hope is that my colleagues on this committee will recognize the gravity and profound consequences of this subject and agree that a much more thoughtful and deliberate process is necessary before we make these hasty changes. Again, you can get bipartisan agreement on this. We're not saying there should not be reform to the qualified immunity doctrine. We're just saying, if we're going to do this, it needs to be done in the right way. And I'd like to reiterate my support for the amendment, and with that, I yield back. Oh, or I yield to the uh, gentleman from Arizona. I thank the gentleman from Louisiana. Um, I also support this uh, amendment because I support a, a kind of a reform of, qual of this uh, immunity. But we're not getting there. What you're doing is you're going to basically leave a vacuum there. I get that part of the deal is that we're, we're upset that because uh, uh, the courts developed this doctrine. That's, al that's always a problem for us, or at least some of us. But the, but the reality is what happened in the interim from the 70s when this court doctrine came out, and why is this going to be very different? Why we need to approach it very differently? Number one, we took the shackles off lawyer, um, am ambulance chasing lawyers. I mean, that's, we, we basically say, go out there and find lawsuits. You can't watch TV without getting inundated with law, uh, uh, opportunities to go to a lawyer for class action lawsuits. That's going to happen here. There will be endless pursuits of officers, uh, police officers, by trial lawyers. Second thing is, you've, you're creating an incentive here. People respond incentives, disincentives, and deterrence. And what you're doing, and the police officers that I've talked to in my jurisdiction, the chiefs I've talked to in my jurisdiction, and others around my state, they all say the same thing that has been said over and over here. We will not be able to recruit, train, and keep police officers, and they'll leave us. And that's what you're going to get if you don't uh, follow this amendment, support this amendment. That'll yield. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from uh, Maryland seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I, 
I believe that we've heard now, I think, four Republicans, according to uh, the, the statement of uh, Ms. Johnson from Louisiana, explain that they essentially support the essence of the legislation with respect to um, transforming the corrupt and perverse qualified immunity doctrine, but they're supporting an amendment to strip it from the bill, which is what I think the purpose is. So I'm not sure I follow that, but let me try to explain to those people out there who aren't familiar with qualified immunity why this is such a dangerous thing and why we need to move forward on uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So there were um, six cases that were just appealed to the, to the US Supreme Court, um, taking issue with the application of this qualified immunity doctrine. One came from Georgia, the 11th Circuit called Corbett versus Vickers. It's an amazing case where police officers pursued a criminal suspect into an unrelated family's backyard and there was a picnic going on at the time and there was an adult and six minor children outside. The officers ordered all of the people to the ground, the children and the adult, and when the family dog came bounding onto the scene, the police officers began to shoot at the dog and ended up hitting one of the kids, creating terrible physical, mental, and emotional uh, injuries. Um, and yet the 11th Circuit granted qualified immunity saying that there was no prior case law involving the exact unique facts of this case where officers shot at a dog and ended up hitting a child instead. Uh, one of the dissenting judges took issue with the whole thing and said that no competent officer would fire his weapon in the direction of a non-threatening pet while that pet was surrounded by children. And yet that family was left completely out in the cold and for some reason, our colleagues say, well, they don't really like the result, but we need more hearings. We need more discussion about it. How about this one? Uh, Baxter versus Bracey from Tennessee. Uh, another one involving a police dog against a suspect who had surrendered and was sitting on the ground with his hands up. Uh, there was a prior case that said it was unlawful to use a police dog without warning against an unarmed suspect laying on the ground with his hand down, hands at his sides. Um, the police dog attacked the person um, but the court said the police could not be held accountable because the prior case, uh, the hands were down on the suspect, and in this case, the hands were up. Case after case like this, uh, look at Jessup versus City of Fresno, yeah. the Ninth Circuit. Here, the police actually stole $225,000 while executing a search warrant as part of an illegal gambling raid. They seized $50,000. Um, they confiscated $151,000 in cash and another $125,000 in rare coins and stole the difference. But the court found there was no clearly established law holding that officers violate the 4th or 14th Amendment when they steal property seized pursuant to a warrant. What we're getting in these cases is the court saying the actions of the police were unconstitutional. They violated the Constitution, but the test is whether a reasonable officer would have known from a prior case whether or not their actions were unconstitutional. Now, imagine if that were the case when we prosecuted criminals in America. In other words, you could rob a bank if you had a red van and nobody ever robbed a bank with a red van before, you didn't know. It would, there was a blue van and there was a white van, but this was different. You could murder someone with a steak knife if nobody had ever been murdered with a steak knife before in that jurisdiction. I mean, come on, get real. And this is a totally fanciful, made up, fictionalized, court made doctrine. Let's get rid of it. It is a threat to the people of the United States of America. In America, those of us who aspire and attain to public office, whether it's elective office or a point of office, are nothing but the servants of the people. And the minute that we begin to act like we are the masters of the people, like we control them, that we lord over the people, that we are like kings and queens and monarchs and dictators, that is the moment to evict, eject, reject, start over again. This doctrine is corrupt. It does not belong in the United States of America. We don't need any more hearings about it, my friends, and I think you know that. And so why don't you just say you support at least this part of it. If there's something else in the bill you don't like, say you don't like it, but let's at least establish a record that we need to get rid of this perverse qualified immunity doctrine foisted on the people of the United States by judges.
And I, I'm recognizing Mr. Johnson. Would, 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 yeah, just yield for a moment. I yield. I happily I'm yield. thinking of the scripture that defines the civil authorities as agents of wrath to keep order. The, the Bible does not describe legislators as agents of wrath. Okay, there is an important distinction between the activities of law enforcement officers and other public officials, as you just said. Can you guys not acknowledge that? We know that it needs reform, my friend. But we're saying let's do it in a meaningful way where you don't throw the entire baby out with the bathwater because whether you recognize it or not as an elected official, law enforcement officers on the ground think this is absolutely essential to keep their departments manned and, and have employees there, period. And you don't have a response to that. You guys don't have a response to that. And that's the problem. Well, well first of all, we do have a response, which is if your conduct is reasonable, and if the department is training people reasonably, we're not gonna get in a situation like this. But if you look at what happened in the case of George Floyd with Officer Chauvin, any officer should have known that you don't squeeze the life out of someone by suffocating the them. The George Floyd case is unconscionable. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for the purpose of, an, of a UC request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I seek unanimous consent to enter upon the record this recently published article entitled Congress is Going to Have to Repeal Qualified Immunity by Eric Schnerer. Uh, and in one simple sentence, he says, qualified immunity has been perhaps the biggest little known barrier to rectifying constitutional violations through the justice system. It was published in The Atlantic only recently. Without objection, for what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank Mr. Buck for offering uh, this amendment. Um, as has already been mentioned, qualified immunity is a doctrine that was created by judges, which uh, generally shields government officials, including law enforcement officials, from liability unless their acts violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights. The idea behind it is to give, in this case, police officers, some leeway for certain actions that often involve split-second judgment and typically are made under extremely challenging circumstances. Uh, qualified immunity is clearly uh, no, it, you know, it's not a perfect doctrine. We're seeing by the debate here this afternoon that that's uh, certainly the case, that it's not perfect. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should completely remove it uh, as a defense for our police officers in this nation. Doing so uh, could well mean a police officer choosing between uh, neglecting his or her duties and therefore jeopardizing uh, the public safety um, or uh, risking being sued, which can be a big deal in anybody's life. Um, we should take the time to hold a hearing uh, or hearings on qualified immunity and bring in experts to testify, uh, hear all points of view, uh, then determine the best approach. We clearly haven't spent sufficient time here uh, to be knowledgeable enough to, to do something that is as significant as this relative to thousands and thousands of police officers who put their lives on the line for us every day all across uh, the country. Um, and at this time, I'd like to yield to Mr. Buck. I thank my friend from Ohio. Um, I, I want to focus on a point that Mr. Armstrong made earlier. Uh, many, many of us on this side of the aisle in particular, uh, and, and some uh, Democrats also, represent rural districts and police departments that have four, five, or six officers. These officers are underpaid and the departments are underfunded. <laughs> and this, this department will shut down or severely restrict small uh, departments in, in rural America. And, and it is a, a major concern I that, uh, that I hear from, from the small departments. Um, I also want to respond to something the chairman said. I, frankly, I don't think we are that far apart on this issue. And, and I agree with uh, the gentleman from, from Maryland. Um, I listen to the, those factual situations, and I find those ridiculous. And I, uh, I think that uh, you know, we can reform qualified and immu immunity in a way that uh, doesn't allow it to cover those situations, but does give officers, uh, good officers, that are making uh, tough choices uh, within the training and rules and regulations of their department coverage so that we don't have outlandish insurance uh, um, claims or uh, frivolous lawsuits or uh, putting officers at risk. And I think that's really what the departments are looking for is some protection so that their 
uh, that they can hire good officers and retain good officers. And I think we all agree. I'm not suggesting that my friends on the other side of the aisle don't uh, agree that we need, that one of the goals of this legislation while reforming uh, police activity is to make sure that we are also making our communities safer. And, and so I think that there are ways of reforming this. I think this is the one provision that, that causes many of us on this side of the aisle to uh, uh, look skeptically on this particular bill. And so I would, uh, I, would, I would ask my colleagues to join me in this amendment and then let's work on qualified immunity. It doesn't have to happen today. Uh, it doesn't happen to happen this month, but we can, we can fix qualified immunity in, in two or three months in a meaningful way that has an impact on, on policing in America. And I thank the gentleman for, for yielding, and I yield back to the gentleman from Ohio. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. For our purposes, the gentleman from Texas seek recognition. Last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate this amendment very much. Um, I had one to just illustrate, well, what's good for the goose is good for all the rest of the geese that would remove uh, immunity from all, uh, all federal officials, including members of Congress. But uh, it's clear that there's a strategy on the other side. We're voting down every amendment, no matter how good it may be. Um, and even my amendment <laughs> to strike two words or death was met with an objection. I don't know whether that was just mean-spirited or if it was an effort to shield uh, a vote without those words or death. It was made in good faith by me but obstructionist tactics to stop it. Um, so an amendment was prepared to eliminate those two words and bring it back, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, on the qualified immunity issue, as others have said, we don't know the full impact, but the people on the ground say they're not gonna be able to keep law officers. I've heard that personally from many law officers. So what will happen? Well, let me, yeah, tell you back when I, after I got here, I had a bill. I thought it would be a good idea to give immunity like I had as a judge. Uh, if, if I had not had immunity, judicial immunity, then I would have been tied up in court, you know, because people have a lot of time in good law libraries at some prisons. But uh, I had immunity and I thought, you know, when I was growing up in East Texas, small town, if you had a problem with a teacher, you didn't threaten to sue them. You went to the school board and got them fired. Why don't we give school teachers educational immunity so they don't have to worry about being fired? And I pitched that to some representatives of the National Education Union, and they said they couldn't support it. I could not understand. This would protect your members. And then I found out, oh, <laughs> there, this liability insurance they sell to their members is a huge cash cow for unions. So one effect of this would be a tremendous influx of money from law officers paying to their unions for some liability policy that the union endorses, and it would be a huge cash cow for, for law enforcement unions. That would be one effect. And we've already heard uh, from my friend, I believe from Georgia, it said, look, respond out superior would make the city liable, but police don't have deep pockets. Uh, it's hard to find somebody because they don't get paid that well. They should, but they most don't. So the overall effect would be to expose them to spending a lot of time being sued, answering anybody they tick off can file a suit. You don't even have to have a lawyer to do that although it would be good for the plaintiff's bar. You can have $50,000 settlements. You get enough of them, you can make a living. But good cops know who the bad cops are. Hear it all the time. And I'm sure those on the other side that worked in law enforcement or have family, you know, they know who the bad cops are. And if there's a racist in their force, they know it. And I wish we could work together to come up with a way to peer have peer reviews that would be important. But usually unions uh, negotiate against having peer reviews from what I understand, but there are things we could do to help the good cops mm -hmm. help us get rid of the bad cops. 
And I know of cases where unions have come in and defended whistleblowers who stood up against a, a, a bad boss, and that was helpful. But then they also come in and get bad cops reinstated. There are things here we need to do, but since we hadn't had, uh, this is the first chance we've had really to have the across the, uh, uh, the aisle discussions, we're not getting to have it, and the other side is gonna vote no on everything. So it, it is a shame, uh, but don't say our amendments would weaken your bill when we are serious and nothing's more serious than the death penalty or at least life in prison for lynching and giving a real good name to the Emmett Till, a, a, a real base for the Emmett Till um, law. Let's, let's come together. Let's work this out. There are bad cops. There are some racists. But let the good cops help us get rid of it. Don't get rid of qualified immunity till we know the effect. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. I'd be pleased to yield um, at the beginning to Mr. Cicilline, gentleman from Rhode Island. I, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. I just want to make a point that several of our colleagues have made the argument that qualified immunity doesn't apply if an officer has acted outside of their training. Um, but that's not the case. In fact, courts have held that violating training or policy is irrelevant to whether qualified immunity applies. And very recently, the Supreme Court applied qualified immunity where an officer shot and killed a person in a car chase despite being specifically instructed by his superior not to shoot. And then in that case, San Francisco versus Sheehan, the court said, even if an officer acts contrary to her training, that does not itself negate qualified immunity. So I just want my colleagues to be clear that that assertion that if you act pursuant to your training, qualified immunity doesn't apply is simply not the law of the land. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. The yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah, he's yielding back to me. Yes. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so very much. Uh, let, let me, um, you know, we, we've said the word good friends uh, here, but. Um, Mr. Gomez is a fellow Texan. He indicated um, about some examples of the judiciary and uh, indicated examples of teachers. And he, he makes a very valid uh, point in terms of um, putting yourself in a position that you wouldn't want to be sued. No one does. I, I thought about this. I think a lot of us have stayed up at night thinking about this journey that we're taking I think police officers, if I can recount uh, my history and survey of different professions, the only ones authorized to carry guns or to exercise deadly force. And I said at the beginning, I want police officers to go home to their families. And as I indicated, I want mothers to be able to receive their children wherever it may be back to their homes or dads in the face of Father's Day coming up. And I'd like qualified immunity to be seen not as a detriment to good policing, but a recognition that the civil rights of Americans have a right to be redressed and addressed. When we were in the midst of the civil rights battles, there are countless lives that were lost some under the pretense of law enforcement, and that was in a segregated, vicious, vile way of law enforcement through persons that none of us agree with, but people did lose their lives. And over that period of time, I don't believe one accounting or reckoning occurred. And so on the backdrop, we now have a circumstance where officers trained will steer away from the kind of misconduct that takes someone's life. But then you have taken their life and you have given the family nothing. You've given them no justice. You've given them no easing of their pain. Qualified immunity is not a despotic decision. It allows you to be in court. It allows the judge to say, I rule for the defendant. No, I rule for the plaintiff. It is the justice system that is crafted and built 
on the Constitution that we know started out by saying to form a more perfect union. And our task as the most powerful lawmaking body in the world when people are pleading and bleeding is to give that life to that document and give the power to state and local authorities, help attorney generals of states respond to their local issues to bring justice to families heretofore have received no justice. I use Trayvon Martin because someone is in the audience saying, that wasn't a police officer. You're absolutely right, Professor Raskin, but it was under color of law because they was running around saying he was a citizen patrol. Ahmed Arbery was not a police officer, but they were saying they were making a citizen's arrest. And the question is, if those individuals wouldn't have at least some framework of the violation of their civil rights, they're in a unique category, but their life has been lost. And then all others were in the manner of law enforcement of some kind. And you're suggesting to me that you have no faith in the courts? That's what qualified immunity is all about. So I the rise to oppose the, time the amendment the on the basis of my statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose is the gentleman from Pen uh, Pennsylvania seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. While we're debating the misguided idea of eliminating important liability protections for law enforcement, I think it's appropriate to remind members of this committee that internet, internet platforms like Google, Twitter, and Facebook enjoy liability protections of their own. Under CDA 230, these companies are protected from lawsuits in exchange for maintaining neutrality across their platforms. But in the last few weeks, both Twitter and Google have violated that neutrality to censor conservative views. If my Democrat colleagues are intent on eliminating liability protections for law enforcement, then surely they can look at liability protections, including those enjoyed by big tech companies. Yesterday, Google made the disturbing decision to censor conservative views. Google, which controls 70% of online advertising, threatened to remove Zero Hedge in the Federalist from their ad section, which would ultimately bankrupt those companies. And why did big tech threaten these news sites? Well, because these news sites had the audacity to permit individuals to express their own viewpoints in the comment sections. This is censorship, plain and simple. You're either a platform or you're a publisher. You can't be both. It's plain and simple. If Google or Twitter choose to stifle free, free speech, if they choose to ban particular viewpoints, then they should lose liability protections. Again, you're either a platform or you're a publisher. You cannot be both. So once again, while we're debating this misguided idea of removing important liability protections from law enforcement, I think it's also important that we continue these liability conversations in the coming weeks and months ahead when it comes to big tech. And with that, Mr. Will Chairman, the yield? Uh, I yield to my good friend and colleague from the great state of North Dakota. <laughs> Does that mean no? I, I oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to, I, the cases Mr. Cicilline cited are, I mean, true. And I do really encourage people to read on this because it's important. And I also agree with Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee that the courts usually get it right. And I agree with the chairman that it's a reasonableness standard. The problem with the reasonableness standard is, is it a question of fact for a jury? And I live in a world and reality where lawsuits are not always the best intended. And just to be clear, when it comes to civil rights violations with law enforcement, any detention of any person, 
any use of excessive force of any person is a civil rights violation. And so when you deal with these questions and you leave it to a reasonableness standard, by the time you get to the point is, is the point is whether it's a frivolous suit or not a frivolous suit, it's a question of fact for the jury. And in, when you are in small departments and you are dealing with these budgets, by the time you get to that point, that department and that insurance has already lost because there will either be a nuisance settlement or that regardless of what the merits of the case are, or they're hiring a lawyer. And I also think it's really important to recognize that when these cases come out in practice, the law enforcement officer in these, in these situations will not have a lawyer. The department and the insurance company will have a lawyer. In order for the law enforcement officer to have a lawyer, he is going to hire that lawyer himself if the department is covering that liability insurance. All that being said, if we get to a point where we have to choose between um, having qualified immunity as it stands now or having none of it, I probably end up going with getting rid of it. But I don't think we're there yet. And I think we should have this conversation because I think in our quest to solve some of these problems in large urban areas, we are gonna put really significant, and not just, I, I just represent a rural district. I'm sure people who represent urban areas hear the same thing. We are gonna have a serious, serious problem because we hear it all the time. And it's not because we're trying to protect bad cops. We're trying to protect small departments. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, I hope we can continue to work on this. I support the amendment and I yield to my friend from Louisiana. With 20 seconds, I would say part of that conversation needs to be with our colleagues who have actually been SWAT officers and served on the thin blue line like Clay Higgins of Louisiana, our good friend who I talked to last night. And he said, on this qualified immunity issue, what you're gonna have is good cops, good people of good faith, who are gonna be deterred in the performance of their duties because they're concerned about exactly what was just articulated there. That This will make our communities less safe, and that is the problem. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no, no, the no's have it. A record vote is, re is requested. The clerk will call the roll. No. <clears throat> Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Aye. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Collins? Aye. Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? Aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock votes no. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Aye. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Is that, has everyone voted who wishes to vote? 
Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The committee will stand in recess for 15 minutes.
Yeah. The committee will reconvene. I'll begin by recognizing myself to strike the last word. I would like to respond to the assertion that we have not been willing to work with the minority on this important legislation. Allow me to set the record straight on where we are and how we got here. We introduced the Comprehensive Policing Reform Bill 10 days ago. We explained to our colleagues in the minority that we had, in, that we had initiated the process by developing comprehensive legislation with Senators Booker and Harris, as well as with members of our caucus. We also explained the importance of moving quickly, given the moment we were in as a nation. Since that time, we have indicated to the minority that if they are interested in developing legislation that they could support, we needed to understand how they wanted to change the bill and whether those changes would lead them to support the bill. Chair Bass, has reached out to the minority leader and to Senator Scott, and we, have reached, and we have reached out to the minority over the course of the last 10 days. We held a hearing one week ago to which the minority invited three witnesses. The minority did not share a single amendment with us before today's markup, and we still have not seen any of their remaining amendments. The minority has refused our offer to review and work with them on specific amendments they offered that we indicated we could support if we had the opportunity to review and discuss before we go to the floor. That is their right, of course. But in my experience, if a member would like the majority to support all or any amendments, they would ordinarily share the text with us in advance. That has not happened here. Having said that, Chair Bass and I and the others on our side of the aisle remain open to a full and frank discussion with the minority about their possible support of this legislation. This could happen before we go to the floor next week, or it could happen in discussions with the Senate, either before or after they take up legislation on the floor. But when we are able to have these discussions, we would insist that any final bill be meaningful, comprehensive, and transformative. George Floyd and the countless victims of police violence deserve no less. Are there any other amendments to the amendment to the nature of a substitute? 
For what purpose is Ms. Lesko seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Ms. Lesko. Add the, at the end of the bill the following. Uh, the gentlelady is recognized in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I think this is so important that we come to a resolution to help solve uh, this problem and to help heal our nation. I think every single one of us um, is concerned about what has happened and the riots and the looting and we just need to heal our nation. Um, and that's why I've stated before that I support elements of the underlying bill. But after speaking to law enforcement and a variety of different law enforcement officers with varying backgrounds, they have told me that other elements of this bill would undermine their ability to keep our community safe, and that's why I have to oppose the bill overall. Um, I, I also support President Trump's executive order. It called for more training, certification. It called for building a partnership with nonprofit organizations, social workers, so that law enforcement and police can go out together uh, to deal with homelessness, mental health issues, and substance abuse. And it also talked about a shared database so we can address police officers that have abused their power. Um, I also support Senator Scott's bill of what I've seen of it. And I do have an amendment that I think is also applicable. And this amendment, I will read it, says a unit of local government may not receive a grant under the COPS grant program or the Brine grant program. And both of these are used for community policing and law enforcement grants. If the unit of law uh, local government permitted during the previous fiscal year, the operation of an autonomous zone in its jurisdiction. Colleagues, nine days ago now, in a Democrat-led city and state, they allowed extremists to take over a portion of Seattle and take over a police precinct. Many call it the autonomous police-free zone. Now, I watched the media report by the Seattle police chief. It was not on Fox News, it was on a different media station. And quote, this is what the Seattle police chief stated, that rapes, robberies, and all sorts of violent acts have been occurring in the area and we're not able to get to them. I just believe it is totally outrageous that we are allowing these people to take over part of a city and a police precinct and then have the law enforcement be, have a hard time getting in to deal with problems within this area. And so if cities are going to allow people to take over portions of their city into autonomous police-free zones, certainly these cities should not be receiving federal grants that are supposed to be used for community policing and law enforcement. And with that, I ask for your support for this amendment. Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentlelady from Washington in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like we are on ducks. I don't know how many times we're gonna raise Seattle and a six block area. I am so proud to represent this district. Uh, the area that we're talking about is just a few miles from where I sit right now. And uh, there is no takeover. There is no takeover. This is a six block area that in fact has since shrunk a little bit because there have been ongoing discussions with the peaceful protesters there and the police department about how to make sure emergency vehicles can get through and various things like that. 
What is outrageous is that, that my colleague refers to my constituents, and there are thousands of them, come through that area every day as these people. What is outrageous is that my colleagues continue to spread falsehoods about my district. Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin and other local leaders have been in close discussion with the peaceful protesters and uh, following the decision on June 8th to have this particular area. I again invite people to come and see the area. I know that there are several rumors. Um, I already put forward for the record Chief Best, Carmen, uh, Carmen Best, our civil police chief's uh, statements that her remarks have been taken out of context um, and it seems to not matter. And I find that troubling, Mr. Chairman, that uh, these lies and falsehoods would continue to be told again and again and again. When we, I have submitted for the record my own police chief's statement about those comments not applying to that six block area. According to very credible news reports and our own citing of, of the area, the reality is that these are uh, rumors that are being amplified by right-wing cable pundits and encouraging people to think that protesters are extorting businesses, um, engaging in other lawless behavior. Nothing could be further from the truth. The, the uh, protesters have been engaging in such terrible lawless activities, such as screening movies, holding public forums on social justice, and organizing poetry readings. In fact, at a news conference held last Friday, the chief of police again said that there were no formal reports of businesses being extorted by protesters. Another lie that is being perpetrated and spread by uh, right-wing media, but also by my co my colleagues on this committee. And frankly, I'm I, I, I'm I'm somewhat astounded that this continues to be the conversation. Unlike President Trump, who was threatened on Twitter to, quote, take back the neighborhood by force and condone the use of tear gas on peace protesters just so he could cross the street for a Seattle, but for a photo op, Seattle's local leaders are focused on de-escalation and not on confrontation with the protesters. So please do not mischaracterize what is happening in Seattle. This block area is perfectly peaceful. Do not allow yourselves to be cheapened with these ridiculous amendments. And again, I'm reminded of the old adage that when you don't like the answer, the only option is to change the question. Stop changing the question. The question that is before us is how we address the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others, and how we bring about a transformation in policing that allows for black Americans to be safe and to bring about accountability for police officers. I invite Ms. Lesko and any other member of this committee to come out and watch some movies with us in this autonomous zone, have some fun with the protesters who are really building community and demanding that we actually address this. That's what we should be focused on here. And I can assure you, Seattle continues to be uh, a, a place of peaceful protest. And um, I'm frankly proud of our city for de-escalating in response to all of the calls. I don't think it started that way, but I think our leaders have now started to see that the whole point here is that we need a different response than a military response. And that is what the autonomous zone has been about. Um, it is a peaceful protest zone. And I would encourage my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to stop their continuing falsehoods about my district. I don't think you would like it if I said these things about your district. Stop saying it about mine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The, the gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Move the strike last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you. Um, the poetry readers took over a police precinct. And, and I want to thank the gentlelady from uh, Arizona for offering uh, her amendment. Uh, as well as being a member of, of this committee and the ranking member of the Small Business Committee, I'm also on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And in the Foreign Affairs Committee, I can tell you that it's been a uh, centerpiece of American foreign policy for a long time to encourage rule of law to other countries all across 
uh, the globe, particularly in, in, in the uh, developing world, but all over the globe. That's what we stand for, um, rule of law, which means that we have certain ways that we elect people and they uh, enact legislation for us. We have leaders, mayors, members of council that are supposed to oversee uh, the police departments and civilian control and all the rest and fundamental rights and property protections are all part of rule of law that we encourage all across uh, the globe. And then there's Seattle. In, instead of rule of law, there was mob rule a police precinct and a considerable portion of an American city has been taken over by a group of people no one is elected who have no legal standing to do what they've done. The anarchists leading this insurrection have presumptuously renamed uh, the area that they've illegally seized. Um, whatever these insurgents call themselves, they're breaking uh, the laws of their city and their state uh, with impunity. Um, the city and state of Washington um, have essentially surrendered to the mob and allowed rule of law, which we've promoted across the globe, uh, to become a, a joke, at least in this once great American city. The mob has their demands, they always do, and they could be right out of Bernie Sanders or the radical left's playbook which has now mostly been adopted by the once great Democratic Party. They're demanding, not asking, but demanding to abolish the police department, abolish the courts, abolish ICE, no more jails. Um, all prisoners can vote. Not sure how they'll do that if there are no more jails. Free college, free health care, rent control, you name it. Most of the occupiers' demands are pretty much uh, standard left-wing stuff nowadays. Uh, some of the stuff is just nuts. The business about abolishing police departments, uh, abolishing the courts, other things, let's face it, sound nice, uh, free college, free health care, free you name it. Um, it. It, you know, let's face it, none of this is free because the taxpayers pay for it. Um, the taxpayers always foot the bill. Uh, the concern, of course, is that this uh, sort of mob rule could spread to other uh, cities all across America. This amendment would go a long way uh, to ensuring that goodwill and common sense prevail, and yes, rule of law. So I commend the gentlelady from Arizona uh, for, her, for offering her amendment. And this is gentleman, and I'll now yield uh, to the ranking member. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, the, the gentlelady from Washington said that we should stop talking about her district. Uh, we wouldn't want anyone talking about our district. There's no other autonomous zone in the country. There are 435 members of Congress. There's only one district where there's this Chaz zone that the gentlelady described as peaceful, a uh, peaceful protest zone, autonomous zone, where they watch movies, they plant gardens, and they read poetry. <laughs> the only thing that the only thing that doesn't talk about is the fact. The police had to retreat. The precinct building is now controlled by who knows who, but it's not controlled by the police. So that is the concern here. That is what this is about, and that's why we support the gentlelady from Arizona's amendment. And if I'd yield back to the gentleman, but I know we have another member who'd like to speak. Yeah, I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Thank you uh, for yielding. And Mr. Chairman, there seems to be a good amount of dispute as to what life is like in the Chaz. The gentlelady from Washington says it's like a peaceful poetry community garden, and yet we see these um, reports of rapes and delayed response time. Uh, we see videos of people assaulting each other and demanding race-based payments. And so uh, I would just ask the chairman, would you be willing to host a CODEL, a congressional delegation, <laughs> in the Chaz so that we might all be able to go there and, and uh, show the country what's happening, observe it in real time, and then if uh, the Chaz is something that the majority would like to have spread across the country, perhaps you can make that case in vivid color, but I'll yield to the chairman to answer whether or not he'd be willing to lead the code L to the Chaz. Time to, the, time, the time of the gentleman has expired. Yep. For what purpose does uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman, gentleman is uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I rise in opposition to the amendment for a couple of reasons. First of all, I thank the gentlelady from Washington for sharing with the committee what's actually happening in her own district. And this protest, you know, is part of peaceful protests all across America. 
and protesting and demanding change is as American as it gets. And what's particularly troubling about this amendment is, if you look at the definition of autonomous zone, it says it means a zone in a unit of local government that is autonomous from the government or the authority of the jurisdiction in which it exists. That's a legal impossibility. A person or group of persons cannot declare that a part of a city is not subject to the jurisdiction of that city. And so what in fact we have here is a city government managing a peaceful protest by creating a place where people are going to create an opportunity for their voices to be heard. That's what local government does. But your definition does not exist as a matter of law. No group of citizens can declare themselves not a legal part of the authority of the jurisdiction in which they exist. And worse than that, your amendment says, it's up to the Attorney General of the United States. So he can just decide, I think that's an autonomous zone, and deny federal funding. This is fraught with extraordinary problems. It undermines the ability of people in this country to peacefully assemble. And what's shocking to me, to be very frank, is that in the middle of the biggest protest maybe in our lifetimes, thousands and thousands of people across this country demanding change, that, that my Republican colleagues would spend time not focused on the important police reforms in this bill, but again, an effort to both mischaracterize and distract. And by the way, the protests of the people of this country are an important reason we're here today, because they're demanding change. And they're not going to tolerate the failure of the Congress of the United States to respond to this moment. So I know protests might make some folks uncomfortable, but it's causing action to finally be taken. And with that, I yield my, the remainder of my time to the gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Cicilline. Um, I just again want to say, I, I don't know how to keep telling people that what they're saying are lies. And I am stunned that people continue to do that. Um, Mr. Shabbat and others have said that the Seattle Police Department East Precinct was taken over by protesters. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. One, uh, an on the ground commander did not follow the command of the police chief and decided to retreat. Nobody has taken over that building. There's no protesters inside. There's nobody blocking the ability of the Seattle police to come back. The Seattle Police Department and the mayor are in close touch with the, with the protesters there. And as Mr. Cicilline said, they're managing a protest in a way that is completely peaceful. So please do not continue to say these things. And Mr. Gates is citing Fox News. Fox News has admitted to posting pictures that were manipulated, digitally manipulated. Will the gentlelady Fox yield? Fox News has, uh, has I, I, actually uh, thank continued you. to... The, the Fox News has continued to post information that is incorrect, including scenes well, let's go. in the city that are not Seattle. So please stop this nonsense and let's get back to the bill that's at hand. I yield back. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike last word. Gentleman is recognized. Just want to respond to a couple of things we've heard here, and I, I, I appreciate um, Ms. Jayapal. Uh, she's a friend, and, and look, I trust her eyewitness account, but we're, we're not seeing just doctored pictures of this. There's a lot of film of this on other channels other than Fox News, and believe it or not to our colleagues, we do watch other channels on occasion, and I've seen this on CNN and even MSNBC News, that what, the things that are going on there, there's graffiti everywhere. It looks to the average American like lawlessness because that's what it is. To my friend, Mr. Cicilline, in the other peaceful protests around the country, they are not self-describing as law enforcement free micro states. That's how Chaz, the, the, the organizers there, describe themselves. Law enforcement free micro states within a, un a state in, in this country. That is the definition of anarchy. Law enforcement free is without the rule of law. There's no other definition that fits this. And so it's sort of comical that you guys say we're misportraying this. Everybody can see this with their own eyes. Here's the question, and this is a serious question. Is it okay if they refuse to abide by the law, or specifically in our case, the federal law, should they be entitled to federal funds? Should, should they have water and sewer? Uh, should they have Wi-Fi and cell service? Should they have police protection? I mean, you, you, it's claimed that that's around the perimeter of this thing, but what about inside of it? The, the Lesko Amendment is, is a very serious one. It's directly uh, relevant to what we're doing. It's certainly germane. It's a simple amendment that restricts funding under community-oriented policing services, or COPS, 
and burn grant uh, funding programs through the Department of Justice for localities that refuse to enforce the law and allow for autonomous territories to be established on U.S. soil. This is unprecedented because it's absolutely crazy. And you can call it an arts festival or whatever, you're, whatever it is, but the people inside there are ignoring the law. It is not lawful to go around and paint a police station with graffiti, okay? We don't tolerate that anywhere else in the country. Why? Because we're a nation of laws, not of men, as John Adams famously described us. And if we abandon that, we abandon who we are as a people. We, th this is a republic it, it, with democratic principles, and, and in a constitutional republic, you have to have the rule of law. This is government of, by, and for the people. The police are an extension of the people. They <coughs> get to apply the law in every area of every city. That's who we are in this country. There may be other places on the globe where you can engage in this kind of anarchy, but it's not in America. And if they're not going to play the, by the rules, and, 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 and abide by the law, then they should not be able to get federal funds to that jurisdiction. And this, that's a very meaningful amendment. And why it's reasonable and important for us to discuss here is because we're dealing with limited federal funds. There's not a lot of community-oriented policing services funding. And, and the, the burn uh, JAG funding, the grants, is, is, is limited. Our, our law enforcement agencies that do are trying to enforce the law need it desperately. We hear about it all the time. So if, if there's some of these jurisdictions that would go, want to go down this road, they should yield their funding to those who will use and apply it lawfully and appropriately. And that's why we support this amendment, and that's why this is an, a, an important debate. And, and uh, I think it's wrong for you guys to dismiss it. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's recognized. <clears throat> um, this is obviously the, another in... Uh, uh, a string of uh, distractions from the matter at hand, but I'm glad to see our colleague from Seattle who looks like um, she has survived this outbreak of community gardens and block parties and movie nights uh, in, uh, in her district. Um, I just, I wanted to add a few points to what the gentleman from Rhode Island was saying about the curious language in which this amendment is offered to us. Um, for one thing, I, I would think that the Attorney General, who's basically made a, a monarch out of this, um, would be the first to say it's unconstitutional. It says, a determination under subsection shall be, A, shall be made in the sole and unreviewable discretion of the Attorney General. I thought the Attorney General believed in the unitary executive theory, which is that everything that takes place in the executive branch is directly under the command and control of the President of the United States. So this would seem to be a usurpation of the president's powers by the attorney general. Um, but I'm also curious about the massively broad language of the definition of an autonomous zone, which is perfectly circular. Um, an autonomous zone means a zone in a unit of local government that is autonomous from the government or authority of the jurisdiction. Uh, on that theory, I think that Attorney General Barr could determine that lots of municipalities Thank in you. Uh, the Move state of Maryland could be um, termed well, autonomous because, because they are given home rule under the counties in which they exist. So uh, there are lots of cities and towns uh, that exist in, in my state that operate autonomously from the county in which protesters. they exist for different purposes. And so, um, look, if we want to get serious about the problem of lawlessness breaking out in the I'm, United I'm, States I'm sorry, America, Mr. Chairman, can you toll his time so that we can hear Mr. Raskin? I'm having a hard time with whatever's coming through. I'm just understanding Mr. Raskin. Thank, thank you, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, look, um, America's gone through this before in periods of great social stress. Um, and, and everybody sees lawlessness somewhere else. So I'm actually not afraid of the lawlessness breaking out in Seattle. I think that the Seattle authorities seem to be perfectly on top of it. I'll tell you what kind of lawlessness I'm actually afraid of. I'm afraid of what took place between Attorney General Bill Barr and President Trump when they assembled a secret paramilitary force of unidentified federal officers, largely from the Bureau of Prisons, as we understand also from the Park Police, other federal agencies, unnamed, still unidentified, and they unleashed that force 
with tear gas, with pepper spray, and rubber bullets on hundreds of American citizens who were exercising their rights under the First Amendment, including a lot of my constituents who were knocked over and pushed down by this force that was unleashed by the Attorney General. There are six rights contained in the First Amendment, and they violated every single one of those rights, at least five of the six and arguably the six too. The right to peacefully assemble was trampled by that force they put together. The right to petition government for redress of grievances, which is why those people came to Washington, D.C. to speak to Congress about the urgent need for sweeping police reform, precisely the legislation we've come together to talk about today. The freedom of speech, obviously. The freedom of press, as reporters were trampled and their cameras taken out of their hands by them and pushed to the side. And you can read the reportage of the journalists who got caught up in Bill Barr and Donald Trump's police riot that they unleashed on the streets of Washington, D.C. The free exercise of religion as the president decided to barge into the St. John's Episcopal Church, prompting rebukes not just from the Episcopal Bishop of Washington, D.C., but the Catholic Bishop of Washington, D.C., and then no establishment of religion as the president took someone else's Bible, turned it upside down, and waved it over his head, essentially converting his own endless lust for power into an idol above the Lord of the Bible. You could say that he violated the First Amendment rights of all those people so he could cross the street and violate the First Commandment. That's what they did. Now there, I do see a lot of lawlessness, and would I trust that Attorney General who organized that spectacle and assault on the civil rights and civil liberties of the people to decide where money's gonna go in terms of state and local governments? No, not me. I'm not gonna vote against this. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Dakota seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as somebody who had an 11-month protest in my district that was drastically misrepresented by the media for all of those 11 months, uh, I guess I can sympathize with the representative from Washington other than she spoke on that very protest on the floor of the U.S. House. So uh, with that, I'll yield to my friend from Arizona. Mr. Chairman, quickly, make a point of order. Mr. Chairman, over here. Ladies, point of order. Uh, members attending remotely um, seem not to be complying consistently with the new House rules under Regulation A2. It says, quote, members participating remotely in a committee proceeding must continue to use the software's video function, and we've been instructed of that multiple times, yeah. and, and it's, it's difficult when you can't see all your colleagues. It's been intermittent throughout the day, and just wonder if you could remind everybody of that. The uh, point of order is not well taken. Members are participating in the hearing if they're visible. If they're not visible, they're not participating. That's not what the rule Mr. says. Mr. Chairman? That's not what the rule says. That's said. what the rule says. Mr. Chairman? The, uh, gentle Mr. Chairman? Lady, the gentle lady will continue. I have a point of order to make. The gentle lady will continue. Thank you, Mr. The, Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. The point of order is there are members who are not wearing masks in the room. That point of order is well taken. Oh, of course. <laughs> that point of order is well taken. Members will put on. Yeah, their, it was made by a Democrat. That's not a House members rule, members Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this is a rule, and the Rules Committee members, has said that the video has to be on. Yeah. Members will put on their we, masks. We voted on that last one, right? The we voted on members that. will put Unlike on their masks. Unlike the first one, which actually not, passed the House. not for obeying the rules. We actually just passed. That Let's the become an autonomous is, committee. The gentleman is not ready. Is, will suspend. Gentlemen, members will put on their masks if not just to follow the House rules uh, in consideration of not uh, bringing physical danger to their colleagues and to everyone else in the room. The uh, gentlelady will proceed. The gentlelady will proceed. The gentlelady will proceed. The gentlelady will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady um, will proceed. If nothing else, I think this amendment points out the stark contrast between what uh, we believe here uh, when we have, I, I can tell you what, my constituents do not believe that taking over part of a city is like peaceful protests and taking over a police precinct is part of a peaceful protest. And if it's just this love and, you know, theaters and stuff, why are there fences around it? I mean, 
Why not let everybody in? Why have a fence? Why have armed people questioning people coming in? I mean, this is ridiculous. Really, now we're going to say that people taking over a city is just totally fine? I, I, I guess in one way I am, I'm sad, in another way I guess it's good that we're pointing out what a difference there is between what we believe in. Mm -hmm. I mean, constituents of my district think it's totally nuts. And so, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Liu. I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chair. The gentleman is recognized. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are here today because our government has murdered black Americans repeatedly. Now, are we concerned about civilian left-wing groups and right-wing groups? Sure. Is there an issue of possible uh, censorship by social media platforms? Maybe. Is there an issue related to protesters in Seattle? Sure. But that has nothing to do with police killing black Americans. And I just want to bring up something that Congressman Cedric Richmond said. It is offensive to many of us when my Republican colleagues bring up random issues that have nothing to do with how we control our government from killing black Americans. And I just want y'all to understand that I will never understand what it's like to be a black American. I can imagine what it might be like, but I will never fully understand. I do know what it's like to be an Asian American though I know that when the President of the United States says Chinese virus and causes hate crime to spike across America, that affects me. It's caused me to tell my parents not to go outside for fear of being harassed. When an Asian American family in Texas gets stabbed because people think they're spreading coronavirus, that's very disturbing. But the difference is I don't fear for my life from the police and my children do not either. I don't have to have that talk with my kids. Black Americans do. They fear for their lives from the police because the police have systematically killed many of them. In fact, just today, charges were brought against the two officers in Atlanta that shot a black American running away from them, who was sleeping in his car. There was an initial offense. So I want my Republican colleagues to understand why it's offensive when at this hearing about the killing of black Americans by our government, you're talking about freaking Michael Flynn and you're talking about Google and Twitter, and you're talking about protests in Seattle, things that have nothing to do with our government murdering black Americans. It is offensive when you bring up these random issues. It shows that you don't get the problem. I want you to have some humility and understand why many of us minorities get offended by your tactics and just stop with your random amendments and random comments about issues that have nothing to do with what has captured the imagination of American people, why we have all these protests, which is police murdering black Americans. We're here to solve that. And if you don't want to solve it with us, stop with the distractions. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I want to announce that uh, in accordance with what I said this morning, uh, the attending physician of the House has said that it is imperative for the health and safety of people in this room that, uh, members wear, that members wear masks. I would greatly prefer that all present simply uphold the decorum of the committee by complying with reasonable safety standards that are recommended by the attending physician and are respectful of all the occupants of this room. I have been greatly lenient today. However, I will tell you now that anyone who is not wearing a mask will not be recognized to speak, period. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. The Ms. Escobar Mr. is next. Chairman. Ms. Escobar was next. Mr. Chairman, a point of parliamentary. Ms. Inquiry. Escobar is recognized. Mr. Ms. Thank Escobar. You, Mr. Mr. Clintock has tried repeatedly to make his point. Repeatedly. Ms. Escobar has the time. Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Chairman. No, no, it's our side. You just had a Democrat speak. It's our Ms. turn. Ms. Escobar has the time. 
Ms. Escobar. No, she doesn't. Ms. Escobar has the time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ms. Escobar has the time. I think Mr. Lou, Mr. Lou just spoke. Yeah, it's it's the Republicans' list. turn, and Mr. McClintock has tried now for several minutes to be recognized on a point of order. There's no point of order, but uh, who seeks recognition to speak? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I seek recognition for a point of parliamentary inquiry. This gentleman will state his point of parliamentary inquiry. I would like the chairman to cite the House rule requiring members to wear masks uh, in House proceedings. If we had such a vote, I don't recall it. If we have such a vote, I will vote against it, but I will be happy to abide by it uh, if the House so decides. Until then, uh, uh, I would like you to cite me that rule, since I obviously the missed that vote. The chair's authority to enforce the preservation of order and decorum during committee proceedings derives from the speaker's enforcement authority under clause two of rule one. Pursuant to clause one of rule 11, the rules of the house are the rules of its committees and the subcommittees so far as applicable. Committee chairs have long been responsible for the enforcement of general decorum in the respective committees. And I am Mr. enforcing- Mr. Chairman, de this has nothing to do with- Oh yes, decorum. it does. And I'm enforcing general decorum. Decorum means, among other things, the safety of, of, the member, of the members of the committee. All right. Well, then, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. You choose to wear a mask, sir. I do not. Uh, I ask you to respect my choice as I respect yours. It is not uh, your choice I, to obey the decorum Mr. Chairman, of the House. I don't yield my time. I consider masks much more effective at spreading panic and much less effective at stopping a virus for, the, for anyone who's under 50 and healthy is less severe than the flu. The chair has recommended wearing masks when we are not, pardon me, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, the chair has recommended wearing masks when we are not speaking, but that they are not necessary when we are speaking. Oddly, we are told by health experts that masks are most recommended while speaking, which leads me to believe that there is more virtue signaling than virtue in all of this. The uh, attending physician of the House. This is crazy. The attending physician of the House has made the decision on what is safe, and we are, and it is therefore the prerogative of the speaker and and through the speaker of the committee chairman to enforce decorum, which means enforcing safety, as defined by the attending physician. And I am doing that, and members who do not wear masks will not be recognized. That is the least that I can do. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Um, Mr. Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Um, and before I begin my comments, I just have to say how stunning it is that there are so many of our colleagues who have such little regard for our safety and for our health and who are willing to put their colleagues at such risk. Um, it really is a stunning and unfortunate statement that they're making. Um, but to the point that I would like to make, I want to tell my colleague, Representative Jayapal, that I absolutely feel your pain. I am so sympathetic to what you are going through as you hear your community maligned. Communities like mine on the southern border have long been maligned by our Republican colleagues, and we've been on their target list for hyperbole. I think what is clear here is that they have this desperate need for a boogeyman, whether it's the southern border, whether it's Seattle, there's always a community or people who they target in order to create fear. It's a way to divide us. It's a way to incite fear of fellow Americans. And it's a way to distract from the real challenges that we face. And frankly, it's tragic. It's tragic that we have seen blood spilled. We've seen people shot. We've seen people suffocated by law enforcement officers who were supposed to protect their communities. And the majority of the people who are dying at the hands of law enforcement are our black and brown brothers and sisters. It's tragic that at a hearing intended to seek justice and reform, they turn it into an attempt to distract from the challenge at hand. 
More than eight hours into this hearing, and we're still debating amendments that have nothing to do with George Floyd's death and the American civil rights movement that demands change from us. I want to say something to the public watching at home. Listen to their amendments. Listen to what they've chosen to debate. Listen to their effort to distract. Don't forget what they've chosen to focus on when you cried out for change. I'd, I'd now like to yield to my colleague, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you to my colleague. Uh, I'll take just a moment. It is dismaying. It's utterly dismaying, the, the willful ignorance as to the science in terms of the use of masks to protect yourself and to protect others. Uh, we do have a right to not wear a mask, but you don't have a right to then expose others. So why don't you do this by way of video? As to what my colleague, Professor Raskin, just argued, I was thinking the very same thing. This is a stunningly inappropriate amendment. Number one, it is not your district. You do not know what's going on on the ground there. And we have good testimony from the representative of that district that you are misrepresenting what's going on. If the minority party is so concerned with the takeover of six blocks for peaceful protesters in Seattle, where were you, where are you now with what the president did in Lafayette Square, aided by the attorney general, using other members of his administration as props, along with a borrowed Bible? to try to get an iconic photo op. Where were you with that illegal action on the behalf of our president? Interrupting with police officers and military, with rubber bullets and tear gas, the very thing that this country stands for, the ability to express by way of peaceful protest in, of all places, Lafayette Square. It reminds me of a Bible verse that I had a hard time really understanding or maybe accepting. It's Matthew 7. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own? With that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I would just close with this. Shame on those not to rise to this moment. Gentlelady yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. The no's have it. Mr. Chair, I call for a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? No. Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No, no, a thousand times no. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? 
Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Yes. Ms. Roby votes no. Mr. Gates? Aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Ms. Bass? No. Ms. Bass votes no. Ms. DeLue? Ms. McCarsell Powell? No for me, Chairman. Ms. McCarsell Powell votes no. Are there any members who wish to vote who haven't voted? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 12 ayes and 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? I have an amendment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Stubbe of Florida, strike section 362 and redesignate provisions accordingly. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk today about the fact that this bill is in reaction, at reaction to George Floyd's death. And Ms. Escobar just was talking about the fact that the amendments that have been previously offered has nothing to do with George Floyd's death and uh, they should be ignored for that fact. Well, in the bill before us today, there is a ban on no-knock warrants in drug cases. It's my understanding that Mr. Floyd was uh, being arrested for a forgery situation, nothing to do with a drug case. It wasn't an execution of a drug warrant, has absolutely nothing to do with the death of George Floyd. So this amendment would strike section 362 of the bill. Let me just put out a little bit of common sense. If you're a drug dealer and you have drugs and a law enforcement officer has gone through the effort of getting a probable cause affidavit, goes before a judge, has probable cause to execute a warrant on a drug dealer who has drugs, what do you think that the drug dealer is gonna do with those drugs if you're required to knock before the law enforcement officer enters? The drugs aren't gonna be there anymore because they're gonna be flushed down the toilet. Let me just give you a quick illustration. And for my colleagues that are from Florida, I think this would be even more poignant to you, uh, especially on the other side of the aisle. This was May 3rd, 2019. Florida, and I'll ask later for this to be unanimous consent to be put in the, in the uh, record. Florida drug bus nets enough fentanyl to kill 500,000 people. Coco, Florida, a six month Brevard investigation resulted in the seizure of three pounds of lethal fentanyl, 75 firearms, and arrests of 60 people or more. The Attorney General Ashley Moody said that opioids are killing 17 people a day in Florida. 500,000 people could have died for the amount of fentanyl that was seized. That amount of fentanyl was three pounds. Just a little tiny piece of fentanyl on your pinky finger can kill you. I just did a little simple math. Three pounds equals 48 ounces. I just happened to have two Yetis in my office that I frequently have in the Judiciary Committee meetings. These are 30 ounces a piece. 30 ounces a piece. 48 ounces of fentanyl would kill 500,000 people. This could hold 60 ounces. This should kill more than 500,000 people. If you're the fentanyl dealer in Florida, and the law enforcement agency is required to knock on your door before they execute that warrant, what do you think is going to happen with two Yeti fulls of fentanyl that can kill over 500,000 people? It's going to be dumped in the toilet before law enforcement gets in there and executes that warrant on people that are killing 
thousands and thousands of people in Florida. Opioid overdoses in Florida in 2018 was 3,727 dead. In, 27, in 2017, it was 4,280 people died of overdoses from opioid and fentanyl-related drug addictions and drug abuse. This officer was able to execute these warrants and arrest over 100 different people who are killing Floridians every single day in our streets. If we ban no-knock warrants in drug cases, the moment that law enforcement officer knocks on the fentanyl dealer's door, the heroin dealer's door that's splicing fentanyl and killing Floridians, the amount of fentanyl is going to be dumped in the sink, in the toilet, and flushed, and you're not going to be able to perpetuate an arrest because none of the drugs are going to be present at the house that they just executed that search warrant on. And I would contend I don't know what this has to do with the George Floyd case if we're here to provide justice for him. So I would contend that we take the ban on no-knock warrants out. And there's actually a quick little solve of some of the problem. I even had a colleague in my side of the aisle that has a problem with no-knocks. I talked to my father who's a former sheriff and they have a solution for that. So in the case where, so we don't hit the wrong house, they have a policy in place that the drug officer and the undercover officer goes with the person executing the search warrant to ensure that they're hitting the right house. Let's put that in the bill. Let's make sure that when the SWAT team, which typically is the one that executes search warrants, knows through the drug undercover officers exactly who it is and which house it is. So you could put that in this bill and then still be taking people off the streets that could possibly kill 500,000 Floridians in my state to the tune of 17 people a day. So I'm willing to work with you on that, but I'm not willing to ban no-knock warrant executions in the state of Florida. And for that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? Move to strike the last one. The gentlelady's recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And while I appreciate the words of my colleague from Florida and certainly uh, applaud his father Amen. and the years of work that he did to keep our state safe. Amen. As a police chief, okay. I have managed numerous high-risk operations, and I know how extremely high-risk and dangerous serving search warrants can be, but particularly no not warrants. As I'm sure Mr. Uh, Stuby, my colleague from Florida knows, uh, high-risk search warrants, no not search warrants are the highest of risk. And while I applaud the deputies and officers who serve on our SWAT teams, they have a tremendous job to do. Our primary responsibility is to make sure that we not only keep our officers and our deputies safe, but that we protect the public. Uh, as a former police chief, I was always concerned every time my SWAT team went out to serve a no-knock warrant. We know the mistakes have been made, and I heard your recommendation about sending a drug officer out. Uh, I do appreciate that as well. But Brianna Taylor lost her life. And I know I've witnessed people disposing of drugs and flushing dr drugs down the toilet when they knew the police had them surrounded. But Mr. Chairman, there are no amount of drugs that are more important. There are no amount of drugs that we can confiscate or law enforcement that can confiscate that are more important than a human life. And so yet again, I believe that the situation, this moment affords us the opportunity to right the wrongs that are out there, tighten up our policy and move forward with better legislation that protects our officers and protects the public. So with that, I, um, Stand in opposition of the amendment that has been proposed, but I also appreciate uh, my colleague from Florida. And with that, I will yield back. 
The, gen the gentlelady yields back. For what purpose is the uh, gentlelady from Pennsylvania seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. I'm opposed to this amendment because it undermines the purpose of the bill, not just the specific wrong that happened to George Floyd, but our purpose here is to dismantle policies that disproportionately endanger black Americans. The time for studying the issue of no-knock warrants is over. We have all the evidence we need to understand that no-knock warrants are inherently dangerous. This isn't just about justice, it's about the human cost. No-knock warrants have taken too many lives, including that of Breonna Taylor. We can't ignore the injustice that occurred to her. She would have been just 27 last week. She was a daughter, she was an EMT, and she was shot at least eight times by police as she lay in her own bed, and police broke down the door of her own apartment to execute a no-knock warrant. The warrant wasn't intended for Breonna Taylor or her boyfriend. In fact, it targeted another person who lived miles away and who had already been detained by the time police entered Breonna Taylor's home. The officers who executed a no-knock warrant and in the process executed Breonna Taylor have yet to be charged and no officer has been fired. If anyone questions why we need to ban no-knock warrants or reform the way policing is done in this country, look no further than that example. What happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others is why peaceful protesters all over this country are chanting Black Lives Matter and demanding action. It's because we see over and over again that our policing system acts as if black lives don't matter. We see this when four police officers respond to a call that a black man might have used a counterfeit $20 bill, and that man, George Floyd, was murdered. We see this when police respond to a call for help for a black woman in need of mental health treatment, and that woman, hmm? Tamisha Anderson, was murdered. We see this when police are called to respond to a black man selling loose cigarettes, and that man, Eric Garner was murdered. We see this when the police respond to a report that a black man is sleeping in his car at a Wendy's, and that man, Rashard Brooks, was murdered. We see this when police execute a botched, no-knock drug warrant, toss a flash grenade into the home of a black woman getting dressed for work. Police had the wrong apartment again, and that woman, Alberta Spruell, was murdered. In our justice system, we say that police are in, or that people are innocent until proven guilty, but under our current system, black Americans are denied justice. In practice, our system has a presumption of guilt simply for being black. Think of Breonna Taylor's case. She wasn't guilty of any crime. The only thing she was guilty of was being black and asleep in her own bed in her own home. All lives can't matter until black lives matter. I oppose this amendment. Would We've got to do better than this. Okay. And I would yield to my colleague from California. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Scanlon. And Mr. Stubbe, I, I certainly understand the concern here. And as, as someone who's prosecuted cases with dangerous entries into homes and residents, I, and with two brothers who do that routinely, uh, I think about what you just described. And I brought this up with my brothers a couple weeks ago as we were considering this legislation, and they pointed out to me that routinely on drug cases, uh, what they will do to limit the contact that happened with, the, the instance that happened with Ms. Taylor, is that you can detain and arrest a subject at a different location, and then at the same time simultaneously go into the house. And I'm sure Chief Demings would also attest that that is a tactic that law enforcement uses all the time. Yes, of course, there's going to be situations, dangerous situations, where you don't want to tip off the suspects and you're going to have to go in with a no-knock warrant. What we are saying is that in most, in drug situations, non-violent situations, non-sexual situations, non-serious situations, why even increase the likelihood that you can unjustly take uh, someone's life if there's other tactics that are available that would, I think, address your concern that the person could destroy uh, evidence. Why not contact them uh, on a traffic stop, execute the arrest warrant, then seize the, the drugs without having to have 
a violent encounter. So that's what is the, uh, I think, tenor and spirit uh, of this legislation, is to limit uh, what happened unjustly to Ms. Taylor uh, for drug cases. And I would yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Louisiana. What purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? <coughs> Strike last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rise in support of this amendment. I, I think it's really important. I, I really appreciate the thoughtful comments of Ms. Scanlon, Mr. Swalwell, and others. Um, th this is not unlike the qualified immunity doctrine and the point we were trying to make earlier. Again, this is an issue. These abuses that have been cited by Ms. Scanlon and others are, are terrible. And, and we need to address that. And you won't find anyone up here who disagrees with that. But the point of this, the no-knock, you said a moment ago, Ms. Scanlon, that, that we, we have all the information we need on no-knock. It's time to just ban the practice. Well, that's just simply not true. We haven't had any hearing. We haven't had any, any uh, a, a thoughtful debate and discussion and brought in experts to testify on that issue. There's been no time to do it. And, and this is a massive change in policing for the country where we have not done our due diligence. And there will be serious ramifications from tossing this baby out with the bathwater. I have talked to a lot of law enforcement officers, okay, over the last many days, as, as I guess some have here. Last night, I spent a lot of time on the phone, again, with my colleague from Louisiana, Clay Higgins. Many of you all know Clay. He, he had many years in law enforcement. He was telling me how many warrants he executed over his career, countless many warrants. And he said, what you need to understand, Mike, is that the no-knock warrant is designed to protect public safety. It's designed, designed to protect the officer serving the warrant and the suspect. Why is that? Because the way they do these things, first of all, he said they're very rare, very rare. It's a high standard in almost every jurisdiction, I think, to, to obtain one of these. You, you have to have, it's difficult to obtain because you have to show that there's a person with a violent history or someone who's made a past statement like, I won't be taken alive he told me, or, or that, um, that, that they have a record of weapons in the home, that they know they are, they are there. And that is an inherently dangerous situation for all parties involved. And so what they do is they time it so maybe they go at 3 o'clock in the morning when they know that everyone will be asleep. And, and, and they, when someone wakes out of a slumber, they don't have time to grab their you know, shotgun and start firing. And so they'll take the assailant and, and they'll, they'll cuff them and take them out, and then they can do a, a calm search of the premises for whatever the drug paraphernalia is or, or whatever, what, whatever's being sought. But the point is, this is designed to save lives, not violate Fourth Amendment rights, and, and it has worked very effectively in the rare cases where it is executed. Look, we're not Would saying the that there, uh, No, I won't. Let me finish. That we, we're not saying that there have not been outrageous abuses of this. We can together collectively, as the House Judiciary Committee, look into these specifics and fine-tune this so that it works for everyone, law enforcement and anyone of any race. Right? But it takes time to do that. I know we all want to rush to, to get a solution. Man, everybody here does. There's a Republican bill that's being introduced in the House, I think, tomorrow. We're all going to, I'm sure, co-sponsor that. We all want to find solutions. But we have to come to the right solutions. We do not want to endanger law enforcement. What if it is your brother, your little brother, your little sister, who's a, a young rookie cop and they have to go serve a warrant? We're concerned about their safety, too. And, and there's a reason that we've allowed this. And if we just well, throw it out, yet. I think we open a Pandora's box here. And that's what we're saying. Please don't call us obstructionists. Please don't say that we don't understand or empathize with the situation or, or don't understand the gravity of it. It's quite the opposite. What we're saying is let's do what this committee is designed to do and go through this methodically so we can make changes that will actually solve the problem and keep everybody safe. What well, would the gentleman yield? I'll yield. For a question. Thank yes. you, Mr. Johnson. And I appreciate the tenor of your remarks and the spirit with which you offer them. You just said that there's this other bill that's coming forward. I take it it's the, the Scott bill from the Senate side. You said we'll all become co-sponsors of it. What are the provisions related to no knock in that bill that you're going to join? It's not even, it's not even in legislative text yet. I mean, okay. Yet. But so but what's interesting to me is that you had no problem saying you would join it, but there hasn't been a hearing on no knock with respect to that. So Mr. Raskin, I, that's exactly my point. The reason I would not support a no-knock ban or legislation on that is because we haven't studied it yet, my friend. That's what I'm saying. But we have not done our job here nope. to make this broad, paint with this broad brush and throw this out and jeopardize not only drug convictions, but the safety of the officers who we are sending out on that blue line to serve these warrants. That's what we're concerned about. Please don't make it about anything else. It's disingenuous and it's not fair to us. 
We're just as concerned. I've got family members who are in law enforcement. I'm worried about their safety. They're being stigmatized right now. They're being hunted down like they're the enemy of society, and they protect society. They're the sheepdogs that keep us safe, and we ought to keep that in mind. Yes, we want to protect black lives, and all lives, including those who put theirs on the line to, to maintain the rule of law and safety. And I'm sorry I get emotional about this, but it's an emotional subject, and I'm out of time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back for purposes of gentlelady from Texas seek recognition. To strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is recognized. I appreciate the gentleman from Louisiana's emotion. I think we have all uh, this day had a moment of emotion and continue to be in pain. I do want to just take a moment uh, to enforce the words of the chairman as relates to COVID-19 and just make mention of the congressperson from South Carolina whose name I will not call, who wore, did not wear a mask and has indicated that he his wife and child have COVID-19. Uh, we are not frivolous in our calls for a mass to protect all of us, and I would hope my colleagues would adhere to that. But I would have offered an objection to uh, the gentleman's uh, amendment from Florida, but I chose not to do so, uh, and to allow this uh, full debate and to indicate that it had, uh, it was, uh, germane to the extent that it spoke to a section in the bill. But I do think, as Mr. Johnson has evidenced his emotion, it is important to again reassert that not one member of this committee, no matter what their party, has not embraced the value of law enforcement, the desire for them to go home to their families and for them to be safe. I think removing the section on no-knock does quite the opposite. Because in the Breonna Taylor case, an officer was shot and Breonna Taylor was killed. Any one of us who have had the responsibility of signing probable cause warrants know that our task is to be thorough but to be quick. When officers come in who are usually undercover, Whatever level court you're in, it depends upon the level PC you are reviewing. But all of them can cause harm to those whose home you approach or the actual law enforcement officer. So I think that the approach of the gentleman is, is not correct because no knocks do cause loss of life. We had that happen in Houston, Texas. There are two dead residents who didn't know who was coming in. Several officers critically wounded. One paralyzed temporarily, I believe. Massive confusion. And this happens all over America. So, no knock scenarios, there in, creates an increased moment for risk of death or injury. Bystanders are other, also caught in the crossfire. Two states already outlaw no knock. And of course, you cannot deny what happened to Breonna Taylor. Now here's another point. No knock is relevant because the bill is about transforming policing in America, giving new ideas and new approaches to do what is expected of law enforcement, and that is to secure the community, protect and serve, but to do it in a way to minimize loss of life, whether it's the officer or whether it happens to be uh, the person engaged with the officer. That does not seem to happen with no knock. And as we make our way to the floor, there are other options. <coughs> to look at some of the thoughts that Mr. Johnson may have. But I am not prepared to accept the gentleman's amendment from Florida to eliminate our provision on no-knock because I truly think there is enough documentation, even if we use Breonna Taylor and there are many other examples, you will find many examples where there was loss of life unnecessarily because of no-knock. And as I listened to the words of another colleague, you know where the house is. The drugs don't disappear. 
you can do a traffic stop or pedestrian stop or arrest the person elsewhere and have officers at that very time surround the home and secure the drugs. It's creative policing. It's policing to protect the community, but to save lives. Why are we here? We want to transform policing. And the key element of that is law and order with safety and security and lessen the loss of life. We look at uh, the nation's police films and movies. It's all about bloodshed. Well, in real life, you don't get up again to play another role. And I think that we need to get rid of no-knock to save lives. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I uh, ask to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I will uh, just very quickly respond to what I believe is a well-intentioned uh, amendment. And I will just reiterate that uh, the no-knock warrant actually puts the, the police in as much danger as it does the occupant of the home. Uh, between 2010 and 2016, 94 people uh, were lost their life in the execution of a no-knock warrant. 13 of those 94 were police officers. So if we look at the day and age that we're in with stand your ground and other uh, self-defense statutes regarding the home, uh, it is just as dangerous for police officers as it is for uh, citizens. And I would like to, uh, unanimous consent to submit a St. John's Law Review article, uh, the knock or not to knock, no knock warrants and confrontational uh, policing. Without but, objection. Thank you. In it, it tells the story of of a senior being awakened around 4 a.m. on December 5th, 2015, a team of New York police officers. And when he heard his door kicked in, uh, he remained in the bed because he was scared. He was 92 years old. He heard, he saw a man pushing his brother-in-law, a 69-year-old man, into the room. And the man was asking, what's happening? And then he heard a shot, and it hit the 69-year-old in the chest and killed him. This did not have to happen. And so what we're saying here, and I believe that with technology now and intelligent policing, there are multiple alternatives to a no-knock warrant. And we should not put our officers' lives in jeopardy. And we certainly shouldn't create an instance where someone in their home hears someone kick their door down and have to make that same split-second decision without any training, whether it's friend or foe coming through the front door. And I will just tell you, uh, and to whoever's listening, that if someone kicks in my front door, they will not be greeted with a hug or a smile, whether friend or foe, because I'm going to imagine that they are foe, just like I believe any protector of the home would believe. So while I think this is well-intentioned, I would just say that uh, I think the law enforcement community comes down on both sides on this issue. Uh, but if we lost 94 people over a span of, of six years, then I believe that's 94 lives we should still have. That's 13 law enforcement officers that we didn't have to lose. And if this portion of the bill saves those 94 lives, I will always side on uh, the side of caution and saving lives. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I agree with Mr. Richmond on this. If some uh, armed intruder barges into my house at 2 o'clock in the morning, there is going to be a gunfight. Uh, William Pitt put it this way. He said, the poorest man in his cottage may bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, 
Its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the king of England cannot enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. I think the most terrifying power the government has is to cross that threshold. It can only do so under the authority of a judicial warrant. That authority absolutely has to be announced before that power is exercised. This is not only to protect the citizen, I believe it also protects the officers from such an unnecessary confrontation. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The vote occur, the question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment. <coughs> I'm sorry, the gentleman from North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I would want to know a lot more data about the 13 people killed and the warrants that were issued because when used properly, they're only used against either the most dangerous situations or the dangerous of criminals. Um, but I think I come at this from a little different standpoint and this is maybe a little bit of federalism. I have no, the problem with no knock warrants isn't that they exist, the problem is that they're abused. The problem isn't that these tragedies occur the problem is when other places have done it right, now we're going to ban it. Uh, North Dakota has a very strict statute regarding no knock warrants. Not only do you need probable cause to get the warrant, but you need to have a probable cause finding by a judge with findings in that warrant regarding a, a destruction of evidence, danger to yourself, danger to your community. And I've, listen, the vast majority of drug cases that I have ever seen or witnessed in court have no, no reason to have a no-knock warrant. But we went through a pretty significant methamphetamine um, crisis in our state and in our region. And I'm not sure if most of you are aware, but people who are addicted to methamphetamine like guns, they like video cameras, and they tend to be pretty edgy. And they're not afraid to use those things. So while we're dealing with these issues, I think it's important to recognize that if there are problems with this and tragedies that occur, I understand that, I wish they didn't happen, but there are other places that have figured out how to do these things. And we are going to take a top-down approach and ban them nationwide, regardless of what is going on in any particular state or any jurisdiction in dealing with those things. And we're going to do it, again, I, Every one of these sections should have had a hearing. And if we wanted to do this this fast, we should have had one the day after the hearing last week. We should have had one, 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 and we should have had markup. Because I, I've, I've worked on criminal justice reform my entire adult life. And I agree with the senator from Georgia when he spoke earlier that there are a lot of things that go into this and to make sure you get it right. But I'm just telling you that there are places that get it right and that have real safeguards in place to not only protect the people where the warrant's being issued, but also protect the officer's safety in situations that can only be described as extremely dangerous. And with that, will I the yield. gentleman yield? I will. Good yes, ma'am. A thoughtful, a thoughtful uh, discussion. And the only uh, addition that I would make, or the addition that I would make, uh, is again with the Bianca Taylor case. And you're right, uh, there are thoughtful ways to look at no knock. Uh, and I wanna refer you to the fact that the legislation we have is on federal no knock. But the difficulty is when you see cases like Breonna Taylor, which is a model for what not to do, because in that instance, the person was in custody. And what happened is that a person unsuspecting of uh, someone breaking into their house in the dark of night, that person created havoc in protecting their home, shot an officer, as you well know, and then a barrage of gunfire against the young woman by the name of Ms. Taylor. There's too much room for havoc, and I do think that, that what we will find is being successful on the federal level, and that local authorities, states, and local governments will begin to redefine how they do no knock, and some may decide to abolish it, others may do something otherwise, but what we're doing here is setting a transformational model 
Mr. Armstrong, to try and save lives. I yield back to the gentleman. I'm hopeful that occurs. I know we have redone our uh, federal sentencing guidelines, and many, many states have been slow to respond to that. So I'm, I'm hopeful you are correct. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. No. The noes have it. Um, is, is there any... Uh, I ask for a recorded vote, Mr. Chairman. Recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Neguse votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Aye. Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? No. Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Yes. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Is there anyone who hasn't voted who wishes to vote? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 10 ayes and 24 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? The uh, general, uh, for what purpose is general seat recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The, gentleman, the, gen, uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Gates of Florida. On page 71, after line 20, insert the following. The uh, gentleman will explain, uh, is recognized for the purpose of explaining his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as my colleagues may have noticed in, in the last vote, I voted against the amendment to remove the provisions that the majority had included regarding no-knock warrants. And so for those keeping track of this very multifaceted bill, uh, the current Democrat majority in the House wants to end these no-knock warrants. And based on what I've seen from Senator Scott in his interviews describing his legislation, he says he would like to study no-knock warrants. And it would seem to me that a study would be appropriate for precisely all the reasons that Mr. Johnson identified. We, we want to collect data on where these no-knock warrants are being deployed. Is there a disparity on race? Is there a disparity on geography? Is there a disparity on how urban or compact the district is or simply the personnel? But I do not believe that while we're studying the question of no-knock warrants that we ought to let cases like Breonna Taylor pile up. 
I don't believe that Americans should have to die while the government is studying something when we have seen such catastrophic impact of the no-knock warrant regime in some cases. I also philosophically agree with what Mr. McClintock has said about the sanctity of the home. And those of us who have a bit of a libertarian streak, a constitutional streak, we, we sort of view the home as the castle and it is an extreme exercise of government power to enter someone's home. I come with this amendment to try to bridge that gap, to, to offer the study that Senator Scott believes is important, that Mr. Johnson clarified, while at the same time not allowing these no-knock warrants in drug cases pursuant to the ideas that Chairman Nadler and Representative Bass have suggested. I believe that this amendment will really tell us whether or not we are desirous in this committee of, of having a bill. We all know that with the Republican control of the Senate, we're going to have to work together on some of these things. We're going to have to work together to get the president to sign the legislation. And it would be very sad to me if we allowed perfect to be the enemy of the good and if my colleagues in the majority rejected an amendment that did what they wanted while collecting the information that I think would be unassailably helpful. I offer that amendment in good faith, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. From what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? The gentlelady reserves an objection. Uh, I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. Uh, the amendment uh, purports to authorize a study uh, uh, after the uh, uh, ban on ONUC goes into effect, but uh, after the ban on ONUC goes into effect, there is nothing to study. So it's a wasteful, it's a wasteful amendment, um, and, Mr. and I urge I urge opposition to the amendment um, because the 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 um, urgency of enacting the ban on no knock as contained in the bill is urgent to prevent uh, further deaths, and uh, so this amendment is very pernicious. Uh, Mr. So whatever, I, I yield I yield to the gentleman lady from Texas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I. Withdraw my objection at this time. General Lady withdraws her amendment. Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Who, uh, the, who, who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. General, the gentleman from uh, Ohio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield the uh, time to the gentleman. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding and to use a term that I wouldn't normally use but that the chairman has used. The objection to my amendment is nonsense. The objection of my amendment is that we have to be in a rush to end no-knock warrants in drug cases. The amendment ends no-knock warrants in drug cases, but just during the duration of a study so we can find out what's going on. Is it really true that my friends in the majority are uncurious about the deployment of no-knock warrants? The only other substantive point the chairman made in opposition to my amendment is, well, there would be nothing to study because the no-knock warrants wouldn't be happening anymore. But I know how bright my Democrat colleagues are. I know that with all of the no-knock warrants that have already occurred, with the deaths like Breonna Taylor's death, we ought to get more information. If anything, it would inform on future policy choices. You're going to have to work with the Senate with the administration and with some Republicans. And on this issue, you know, I, I agree with the challenges with no-knock warrants, but if the only arguments against my amendment is that ending no-knock warrants are urgent and that, and that the study is pernicious, then you all know those arguments aren't being made in good faith. The, for the people watching at home, here's what's really going on. They want to end this hearing saying they took no Republican amendments. That, there is no other reason for you not to take this amendment and vote for it. I voted with you against some of my Republican colleagues when on the matters of policy, I thought we could come together. So why, why not take a Republican amendment and work with us? I, I fear, and this is so sad, I wish this weren't the case, but I fear that the majority in this committee is so captive to the radical left, so captive to the people that really do want to defund the police. And by the way, I take, I take some of you at your word that you don't want to defund the police. But even if you don't want to defund the police, if you're so afraid of the elements of your party that do, that you're unwilling to accept any Republican amendment, even an amendment that does what you want while gathering information about the things you care about, 
It shows what a farce this has been. And particularly in a hearing where our sincerity has been called into question, where our commitment to our own family members has been called into question, it really troubles me that you would be so close-minded. And by the way, like you're not hurting us by doing this. You're hurting the next Breonna Taylor. You're hurting the next person that could be negatively impacted. So please, I know you've rushed this bill. I know that you don't want to have substantive hearings about the elements individually. I know that you want to get it to the floor. But at least don't be opposed to the collection of information that might help us on, on future discussions that we might be able to have on policing. And, and again, I, I would love to hear any real substantive objection to my amendment. You all know that the objections you heard from the chairman were nonsense. I don't even think he understands the amendment based on those objections. It's just that you want to end today saying you took no Republican amendments. That's what this is really about. And I'm saddened by that because we really have come here to work together. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Well said. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. The no's have it. No. The no's have it. I request a recorded vote. The recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. <coughs> Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Rosenthaler? Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Stubbe votes no. Are there any other members who wish to vote? Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Swalwell? Um, Mr. Swalwell, you are not recorded. No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean, you are not recorded. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Rischenthaler. Mr. Rischenthaler. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Rischenthaler, you're not recorded. Aye. Mr. Rischenthaler votes aye. Are there any other members who haven't voted? The clerk will report. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 12 ayes and 24 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any other amendments in the, to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. The gentlelady reserves a point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Klein of Virginia. Page 97, after line 7, insert the following. Ask unanimous consent that the amendment be read. Er. The gentleman is recognized for the purpose of explaining his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring this amendment because I'm tired of good, hardworking men and women in law enforcement being given a bad rap by the actions of one bad officer. Reputations drug through the mud, entire departments uh, cast as racist because of one uh, racist in their department. This amendment would go to two key points of this, the goals of this bill, transparency and accountability. I want to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record two articles. The first Washington Post article from August 3rd, 2017, titled, Fired and Rehired Police Chiefs Are Often Forced to Put Officers Fired Without from Misconduct objection. Back on the Street. Excuse me. The second, police unions and police misconduct, what the research says about the connection, Washington Post, June 10th, 2020. Without objection. Yes, please. Thank you. This amendment would ensure that the Department of Justice and the Attorney General are not hindered by restrictive collective bargaining agreements when working with law enforcement to resolve patterns or practices of misconduct. Moreover, it would ensure that important federal resources go to state and local law enforcement agencies that avoid these provisions, occasionally found in collective bargaining agreements that prevent transparency and avoid accountability. Provisions such as uh, provision that would delay officer interviews or inter interrogations for a set period of time. Uh, anything that would provide officers with access to the evidence against them prior to questioning. Mandating the destruction of disciplinary records including statutes of limitations for the investigations of misconduct, bans on anonymous complaints, mandatory ar arbitration of discipline complaints. Uh, Madam Chair, I would say that the vast majority of law enforcement officers serve their communities with distinction and honor across our nation every day. Unfortunately, in some states, bad officers have been shielded from uh, transparency and accountability by collective bargaining agreements and make it nearly impossible for a department to remove officers with extensive histories of misconduct. We saw that most recently in the George Floyd case. These complex agreements leave communities with few recourse options to investigate transgressions and hold bad, bad actors accountable. Further collective bargaining agreements have been linked to an increase in violent incidents involving law enforcement officers. One study found a 40% increase of violent incidents in Florida after a change in collective bargaining laws there. In 2006, the Bureau of Justice Statistics issued a report and found that law enforcement agencies operating under a collective bargaining agreement garnered 9.9 .9 use of force complaints for every 100 officers, compared with only 7.3 for non-unionized agencies. During the disciplinary process, only 7% of the complaints were sustained or found to have merit in departments with collective bargaining agreements. In agencies without unions, the sustain rate was more than double at 15%. Currently, the Attorney General has the authority under the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act to investigate and reform departments through consent decrees. Unfortunately, the Department of Justice is often unable to compel changes that could be construed as altering collective bargaining agreements negotiated by local unions. We need to adopt policies that correct this problem and support the many departments across the country that are making transparency and accountability a priority. Finally, by ens ensuring that our local and state police do not have their hands tied by expansive union contracts, police departments will be able to make hiring and firing decisions based on performance. It's my hope that by adopting these, this amendment, we can prevent future tragedies like the one that took George Floyd's life. I urge my colleagues to support its adoption to strengthen this bill, and I yield back. Thank you, and I recognize myself. Um, I think we've got a fundamental issue here um, because while private sector union bargaining rules are governed by federal laws, our public sector unions are under state jurisdiction. So I think we've got some fundamental questions about uh, what we can reach with this federal legislation in it. And, uh, well, and Madam Chair, I would say this doesn't actually uh, affect those agreements at all directly. All it does is say that uh, eligibility for federal funding uh, 
would depend on whether or not those agreements included these types of egregious provisions that I think we would all agree being able to destroy disciplinary records is not something we want in collective bargaining agreements, in local police policy. Uh, mandatory arbitration of complaints is not something that we all want in our local police policy. Bans on anonymous complaints, uh, statutes of limitations for the investigations of misconduct, those are not policies that we want in our local police department. So let's use the tools that we have. Okay, to reclaiming my change. time. I think that the issue is whether or not, in fact, we have these tools and whether or not it's too coercive under these circumstances. And I would argue that it's not. So noted. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there's a rejection out of hand here. I think there's just a question of the format and the right way to go about it. So I think the committee staff would like to look at this further and, and move, move forward. Um, Madam Chair, I'm unable to, to, to uh, withdraw that, the amendment I would time. yield back my time. Looks like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm unable to withdraw my amendment at this point, um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to have the discussion right now. M Madam Chair, who seeks recognition? Madam Chair, who seeks recognition? I, I, I do over here. Okay. To your right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What can, can I offer? A, the gentleman from Tennessee. Can I offer a motion that says an amendment that says for this case we can put his amendment down and we can go on with some other amendments and y'all can see if you can work something out. The old Goodland rule he used to always say we'd look at it and maybe work with you before it gets to the floor. If, as I understand it, if he wants to withdraw, he can withdraw. If he chooses not to, then we'll proceed. Can he put it down a couple? Why not? I, this is the amendment under consideration. My understanding is that we cannot do that. Who seeks recognition? I apologize. Gentleman from Rhode Island. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion that is occurring about collective bargaining agreements and whether or not there are provisions and agreements which are impediments to reform within police departments and, and whether or not some state statutes, uh, Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, which are uh, enacted in a number of states, are also an impediment. The flip side of that is they often can um, serve as a vehicle to bring real reform. But the, and I think the amendment raises some, some um, important questions about some provisions of collective bargaining agreements. But as I said to my friend, Mr. Klein, before he offered the amendment, collective bargaining agreements are an agreement of two parties. And so to the extent collective bargaining agreements contain provisions that are contrary to the public interest or that are impeding good law enforcement or impeding the ability to hold police officers accountable, uh, it's the agreement of the government agent, whether it's the mayor, the city council, or the government officials who've agreed to those provisions. And I do think the, the amendment raises, uh, calls the question about whether or not uh, those responsible for making those judgments and making those uh, collective bargaining agreements ought to consider a range of other approaches, particularly in light of uh, the recent events uh, that we've seen in our country. But I do think the danger of intruding upon what is such a sacred responsibility between the employer and the employee to negotiate in good faith. And that's a contract that has obligations on both sides. And I am fearful that the federal government coming in and inserting itself into collective bargaining uh, proceedings uh, will have a very damaging uh, and negative impact on the ability uh, of workers to negotiate wages and benefits and working conditions consistent with their uh, best interests. And I think what the amendment really points to is that we need to call upon folks on the other side of the negotiating table to be sure they are fighting for uh, contracts which not only provide the right benefits and wages and protections, but also protect the ability of the municipality or the state or local government uh, to hold police officers accountable, to properly discipline them, and maybe state legislatures to look at statutes that might impede that. But I think it seems to me that's the right approach rather than trying to go behind the collecting bargaining agreement and really undermine what is so important. And I, I frankly don't know whether we have the ability legally to intrude into what is essentially a contract between employers and employees. And so I, I think the amendment raises important questions. I know a lot of those conversations 
are happening in states and cities all around the country, but I think sensitizing people to negotiating contracts that achieve both objectives of providing wages and benefits and safe working conditions for, for police officers at the same time ensuring that uh, municipalities and state governments have the ability to hold police officers accountable, properly discipline officers who require discipline, and some of the other issues raised in the amendment is really important. So I thank the gentleman for raising this issue. I think on balance, protecting the collective bargaining agreement and the right of parties to collective bargaining is really important, but holding people accountable for what are in those agreements really matters. With the gentleman, Would the gentleman yield? Sure, uh, yield to Ms. Chesley and then to the gentleman. And I'll take a moment. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Cicilline. Uh, and, and to the gentleman, uh, Mr. Klein has decided not to, uh, my friend and colleague, decided not to withdraw, but I think there is a key to the issue, as you would know, of two parties negotiating an agreement, and we leap into it from the federal government uh, and, in essence, uh, uh, I wouldn't say untangle it, uh, but um, take its legs off of it. And I think that is troubling to me. In addition, we're trying to be transformational, and part of the work that we're doing in this bill is to give local governments the opportunity to work directly with their law enforcement to be transformational. Your issue may be one that they consider, but I would be hesitant to interfere with the collective bargaining process. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman from Rhode Island. And, and I thank the gentlelady for her comments, and I thank the, the gentleman from Rhode Island as well. I would argue that, or respond by, by saying that uh, in many ways this bill uh, does just that, inserting the federal government into uh, what is often a local or a state decision-making process. And because one of the parties in that collective bargaining agreement process is the state or the local government, uh, what you have is a proper role here in using federal funds to encourage certain behaviors or certain agreements uh, and, and essentially give a backbone to those local officials who uh, you, would, you would like to see uh, take a firmer stand and, and get more successful uh, collective bargaining agreements as a result and not have these offensive provisions in them. So it's encouragement rather than requirement. It's, it's not coercion. It's, it's simply using the tools that we have to achieve a result, much as the rest of this bill does. I yield back. Thank you, I see. Back. Thank you. And for what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to our class work. So recognized. Thank you. Um, uh, this is interesting. And I know it puts everybody in a tough spot right here because what was really said about this, this bill is, well, yes, we understand the problems with a collective bargaining agreement that keeps us from getting at the real root of problems of investigating and making transformational change and studying how what happens in a, a law enforcement situation and how they are protected and other things. But yet, the, it's, it's just also very interesting to hear the, the mental gymnastics that I just heard to go through to say that it is not the federal government should, that there's certain areas that we shouldn't touch and I'm not sure we can, when that's what we do all the time. We wanted people to wear seat belts. What did we do? We withheld money from, from states and localities. We wanted people to do other things. We direct money and say, you can't have it. This is exactly what's happening here. The problem here is, is we have a bill that usurps into areas of, of state and local control. We've always talked about no not warrants, you know, uh, issues of chokeholds, the issues of other issues. We're inserting ourselves and we're going to do so with grants, even in this bill. I understand this is a difficult situation because it puts us at odds, frankly, with, with two power bases here, one being a union collective bargaining agreement that we don't want to get in the middle of, but also saying we've got to deal with something because some very, these very collective bargaining agreements are the very issue that causes us to have issues in prosecutions of cops and folks who should have done bad things. If the concern is putting us on a bad spot, then we need to go back and re-examine how we do everything in Washington up here. I don't want to see another Clean Air Act. I don't want to see another transportation bill. I don't want to see another criminal, you know, anything that you want to put in there that coerces states or tells states how they have to do something without the, the being involved and say, oh, no, don't worry. You don't have to do it, but you're not getting the money. And to say this is a problem here, to say that this is, one of the things we've got to understand is most law enforcement officers who are under collective bargaining agreement or not under collective bargaining agreement want the bad actors out. They don't like the way this is set up, and they see it as protection, and they see it when these, that many of us grieve about in these situations, but we see the, the problems that has been affected here. I understand it puts 
many may be here in a bad position because you don't, as was just said, want to go into the collective bargaining agreement. Where is that ever a concern uh, when we actually passed health care and forced you to make a choice in a private agreement of insurance that you have to buy? There's other issues that we could just go on and on and on and talk about here about how, but to say that the federal government shouldn't get involved, should get involved in everything else. Let me rephrase it. You can get involved in everything else, but be very careful about going to the collective bargaining agreement. Even if the collective bargaining agreement by itself, and one of the things that, that I so appreciate, the gentleman from uh, Mississippi was right, there needs to be better agreements. But until there is forcible put, uh, force put on these uh, agreements, you're not going to see them get better because the unions do what they need to do, rightfully so. I'm not taking away from what they do. That is why they're there, to get as much as they can for the people that they represent. And the cities and the states are there to represent the people and the taxpayers to get as much as they can. But when you have issues like we're dealing with here, if you want to talk transformational change, if we really want to do that, and I know that you do, I do. This is where we've got to look at. These parameters have to be set. These conducts have to be done. And, and so with that, I just want to uh, just say, look, I know this may be sticky, but it actually goes to the very heart of the issue. And that I yield to uh, Mr. Klein for a moment. And I thank the gentleman. And, and as I said, uh, this is a, a national problem. The, the Washington Post article that I included in the record says that uh, between 2006 and 2017, here in Washington, D.C., 45% of the officers fired for misconduct were rehired on appeal. In Philadelphia, the share is 62%. In San Antonio, Texas, 70% of officers fired are rehired on appeal. That is an issue. We need to make sure that the bad apples are thrown out and kept out. And with that, I yield back. Okay, and, and I'm reclaiming my time. I mean, let's, let's think about this. Let's go back to George Floyd, which is this bill is going to be renamed for. The officer that killed George Floyd had 18 reprimands that were apparently never punished, at least in, the, in the, what we have seen. These are things that are covered and, and, and many times left out of collective bargaining agreements. When they do get rehired, they go back through the process, or, or basically they have to wait. You know, there, there's waiting periods, or, or they have to see all the information. Things that normal defendants are never allowed to really be a part of are bought into these collective bargaining agreements. The, the amendment, I appreciate the gentleman uh, having it. I think it's a great discussion for us to have. If this is substantive work on a substantive bill, the gentleman brings a substantive amendment. I appreciate him bringing that. But let's don't kid ourselves. The federal government courses states and localities and the citizens every day up here. This is what this is about. I yield back. Sorry. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. With all of the jargon and technical debate over this subject, it's pretty easy to see what's actually going on. This amendment tests whether or not black lives matter to the majority as much as their fidelity to organized labor does. I mean, everyone on this committee and most people in America know that there are circumstances where police unions protect bad cops. And while we certainly have to have unions and collective bargaining agreements good enough and strong enough to protect good cops, to protect whistleblowers that might see improper behavior on the force, we don't want unions so strong that bad cops can be shuttled around. But organized labor donates disproportionately to Democrats. My friend from Rhode Island said earlier, well, this must be a very difficult and very hard conversation uh, about policing for Republicans, but we've certainly seen what's uncomfortable and difficult for the Democrats, and that is any sort of treatment of the sacred cow that is the union world. And so Mr. Klein does not seek to end collective bargaining. <clears throat> he doesn't seem to, to uh, seek to make it more difficult for those who would seek the protections of those agreements when they're doing the right thing and serving as exemplary examples of good policing. But where you do see folks deviate, where you see these clear examples where we as the government could do something to inform on the substance of these agreements, they don't want to do anything. And, and by the way, this whole notion that like, well, this is just too much interference in local affairs, <laughs> they want to take over the training of local police and have it dictated from the federal government. 
And there may be reasons why we can create a platform for best practices to be developed in training. But don't tell me that the very majority that wants to have the federal government train your local police is too concerned about interference in local affairs to say that there are some features of these collective bargaining agreements that are contrary to public policy, that only protect the bad. And so I appreciate the gentleman's amendment. And, and again, like this, this is an example of the, the Black Lives Matter mantra serving more as a slogan than as an organizing policy principle. And I think that America should resent that because we have mechanisms in place to go after the bad cops, to protect the good cops. But this is all about their sacred cow. It's all about organized labor. And the funny thing is, we all know it, right? Like, everybody could talk about the, the features of these agreements, but everyone in America knows that there are cop unions out there that have tools to protect bad cops. And so instead of protecting the citizens, instead of protecting the George Floyds and the Breonna Taylors, they're protecting their own relationships with organized labor and with unions. And, you know, just say it. Just say what it is. But, but the gentleman's amendment is well drafted. It's well tailored. You all should accept it. But as I said previously, the last two amendments that have been offered are amendments that do what you want to do. And perhaps if they'd have been offered by Democrats, you would have taken them. But you came in today, the majority did, absolutely hell-bent to not take any amendments from Republicans. And as we venture on in this experience, I think the American people should know that to get this done, we're actually going to have to work together. And these are the ideas that would allow us to. Gathering more data, getting rid of bad cops, supporting good cops, and ensuring that we've got the right tools for policing. The American people are probably sickened watching this debate because there's so much we agree on, yet just out of like political tribalism, you're unwilling to accept amendments. And it's disingenuous and it's unfortunate. I'd yield to the gentleman for Virginia if you had any additional comments. I thank the gentleman. I think the, the data has been collected on this issue and uh, in, in many different studies, uh, it has shown that uh, once unionized, uh, police forces uh, are, are more likely to keep bad apples or bad actors uh, on their force. Uh, a Duke Law Journal study uh, showed uh, in uh, analyzing 178 police union contracts, found a number of provisions listed in this amendment that played a role in shielding police officers from the consequences of misconduct. Um, around 88% contained at least one provision uh, that could thwart legitimate disciplinary actions against officers engaged in misconduct. This is designed to target those bad apples, make sure they're gotten rid of, make sure they don't come back, restoring the good names of the good law enforcement officers out there and making sure we go to the heart of what this bill should be about, transparency and accountability. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Thank you, Madam Chair. I had meant to do this earlier. I had a UC request uh, from the Wall Street Journal's editorial board. The problems with police unions, collective bargaining protects too many bad cops from discipline. Without objection. Who seeks recognition? The question occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No. Madam Chair, I ask for a report. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes ha or the noes have it. Madam Chair, I ask for a report. Recorded vote is called. Mr. Nadler? Mr. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? 
Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Gomert votes aye. Oh, Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Nadler? Yes. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Mr. Cohn? Are there any members who wish to have their vote recorded who have not voted? No. Mr. Correa, you are not recorded. Correa votes no. Mr. Correa votes no. Are there any other members who wish their vote recorded? Okay, the clerk will record the vote. Madam Chair, there are 12 ayes and 23 noes. The amendment fails, it's not adopted. And we have to take a very brief pause to reset our technical equipment. It is tired if nobody else is. Uh, the committee will stand on recess for a couple of minutes. Thank you.
Committee will come to order. Are there any further amendments to the, to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I haven't been at the desk. General, the general, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Stubbe of Florida. Strike section 365 and redesignate provisions accordingly. The general, gentleman is recognized for the purpose of explaining his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment takes out section 365 of the bill, which calls for the demilitarization of our law enforcement. Again, I would contend, like my previous amendment, uh, I don't know what specifically this has to do with the death of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. Um, there was not specific vehicles, aircraft, silencers, that sort of thing that were used in the commissions of those crimes. So I, I would submit to you, I'm gonna read the language that is in there so that uh, those people watching and understanding understands the language that's included in this amendment and in the bill and this amendment would take this language out. Right now the bill would prohibit the transfer of certain weapons, ammunition, vehicles, aircraft, silencers, and other equipment to state and local law enforcement officers. Uh, first of all, I, I think it's a very dangerous slope that we are going to go down by prohibiting transfer of certain weapons, uh, especially those that are deemed militarized by portions on the left that like to say that uh, semi-automatic rifles are a militarized uh, form of semi-automatic weapons because if we start saying that we're gonna ban those from law enforcement agencies and they can't receive those weapons, the next step's gonna be we're gonna ban law enforcement uh, departments from being able to have semi-automatic rifles and if we can take them away from the police then the next step is well if the police can't have them then we're not gonna allow any citizens in our country to have semi-automatic weapons the other very troubling piece of this to me is most of our law enforcement agencies especially law enforcement agencies in my district that are rural in nature and don't have the money or ability or capabilities to buy protective equipment for their officers for example ballistic vests ballistic shields, armored vehicles that would allow you to be protecting the officer in that execution of a warrant. So there was a lot of talk earlier about no knock warrants. Well, if you're gonna knock and announce yourself and you know that the person that you're executing the warrant on is dangerous, has a history of using violence, has a history of using weapons and has weapons on the premises. So if we ban no knock warrants and now we are going to have, to, law enforcement is gonna have to announce themselves before they execute the search warrant. Now we're also gonna take away the very things that are protecting our officers from the execution of that search warrant. Why would we want to tell a law enforcement agency, you can't have ballistic vests, you can't have ballistic shields, you can't have an armored vehicle to execute that search warrant because you're gonna have to knock now and if we're gonna allow that to happen, we're also gonna take away your protective equipment, which many of the law enforcement agencies in my district uh, having nine counties, seven of which are more rural and very rural in Florida, they get their equipment from these sales and transfers because they can't afford to get them on their own. So I am very concerned about this language in the bill. This amendment takes this language out and would allow our law enforcement agencies to continue to get the equipment that they need to do to do their job and to protect themselves. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I. Um I recognize myself. Uh, the last two weeks have yet again demonstrated that tactical military type vehicles have no place in the hands of law enforcement. The, the uh, use of military equipment against peaceful protesters by the Trump administration uh, shows that it is very dangerous for law enforcement to have, to have uh, military equipment. The recent use by state and federal law enforcement agencies echoes the deployment of armored personnel carriers against protesters in Ferguson, Missouri, following the death of Michael Brown. This bill bans the transfer of equipment such as armed personnel carriers, long-range acoustic devices, grenade launchers, armored or weaponized drones, bayonets, flashbangs, explosives, mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, silencers, and combat-configured aircraft. It does not ban the transfer of office supplies and clothing items that make up the overwhelming majority of items transferred through the 1033 program. The bill takes a scalpel to remove military vehicles, firearms, and surveillance equipment. And there is good reason to do so. It is dangerous, 
dangerous to allow police uh, agencies to have this kind of equipment. Accordingly, this is a very important part of this bill, and I express my strong opposition to the amendment. I yield back. Who seeks recognition? The, the uh, question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The, the noes have it. I ask for a recorded vote. Recorded, recorded vote is requested. Um, the clerk will call the roll. <coughs> Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond? No. Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Aye. Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? <coughs> Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Are there any? How much? Mr. Correa, Correa votes aye. You, you're recorded vote as no. Vote. vote no. Mr. Correa votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. I vote no. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen. No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chair. how am I recorded? Mr. Stanton, you are not recorded. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Mr. And Chair. Mr. Chair how am I recorded? Ms. McCarcel Powell, you are not recorded. McCarcel Powell, no. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Are there any other members of the committee who wish to vote who haven't voted? Yes, Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Johnson of Georgia, you are not recorded. Vote no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Are there, are there any other members who have not voted? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 25 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments Mr. Chairman. to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? For our purposes, the gentleman seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7120, offered by Mr. Gates of Florida. On page 85, strike subparagraph A, lines 8 through 15, and renumber subsequent lines appropriately. On page 86, strike lines 23 and renumber subsequent lines. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Mr. Chairman, the Mr. Chairman, I reserve the, uh, the uh, gentleman. 
is recognized for the purpose of explaining his amendment. Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady reserves a point of order. I reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are now debating the extent to which our military can partner with various elements of law enforcement in other areas of our government to transfer equipment that might be helpful in protecting the good guys and going after the bad guys. And Mr. Stubbe's amendment, which was rejected by the majority, would have eliminated that entire policy reform area from the bill. And so I offer you something that is perhaps a bit more humble. And it is informed by the trips that I've taken to the U.S.-Mexico border led by Congressman Biggs. I believe that it might be the case that we don't want to send military-style equipment to the constables and sheriffs and police officers and local government. But when you're talking about border patrol, when you're talking about those who have to protect us against the cartels, particularly amassed at the southern border, it's just a different fight. And if the bill were to pass in its current form, the Democratic majority would disarm elements of our border security apparatus and put them into an unfair fight with the cartels, where the cartels had more weaponry than the patriotic Americans who seek to protect our country. And so my amendment would preserve the elements of the majority's bill that prohibit transfers to local police and sheriffs and constables, but it would still allow DOD to make transfers for border security purposes to those elements of the federal government which could use that. And there is a lot of news that would suggest that that is absolutely necessary. I cite an NBC News article from uh, February 24th, 2011, entitled, Ice Agent's Death Prompts Massive Drug Cartel Sweep. And in this story, uh, we learn of uh, this uh, Jaime Zapata cartel drug lord who had uh, 20 guns amassed that our law enforcement had to go and deal with in one of these uh, border area skirmishes. And so if the other side is so well armed, perhaps we shouldn't put brave Americans in jeopardy. And that's not nearly as troubling as the more recent news from voanews.com. This is on March 14th, 2020. And they're talking about the changes in tactics from El Jalisco cartel. And in the story, it talks about how El Jalisco cartel, they carry machine guns and hand grenades, and even once used rocket launchers to shoot down a Mexican military helicopter. So if the adversary has rocket launchers, grenades, if they have that type of weaponry, and we were to pass the bill that the Democratic majority has offered, we would literally be inserting some of the bravest Americans into an unfair fight against those who are, are uniquely uh, challenging and, and are uniquely dangerous. Uh, this this uh, is not just a feature of the fight on the U.S.-Mexico border. It is also something we deal with in the state of Florida. Because as the Trump administration's good work to make the U.S.-Mexico border less permissive continues, the Florida Straits um, become even more of an attractive option for drug cartels. And I, I cite a Mi Miami Herald article from 2014 that walks through the specific needs of state law enforcement in Florida and of local law enforcement in Florida to have the weaponry that would allow us to fight against these cartels. They, they, have, incredibly dan they have incredible capability. These cartels are multi-billion dollar industries. This is not some street gang that you know, would, uh, we wouldn't want to see you know, Hummers rolling down Main Street America under the view that, that the majority has taken. But please, please do not disarm the federal agents at our border, the others who are yeah. participating in border security uh, from being able to win the fight and protect our great country. I yield back. Yeah. Gentleman yields back. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. Uh, the last thing this country needs is militarization of our border. The last thing this country needs is militarization of our police. This, is, this amendment is uh, uh, harmful in the extreme. I urge, it's, I urge opposition. Mr. I yield Chair. back. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Sure, I do. The gentleman, is, uh, gentleman from Ohio. The, we just had a debate about the militarization of the border of Chaz, and all the gentleman's amendment does 
as he said, it lets the good guys be on equal footing with the cartels, with the bad guys. And why in the world would we be against that? What, 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 there is no reason. We understand you guys didn't like Mr. Stubbe's amendment. It failed. But as Mr. Gates said, this is, this is for our border where all kinds of bad things happen. The trafficking that takes place there, all kinds of bad things happen. These cartels are ruthless. We've all been down there. The gentleman from Florida is right. We've been, we've, Mr. Biggs runs, he's done numerous trips to the border to see what, what, what these folks are, these bad guys are capable of doing. And all the gentleman says is let's give the good guys some, let's give them what they need. Let's help them. That's all this is. So this is as, this is as common sense as it gets. Of course, all, our, all this, I think our 11th Amendment, every one of them have been common sense, but I support the gentleman's amendment would yield time to the gentleman from Florida. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And I have to again say the opposition to this amendment is nonsense. It is abject nonsense. The, the, listen to what the chairman said. He said, well, the last thing we need is a militarized border. I agree. The problem is the cartels get a vote. <laughs> they have militarized the border. So the question is not whether or not America's border will be militarized. I'm entering records into the committee evidence showing that they have freaking grenade launchers. They have rocket launchers. They're taking out helicopters. So the border is militarized. The question is whether or not our folks, the Americans that would protect and preserve our country, are going to be put at a disadvantage when protecting us as a consequence of this Congress. For hours upon hours, my Democrat colleagues have said, how dare you to the Republicans who would, who would inject issues that don't have anything to do with the death of Mr. Floyd? Nobody in Border Patrol killed George Floyd. Nobody in Border Patrol killed Breonna Taylor. I, I know of no circumstance, as a matter of fact, where Border Patrol is involved in the type of offenses that the majority is, is articulating or attempting to solve. So it, it begs the question, if this was about stopping police, local and state police, from killing black Americans, why have they woven into that legislation to disarm those who protect our border? Well, here's the reason. Because they're not really, this isn't about Black Lives Matter to them. This is about abolishing the elements of our society that preserve order. In our hearing with, uh, with Mr. Floyd and others, I, I showed the evidence where Democrat members of Congress, even one Democrat member of this committee, were sharing content and raising money for an organization that stood not just for the abolition of the police, but the abolition of ICE and prisons and the military and border patrol and the state itself. So if, if that's really what this is all about, eroding the state, eroding our borders, just say it, but spare us the lectures about how this is all about George Floyd because ain't nobody in border patrol did anything to hurt George Floyd. I'd yield to Mr. Buck. I, I thank my friend from Florida for yielding. And I, I, you asked a question, I want to answer the question. Why would they be opposed to this amendment? They'd be opposed to the amendment because they want to see the traffickers of young girls coming across the border win. They would be across, they would be in favor of this, they'd be opposed to this amendment because they want to see those who are bringing poisons across our border win. That's why they would want to be opposed to this. Border Patrol isn't enforcing laws in the uh, interior of this country. They aren't detaining people uh, with chokeholds in Chicago and other areas. They are trying to protect our border and protect our citizens from the dangers that are coming across that border. And the only reason you would want to defeat this amendment is to see some very terrible things happen. That's my answer to, you, to your question, Mr. Gates. Yield back to Mr. Jordan. Yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat. All right, I'll yield back, thank you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentlelady from uh, Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this is me oh. coming from uh, my colleague from Florida, Matt Getz. Um, let me just say how offensive it is to continue to hear 
uh, the comments coming from my Republican colleagues from the other side about the border, because they don't talk about the border with Canada. They don't talk about ports of entry. We all want law and order, but what we want is for those people that are responsible for enforcing the law to also follow the law. Military vehicles. You know what that reminds me of when I see those military vehicles? The streets in Venezuela. People are fleeing violence in Central America and in Latin America. Human trafficking, you say? Kids that are being trafficked? You were responsible for being completely district, separating them from So please spare me the hypocrisy of wanting to have security, separating families, keeping kids detained. We are talking about police brutality. We are talking about militarizing our police. We saw what happened last week in the protests in Washington, D.C. Again, that happens in Latin America, not in the United States of America. So let's get back to the real issue, violence against black and brown people. Yes, brown, Hispanics, Latinos. They're not all part of a drug cartel. They're not all criminals the way that you always use every opportunity to do that. So please, spare me your hypocrisy. And Mr. Getz, if you want to be acting, go to Hollywood. We need to legislate here today. Thank you. What? what? Point of order, yeah. Gentlelady. Gentlelady yields back. The, uh, the, the, the gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First of all, I'm not sure that the, the uh, chair addressed the points of order that several members on this side uh, raised, so I'd yield to the gentleman from Arizona to make his point of order, since the chairman won't recognize him on, on the chair's time. Mr. Th th thank you, uh, Mr. Shavit. Uh, what we just heard, a personal attack on someone is out of order and contrary to the decorum of this committee, and I would ask you to rule out, out of order. And pay, maybe maybe it's necessary to take your words down. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, point of order. The, the, the it's general, my, it's Mr. my Chairman, that I yielded to the gentleman for his point the of gentleman's order. Point, the gentleman did, has not stated the point of order, and mem members should address the chair. Gentleman from uh, Rhode Island. No, no, no. Mr. Chairman, it's actually a parliamentary inquiry. Did we just hear gentleman will good, state his parliamentary inquiry. Did we just hear my good friend Mr. Buck actually say that the Democrats on this committee were attempting to facilitate child traffickers. How, I mean, the, hip the despicable claim that was just made about the motives of Democrats was beyond, it was breathtaking, it wasn't even worthy of responding to. But now in the face of that, they have the audacity to claim that someone's word should be taken down? That is, that is not a proper parliamentary oh, inquiry. I'm, I regret that. Too. The, uh, Re all members should address the chair. Re reclaiming the, my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Colorado. I, I appreciate that, and I wanted to tell my friend from uh, Rhode Island that I was asked, answering a hypothetical question from Mr. Gates. The hypothetical was, why would Democrats want to oppose our border patrol having the ability and rather no, no 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 you're interrupting and i am not i am not giving you time um why would the uh democrats want to oppose uh having border patrol at least at equal strength to the militarized cartels that are coming across and and i could not possibly come up with a reason for that but if i had to if i had to dig really deep it would be something as absurd as wanting something to happen that absolutely should never happen. Reclaim and that was my, my answer, I and I yield back to my friend from Ohio. Thank you. Yield the gentleman from Ohio. Right. I thank the gentleman for, for yielding, um, and I'll be quick, but the, the gentlelady from Florida attacked her colleague from her same state, attacked his motives. He's not acting. He's fighting for principles he cares about and believes in. He's, he's doing what we're supposed to do, debating important issues. And then to, to insinuate something about his motive is, is that is exactly what you're not supposed to do. Talk about someone's motive for what they're saying. You're, that, that is exactly what you're not supposed to do. The rules, I heard a lot about the rules of decorum. That is certainly one of them. Um, that's why. Well, the gentleman yield? That's why the gentleman from Arizona raised the point. Yeah. Not my time. I go back. Well, the gentleman, gentleman yield? It's Mr. Chabot's time. I yield back to Mr. Chabot. Thank you. And, and reclaim my time. And I would note that the gentleman made the trip. She didn't. Uh, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chabot. I assure you, 
my desire to protect this country, to protect what's <coughs> special about it, to ensure that our border <coughs> patrol agents don't die when they're, when they're doing their patriotic duty to our country, is absolutely no act. The act is the effort to try to weave in the radical left's desire to have no borders into a policing hearing. If this is really about policing and Black Lives Matter, why in the world are you trying to hurt ICE and Border Patrol? You're trying to hurt ICE and Border Patrol because the Democrats have the act in this committee. And so there is no trip to Hollywood, but I would invite every Democrat on the committee, including the gentlelady from the Sunshine State, to join Congressman Biggs. And perhaps then you would be able to see how hard this fight is against a well-equipped enemy that is resourced with billions of dollars that is launching hand grenades at the people who seek to protect our families and our communities. If you want to know why we're not so concerned about the Canadian border, it's that no one's throwing grenades over the Canadian border at our country. And by the way, you realize your bill here hurts the Canadian border too. Right? What my amendment does is it preserves the protection for the whole country because I love the whole country and it is worthy of protection. And I love the people who fight on our border honorably and admirably against those who would do us such grave harm. And so again, like, I think everybody watching at home knows what's really going on here now. After all this, they haven't taken a single Republican amendment, even stuff they agree with, and now they're way, they have jumped the shark on policing. This is no longer about policing. It is precisely about what the Black Visions Minnesota group attempted to accomplish. Defund the police, defund Border Patrol, eliminate borders altogether, get rid of the military, and get rid of the United States of America. That's their vision for the country. And it's no, oh, well, it's what you're raising money for, Mr. Chairman. It's what your colleagues raise money for. I showed at the last committee hearing, folks can go check it out, where a member of this committee, members of the Democratic Caucus are raising money for an organization that wants to destroy the United States of America. They want to dismantle the state. How dare you? How dare any of you question our motives when we are trying to preserve what is special about this country while working with you about the stuff you care about? We want to get rid of the, the elements of policing that harm people. We want more training. The president has taken leadership on chokeholds. I voted with you on no-knock warrants, but that's not enough for you. Winning doesn't mean for all of you getting a bill. You'd rather sit here and smear us, smear our families, smear our motives, than actually legislate. And you know what? More Americans will die because you're not actually willing to engage in the legislative process and help us, and that blood will be on your hands. The, t the time of the gentleman has expired. Gentlemen, for what purpose is the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Um, you know, this Congress appropriates money every year for ICE and for Border Patrol, for their weapons, for whatever their needs are, this Congress appropriates, this Congress authorizes and appropriates for those needs. And so ICE and Border Patrol uh, do not need to rely on the government's 1033 surplus military weapons program in order to do their jobs. If we had to rely on the 1033 program for our law enforcement, we'd be in bad shape. We don't do it. We've never done it. We won't do it. Now, the thing about the 1033 program that needs to be shut down is the fact that it allows these law enforcement agencies to petition directly to the Department of Defense to get whatever military-grade weapons they want. No civilian authority involved whatsoever. So that means the Park Service, for instance, the, the U.S. Park Service is a police agency of, uh, uh, of the federal government. Should the head of the parks uh, police decide that they want a, uh, you know, an armed drone to do their work here in, uh, inside of our borders? No, we should not allow for that to uh, be a possibility. But with this 1033 program, it is a possibility, and it's something that we need to close up. 
we don't need the uh, postal service police to uh, be militarizing. For what purpose? I mean, if we authorize it and appropriate the funding for it, fine. But don't bypass the civilian authority. Don't allow the, the police agencies to militarize and become a military unit within our borders and the civilian authority had nothing to do with it. That is reckless and irresponsible for us to have this loophole in our law that is as big as a, uh, as a, as a tank that can be driven t through it right to the streets uh, by the park police, by the U.S. Park Police, by the U.S. Postal Inspection, even by U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services. Uh, we don't want this to be the case in America, and so we need to close this loophole, not just for local and state law enforcement agencies, but also for federal law enforcement agencies. If it's a federal law enforcement agency that needs equipment, then it's, this jo it's our job here in Congress, in this House of Representatives and in the Senate, to authorize and appropriate whatever equipment they need. We the ones that determine whether or not the equipment is necessary, whether or not uh, it is proper, not the agency itself. And under current law, the agency makes all of the decisions. I don't think we want that to be the case here in America with our police agencies uh, able to bulk up and become militarized without our consent. Uh, that's undemocratic. It's a threat to our liberty. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman yields back for our purposes. The gentleman in Texas seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, move to strike the last word. Gentleman, he's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess it was Mr. Only Chairman, it's a our matter. Side. It's our turn. Mr. Mr. Biggs, it's, uh, you just had one. Mr. Biggs has been trying to get recognition. I was not aware of anyone seeking recognition. After Ms. Escobar goes, I'll, come, I'll return. Ms. Escobar has already started. Uh, that's okay, Mr. Chairman. We'll let Mr. Biggs go first. I'll go after him. Gentleman from the general, the, the, for what purpose is the gentleman from uh, Arizona seek recognition? Who's strike last word? The gentleman is recognized. Just last week, um, I took a, a number of congressmen with me back down to the border, and I grew up down in southern Arizona. This is a vast, wide open space. And uh, we went out and we went to the Krintz, the Krintz Ranch, which is right down there um, on the New Mexico-Arizona border. And it's where uh, Rob Krintz was killed 10 years ago, almost by um, someone who was illegally in this country, that, that Mr. Krintz was actually trying to uh, give food and water to. The problem that, that I think this amendment solves is the provisioning of the Border Patrol with the necessary equipment to fight a superiorly armed uh, force. Where the Krenz Ranch is, it is in a highly trafficked corridor of human and drug smuggling. There's no fences there. But you know how long it g takes to get there by car? About two and a half hours. Do you know how vast that and wide open that area is? It is big and expansive, and the number of agents that are available are few. It takes 45 minutes or more just to get a helicopter down there. And by the time you get there, the smugglers are 45 minutes gone up into the Cherokee Mountains. You need this kind of equipment. A couple trips ago, we got in Blackhawks and we toured a section of the border. It's a Blackhawks in the Air and Marine Service. As we went over the Babakivari Mountains, which is a bladed, really rugged, sharp mountains, the pilot said, right here is where we rescued a woman eight months pregnant on the top of the blade of the Babakiviri Mountains. They had to lower agents down from the Black Hawk, pick her up, bring her up, and then transport her into Tucson. The violence along the border 
which we try and which the cartels don't ever really want to spill in because they know it would raise the public's awareness of us, was manifested earlier this year. Two small ports of entry, Douglas and Naco. They're, they're about 18, 20 miles apart, something like that. We're building fence between Douglas and Naco now. Just was down there last week. But between Douglas and Naco, the plazas were under uh, a dispute from remnants of the Sinaloa cartel. And what they were doing is killing each other off, posting heads on fences, whatnot, so they could control the plaza. And what the plaza is, the entryway and the gateway into the country. And everybody coming in, individuals, commercial vehicles, ag vehicles, they're all paying, they're all paying a price to come across. Well, you may not think that that's important to know, but I can tell you that if you live along the border between Douglas and Naco, you saw what was going on. You know what was going on. And this flows across our borders. 40% of all drugs that come through Arizona come through the Tucson sector. I mean, through the country. They come through the Tucson sector. There's scouts in the mountain ranges. A lot of people think Arizona doesn't have mountains. We've got mountains in the foothills of the Rockies, mountains 6, 8, 10,000, 12,000 feet high, filled with scouts so they can track where our Border Patrol agents are, so they can load out drugs, humans, take them on up to I-8, roll them through to San Diego, roll them up to Phoenix. We went to the DEA office, a room filled with drugs, opioid, opioid, opioids that they had recently uh, taken, fentanyl pills, thousands of fentanyl pills. There's a 50 cal machine gun sitting there and a table full of highly qualified arsenal to be used against our Border Patrol. And you don't want to give them the necessary equipment. I'm shocked by that, actually. It's, it's astonishing. Mr. Gates' amendment is a good, positive amendment for this bill. It will help us secure our border where you have crime coming through. With that, I support his amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. For our purposes, the lady from Texas seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. General lady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to state for the record and as a reminder to my colleagues, I am the only member of this committee who actually lives on the U.S.-Mexico border. And so, uh, and, and in fact, I'm a third generation fronteriza, a woman who lives on the U.S.-Mexico border. You know, I, I the, Representative Jayapal, first it was Seattle, and now it's the southern border. Classic. Uh, uh, tactics intended not just to distract us from the purpose of this hearing, which is police brutality and systemic racism that we are trying to address. So not out. only are they trying to distract us, but they are also, as I mentioned, I responded to the comments about Seattle, seeking to divide and create fear in the hearts of Americans against people in your community and against people on the southern border. I, yeah, I, I, I really am embarrassed that we even have to go down this route for the last, I don't know, 15 minutes. Instead of talking about police brutality, we had to hear stories about how dangerous the U.S.-Mexico border is, uh, about how unsafe it is, about how we need to continue pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into communities like mine that have been safe for generations. It's, it's really a, a tragedy and a shame that we don't have colleagues who will rise to the occasion but they will clutch their pearls because one was one of the one of their colleagues was called an actor. Meanwhile, we're accused of child trafficking, of supporting drug cartels. You know, I don't even believe that they understand the irony of what's happening here. Here we are wanting to finally take racism and bigotry head on. 
And what do they do? They use amendments that fuel that same racism and bigotry. Because with all of their talk about how dangerous communities like mine are, what does that do? It makes us the enemy. That's what makes it easy for them to put children in cages. That's what makes it easy for them to paint moms with babies arriving at our front door as some kind of national security threat. It's what allows them to continue to dehumanize immigrants because it feeds the narrative that gets them votes. But while they're feeding that narrative, what they're doing is feeding the racism and bigotry that is used against us. And no community on the border knows it better than my own. There's one thing that Mr. Gates said that I agree with, and that's that yes, the border is militarized. My side of the border is militarized. The US side of the border is militarized. Hundreds of billions of dollars on walls, on quadrupling, more than quadrupling the number of personnel, on all sorts of military equipment that is already here in my community every single day. You know, I think it is about time that we that that America wakes up not just to the racism that is so systemic in law enforcement against black and brown brothers and sisters, but I think we need to own up to the immigrant bashing and to the way that we demonize vulnerable communities, all to get a little snippet of time on Fox News or to raise some money or to get some votes. Enough. Let's focus on the task at hand Let's work on this bill. Enough of these distractions, which are not just offensive, but they are dangerous. As someone who's been on the receiving end of a number of death threats, because I dare stand up for my own community and for immigrants and call things out, this is a dangerous road we're going down. And I object to this amendment. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back for our purposes a gentleman from Ohio seek recognition. Uh, strike last word, Mr. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman uh, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, the member from Texas just accused us of raising money, called us all kinds of names, and then says somehow our amendment's not relevant. We didn't write the bill. You guys did. You put the military sales uh, section in there. We did it. We'd like to have some input in the bill, but you wouldn't give us any. We bring 11 amendments today that we think are good. You won't take any of them. And she says, Mr. Gates' amendment's not relevant, not pertinent to the issue at hand. You wrote it. You put in the military sales. All the amendment says is, let's let the good guys have what it takes to fight the bad guys. On our border, we all know the violence that takes place there. That's all that is. That's all this amendment's about. And Mr. Chairman, we can't have you're going to allow it, but members continue to question the motives of, of, of our members offering amendments to sections of the bill that you wrote. Totally relevant, totally pertinent, totally, totally germane. Uh, I yield to the, uh, to the gentleman from Florida. Yeah, thank you for yielding. I guess the real question is, are Democrats willing to let the good provisions in this legislation die because you're so, you're so motivated to disarm our border patrol. Like, I mean, are, are you really going to let our, our communities not get the benefit of the good ideas that Congresswoman Bass and Chairman Nadler have had because you want to fight with us about the border patrol? And I, I'll just correct one thing from the gentlelady from Texas. She said we're targeting vulnerable communities. Cartels are not vulnerable communities. They're well-armed assassins. They're traffickers. They bring drugs and violence and human trafficking into our country. So we don't seek to target Immigrants? Who are the immigrants that are helped when we disarm ICE? Uh, you know, from, from this equipment. By the way, like no one in ICE is using an armored patrol like to go and, and hurt immigrants. They're using that to go fight the cartels. And the cartels are not vulnerable. They are well armed, they are well equipped, and you all would disarm the Americans who are brave enough 
to go fight against them. And it, it just seems like a very silly hill for you to die on. I mean, you guys know we're in divided government, right? You know, there's a Republican Senate, a Republican president. So, you know, I want to make sure we fix these policing reforms. And, and it appears that, like, the, the party bringing the superfluous, irrelevant information to this debate on this amendment ain't us. We're trying to take the superfluous things out. You guys take a drive-by shot at Border Patrol in your policing bill. And we're going to stand up for him. I yield to the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you. I'd just like to engage the gentleman from Florida. Well, isn't it amazing that this is where we've drawn the line and we're talking about this, this amendment here? And look, I'm glad everybody's engaged. But did you notice the unsquirmy in, in crickets that happen when we talk about collective bargaining and the things that actually get to the officers who do bad things, like George and the cases in which we have seen time and time again where the collective bargaining agreements hides and obfuscates and takes uh, care of officers who did bad things and then gets them put back on the force? It was sort of like a crickets moment at that one. So let's talk about what we actually put in bills and what we actually don't put in bills, and then let's actually talk about what really matters in a bill that's actually trying to make transformational change. I yield back. And it is truly head spinning that my colleague from Texas would say, well, we're really just advancing this amendment for money and for donations. I don't think there's any member, Republican or Democrat, taking donations from the cartels. My amendment hurts the cartels, your opposition to it helps the cartels. So if there's the big moneyed anti-cartel special interest, I'd love for you to tell us who they are. But, but, but that's an absurd claim. But it might just be, as the gentleman from Georgia suggested, a tad bit of projecting. Because as my colleagues come to claim this great sense of interest in solving bad policing, we see precisely where that interest leads up to. It goes all the way up into the point where you have to look your own donors in the eye and have a tough conversation with the unions. The black lives don't matter to you as much as the unions do. That's what you proved. And now you're not just standing up for the unions, you're literally standing up for the, the cartels, calling them vulnerable communities that shouldn't have the full force of the United States government against them. You know, the gentleman from Georgia said, well, we should just fund those with, with US government tax dollars. Look, if we can save money and get better efficiency, if that means one more Border Patrol agent gets to go home to their family, if that means there's one more piece of body armor for the folks who go and stand in the breach that Congressman Biggs, Congresswoman Lesko, and I suspect others of you may represent, we're with them all the way. You're taking a drive-by shot at Border Patrol as you're trying to solve local policing, and everyone in America knows why. You're terrified of the squad, and you're giving up the agenda to them. The time of the gentleman has expired. The time of the gentleman has expired. The question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes no. have it. The noes have it. Recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Jeffries votes no. Mr. Cicilline? Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Neguse votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? I can't say what I want to say, so I'll just say no. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Ms. Roby votes aye. Mr. Gates? 
Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe. Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes and 24 noes. The, um, the amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the, amend to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 7120, offered by Mr. Biggs of Arizona. Page one, strike line one, and all that follows through page 137, line two, and insert the following. Without objection, the, waiving, the bill will be considered as read. Chairman. The amendment will be considered as read. The uh, gentleman is recognized. Was it a point of order? The gentleman is recognized. The point of order is reserved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this amendment is actually very simple. Uh, I've heard uh, today a number of times that uh, President Trump's executive order has been characterized as weak and not doing, really doing anything. But I think that's not really the case. I think he's... Um, uh, taken some, some bold uh, initiative and in action. State and local police agencies uh, need to make the changes. But much of what this bill does seems to me to be encroaching on state and local jurisdictions uh, and in a sense, if, if not directly but indirectly, provides some kind of basis for nationalizing our state and local police forces. That is problematic to me. So what I'm doing in this, this amendment, which is really very simple, is, is getting at where I think we cannot discount that we do have jurisdiction, and that's with the federal agencies, police agencies. And we're talking about uh, uh, specific training, uh, and specifically de-escalation and uh, tactics and techniques that need to be cured. I think that's one thing that we've all talked about today repeatedly is, is uh, that there needs to be more, more and better de training. There needs to be de-escalation tactics, de-escalation de techniques. And it seems to me the first place we would go and look would be right in our own house, right in our own federal ag police agencies. And that's why I'm bringing this amendment. Um, and I would love uh, but don't expect uh, universal support. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I recognize myself. Uh, this amendment would eliminate the entire bill. The bill is 137 pages. This amendment substitutes three sentences. For all the reasons that we have given to meet the challenges of the time presented by the systemic racism, by the police brutality, by the uh, uh, all the things that we have talked about all day to take this amendment and eliminate the entire bill is to deny the problems of systemic racism, to deny the problems of police brutality, to deny the movement in this country to, sol sol to solve these problems. This amendment is absurd in the extreme, and uh, I urge its, uh, uh, its rejection. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I uh, point of withdraw order. my point of order. Uh, hmm? Point of order is withdrawn. Who seeks recognition? I, I have a point of order. Who seeks recognition? I have a point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, you've already ruled that it's okay to say uh, amendments are, uh, what did you say this morning? Ridiculous? Nonsense. Um, is it appropriate for the chair to say that amendments are absurd to the extreme that is not a point of order and it is appropriate it is appropriate okay who Thanks. seeks recognition general lady from uh, uh from texas mr chairman i, I uh, exercise my right to observe a point of order and i have withdrawn it but it does not uh, diminish my being you might you might you might thank you my being stunned by the language of this amendment 
um, so much so that it, it's, it's difficult to respond. Um, the whole idea of this legislation is a new day in policing in America that will ensure the safety and security of the American people uh, to uh, boost in a positive way police-community relationships. We moved away from community-oriented policing to, to establish relationships and to ensure that civilians who govern this nation can go home safely to their families and as well law enforcement can and that, as my colleagues have said over and over again, the systemic racism and bias that is found in policing can be rejected. Let me submit these numbers into the record. The ACLU did a recent study in the District of Columbia. 89% of the stops in the District of Columbia are black people. 91% of the pat-downs in the District of Columbia are black people. Black people are only 46% of the population. Whites are 36% of the population, and they're only 14% of the stops. And those under 18, 88% of the stops are a recent number, and they are black. So one of the questions is the new way of policing, and the section in the bill, of which we've been working on for at least a decade, law enforcement, trust, and integrity, goes through all of the elements that can professionalize the 18,000 police departments. It speaks about definition of excessive force. It speaks to the question of the, the responsibility to intervene. And it speaks very broadly and expansively to the question of de-escalation, which can save many lives. Michael Brown could have benefited from that officer who was never found responsible for that act to de-escalate. Michael was in his neighborhood. Michael was not a murderer. He was not a threat to the community. He was within a, a minutes of his home. And all that officer had to do was to de-escalate rather than pulling his weapon, shooting Michael Brown in the streets of Ferguson. Trayvon Martin, although not police per se, but acting as a civilian patrol, all Mr. Zimmerman had to do was to go home. He did not have to stigma, provide a, a, a stigma of a young black man with Skittles and iced tea. All the officers dealing with Tamir Rice had to do was to de-escalate and determine whether or not this was a 12-year-old child with a BB gun. All the police in Atlanta had to do was to de-escalate on a man that had passed the test of being sober and not inebriated, give him some coffee and let him walk home to be with his family. And all the officers had to do in Minneapolis was have a heart and to carve the cancer of racism from their soul that would allow them to smother, to suffocate, to strangle a black man on the streets of America. That is what's in the Law Enforcement Trust and Integrity Act, including the ability to have a civilian review commission or board with subpoena powers. It is an extended part of it. But it really focused single-handedly on changing that relationship and providing the uh, protocols and roadmap for accrediting 18,000 police departments. I asked my colleagues, if we want to go on a CODEL, let's visit 18,000 police departments one police officer, no standardized education, no standardized age, no standardized training, as evidenced by the volunteer deputy, I believe in Arizona, that killed a black man. He was a volunteer deputy, paid to be able to volunteer with a gun and killed a black man on the streets. And so this amendment does not do well uh, to continue the policies of this bill that are so needed 
Remember, we're the, asking for justice. The, the, I oppose the amendment. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no, no. The noes have it. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Mr. Richmond? No. Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomer? Mr. Collins? Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes no. Mr. Gates? Aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Stubbe? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Johnson? Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Democratic recession and autocracies from Russia to China seek to exploit and add fuel. Yet at the very moment of okay. Ms. Bass? 
Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Cohen votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are nine ayes and 26 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chair, I have What an purpose amendment. does the gentlelady from Arizona seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Gentlelady has an amendment. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 7120, offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Add at the end of the bill the following. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Gentlelady reserves a point of order. The uh, gentlelady is recognized. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment simply takes away COPS grant funding for states or units of local government that defund, disband, or dismantle their law enforcement agencies. The Community Oriented Policing Services Office, COPS, is the department within the Justice Department responsible for advancing the practice of community policing by state, local, territorial, and tribal law enforcement. This department awards grants to hire community policing professionals, develop and test innovative policing strategies, and provide training and technical assistance to community members, local government leaders, and all levels of law enforcement. Since 1994, the COPS office has invested more than $14 billion to help advance community policing. How can we disagree on the fact that if a locality votes to defund, dismantle, or disband the police, that they should not receive grant funding intended for law enforcement? To me, this is just common sense policy. I urge my colleagues to vote for this amendment. And I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Johnson from Louisiana. I thank the gentlelady from Arizona, Mr. Chairman. I made a point of order earlier uh, in these proceedings, and we need a clarification on this important matter going forward. Let me state again what that was. Under Regulation A2 of the new House rules, it reads, quote, members participating remotely in a committee proceeding must continue to use the software's video function, unquote. We checked this evening with the parliamentarian who says that if a member is in the software platform, they must continue to keep the video on. This might sound trivial, but we note for the record that exactly one half of the Democrats on this committee, 12 of, I think, 24, attended remotely today while all the Republicans were present except Mr. Sensenbrenner, who is mourning the, the recent loss of his wife. Um, the chair, according to the parliamentarian, is not allowed to unilaterally decide what the rules are. I think we're all operating under that assumption. And so I would ask uh, the, the chairman in, 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 to, to respond to this. Is he correct or is the parliamentarian correct? The member is recognized for the purpose of debate only. Well, then I make a point of order, Mr. Chairman. This gentleman will state his point of order. Okay, let me repeat. We need clarification on this very important matter going forward. Uh, the members are violating the rules because the videos have not been consistent. And I don't mean this personally against anyone who attended. I think it's important for members of the committee to understand what the rules are. We've been instructed different things by our subcommittee chairs, and I mean, I know we have. And I think we need clarification. And if, you're, uh, if your decision on this is different than the parliamentarian, I just want that noted for the record. The point of order is not well taken. The member is present under the House rules when he is visible on the screen. Well, for the record, that differs from the parliamentarian and the rule as it's written. So I guess we'll take the gentleman is not recognized. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point what of order. Point of order is withdrawn. For what purpose does the gentleman from uh, Rhode Island seek recognition? I just I, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I would just ask Ms. Lesko if she would yeah, perhaps yield for a question. Because in the amendment, it says 
uh, a state unit that defunds, disbands, or dismantles. I take it, although there's no definition of what those terms mean, that it's intended to convey someone who eliminates a police department, in which case I'm struggling with how any such state or unit could apply for a COPS grant because they wouldn't have a police department. Right? So, I mean, I've never heard of anyone trying to eliminate an entire police department, but it, it seems as if by definition, that's what you mean. You obviously couldn't apply for a COPS grant because you wouldn't have a police department. Well, thank you very much. And that's kind of the point of, of this is that there has been calls to not only defund, but to dismantle, totally dismantle. Okay, so we're claiming my time. With, with all due respect, I've applied for COPS grants as a mayor. You have to certify that it's going to be used to hire police officers. So this amendment makes no sense. It's another attempt to distract from this very serious police reform that is comprehensive, that is speaking to the demand of the American people to hold police officers accountable, to Mr. stop Chairman. the institutional racism that is occurring in this country in policing, to reform it so that it not only works for the citizens of this country, but also works for police officers and protects and honors the good police officers by holding those accountable who violate that trust. This is another attempt to, again, raise this issue of eliminating police departments, kind of a straw man, which not, this bill does not suggest in any way. So let's cut this short. I call the question on this Mr. amendment, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I was back. asking to be recognized before the question. The, uh, Gen the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, read the amendment. State or unit of local government that defunds, disbands, or dismantles. Not and, or. We got examples of all three. Three of our largest cities in this country. The mayor of New York says he's going to cut the police department $1 billion. They just got rid of 600 plainclothes, plainclothes unit in New York City two days ago. The mayor of LA said he's going to cut the police department $250 million. Those are our two largest cities. And Minneapolis, a supermajority of the city council says they want to dismantle. So we have all three. New York has defunded, wants to defund. They've disbanded the plain use clone uh, uh, unit. LA wants to defund and Minneapolis wants to dismantle. That's why the amendment is written the way it is. Plain as could be. So you can make the argument you want. The gentleman from Rhode Island can make whatever argument he wants, but read the amendment. That's what this is about. I would urge adoption of the amendment. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Who, who seeks recognition? The gentleman from uh, 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 California. Uh, Point thank of you. Gentleman from Cal Point of order? The question was called. No, it was not. <laughs> Gentleman from California is recognized. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman, the gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, this hearing is about banning chokeholds, requiring body cameras, getting rid of racial profiling, having a national misconduct registry of officers, reducing the standard to make a civil rights prosecution. And again, we see this obsession on defunding the police. And, and I would just add to Mr. Cicilline's point, the only defunding of the police that has been on record in this House of Representatives in the last couple months are the individuals of this body who have voted against the HEROES Act. Because the states are telling us, Republican and Democratic governors are saying, that we have shortfalls because of this pandemic. And the first people who are going to be fired in these shortfalls are police officers, firefighters, nurses, the people who have taken care of us during this pandemic. We passed a trillion dollars in aid for Republican and Democratic states. Republicans, except for one, all voted against it. So those are the folks who are seeking on the record to defund the police. This effort here is to reform the police, police the police, and fix the police. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Move the question class. occurs on the Move amendment. The last word, Mr. Chairman. For what purpose, for what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Move strike the last word. 
Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. I'll be brief. I uh, want to thank the gentle lady for offering this amendment, as she's done earlier, another good amendment. Unfortunately, I, again, I think the Democrats in this committee are absolutely determined not to take up even common sense, reasonable, completely responsible, should be bipartisan uh, amendments. And she's basically saying if you dismantle the police department, you defund it, you get rid of it, you shouldn't get a cop's credit. That should be pretty darn logical. Um, although apparently out in Seattle, for example, I think we all hate to keep picking on Seattle, but they are the one entity that has allowed anarchists essentially to take over a portion of the city, including the police department. I, but I guess we want to make clear that the poetry readers out there don't get the grant because they haven't had any kind of indication as to who the heck's going to take over once they get rid of the police department. So uh, I thank the gentleman, gentle lady from Arizona for making sure that this money doesn't go to those poetry readers. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. No. Mr. Chair, I call for a roll call vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Mr. Richmond? No. Mr. Richmond votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Yes. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagoose? No. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? No. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. McCarcel Powell? No. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Ms. Roby? Aye. Ms. Roby votes no. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Ms. Lesko? Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Has everyone voted who wishes to vote? Ms. Bass votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 24 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? The question then occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on final passage of the bill. All those in favor of the amendment in the nature of a substitute respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. A reporting quorum being present, the question is on the motion to report the bill H.R. 7120 as amended favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered reported favorably. A recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Deutsch? 
Aye. Mr. Deutsch votes aye. Ms. Bass? Aye. Bass votes aye. Mr. Richmond? Aye. Mr. Richmond votes aye. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Aye. Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Liu? Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Mr. Raskin? Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Jayapal? Aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Ms. Demings? Aye. Ms. Demings votes aye. Mr. Correa? Mr. Correa? Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Ms. Garcia? Aye. Ms. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Neguse? Aye. Mr. Neguse votes aye. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes aye. Mr. Stanton? Aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Ms. Dean? Aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell? Aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes aye. Ms. Escobar? Aye. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jo Jordan votes aye. No. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Gomer? Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes no. Mr. Buck? Mr. Buck votes no. Ms. Roby? Ms. Roby votes no. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Ms. Lesko? Ms. Lesko votes no. Mr. Rosenthaler? Mr. Rosenthaler votes no. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Stubbe votes no. Am I recorded? Am I right? Am I recorded? Mr. Jeffries, you are not recorded. Mr. Jeffries votes aye. You going home Mr. Right Jordan, you're recorded as no. Has everyone voted who wishes to vote? Mr. Chairman. Oh, the, 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 the yes, Ms. Jackson. Uh, how am I recorded? Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recorded as aye. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Richmond. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter to the hearing record today a, the testimony from Dr. Frederick West, uh, African American Health Alliance. Without objection, is the uh, Mr. Jeffries. <laughs> the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 24 ayes and 14 noes. The, the ayes have it, and the bill is amended as ordered. Report. The ayes have it, and the bill as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. This concludes our business for today. Thanks to all our members for attending. Without objection, the markup is adjourned.